Original. Omnitrix in Marvel. Author, Hey underscore Rishabh. Copyright Web Novel. Chapter 1, Professor Paradox 5. I remember being a kid and watching the very first episode of Ben 10. I was so excited, watching a kid become powerful aliens and using them to become a hero. I remember later watching Alien Force, seeing the older, wiser Ben, with a new suite of aliens and a new threat. After that, well, things went kinda downhill for me personally. Ultimate aliens were cool, but as useful as all that beyond being a ploy to sell toys. As for Omniverse and the reboot, not a fan. 41. Even so, I had mad love for the franchise, and I've always wanted to write a FIC for it. And then we have the MCU. What, am I gonna explain it? It's the MCU. All of us have our first moments realizing the insane awesomeness we were in for when we first saw Iron Man. The movies, the shows, they are often great, sometimes decent, rarely terrible. 12. So now, a FIC. A guy gets dropped into the MCU with an Omnitrix. Have fun, and please let me know what you think. 20. July 15, 2018, Portland, Earth Prime Source. I was writing, late at night. Not something uncommon for me. I was working on a new story after a long day, my legs still burning from my leg workout in the afternoon. It had been a good day though. My nephew had come back from a visit to our family in California and as soon as he saw my face, started asking where his DS in that combination of adorable and annoying only a child can. He'd followed up by incessantly showing me every step he took in Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon. 13. It was super annoying having him ask me to watch him play while I was trying to get work done, and I absolutely loved him for it. Once again, it was something only a kid you actually love can get away with. 7. He was asleep now. My legs burning and feeling satisfied with my day, I tapped away at the keyboard, idly sending fictional characters on fictional adventures. I'd probably sleep soon. Maybe. Probably. When I felt like it. For now, in the peaceful cool of an Oregon summer night, I was okay. 2. A face leaned over my shoulder. My, you really do need someone to teach you proper grammar, don't you? 2. I jumped, spinning my chair around in shock. There, in my room, stood a man. He was tall, thin, and had a dignified age about him. He looked about as old as my dad actually. His face was unshaven, hair slicked back and white with age at the sides. He wore a brown vest over a white shirt and black tie, all covered by a lab coat. A pair of safety goggles with green goggles hung around his neck. 6. I stared at him for a moment. I mean, if the guy had broken in, smashed my apartment door down, I may have been able to respond in some way. I might have been angry, or scared. As it was, all I could do was stare at this random guy who'd just shown up out of nowhere in my room. Well, he said, still reading my computer monitor. I suppose it doesn't matter too much. You can practice later. As though his words were some sort of trigger, I snapped up from my chair, reflexively grabbing the nearest thing to a weapon I had close by. What the fuck? 8. He smiled at that. Stepping back and raising his hands up with a casual slowness that made me feel foolish, he chuckled. Young man, while I admire your choice of weaponry, I do believe that the hero of Hyrule is the only one who could possibly use that weapon. Still, I admire the effort he said in an accent right out of those classy movies from the 50s. 7. I looked down at the weapon I'd chosen. I'd gotten it at Comic Con a few months back. It was a replica master sword. The edge was blunted, the point sort of sharp, the hilt made of cheap plastic with a cylindrical hilt that would prevent me from knowing where the edge of the blade was without looking. Barring its near uselessness as a weapon, it was still in its plastic sheath. That said, a big metal stick in a plastic sheath is still an effective club. I tightened my grip, and stared at the guy, dude, get out of my room. 1. He laughed. Ah, dude, I'm afraid I've come here for a reason, and I don't believe you will attack me, not without a true reason for attacking me, sad to say, but the sort of violence that would allow you to attack a man who is simply standing in your room is not a part of you my dear boy. 5. I, uh, once again, I felt foolish, and angry because of that feeling. The fact was, he was right. People just aren't built to attack randomly. Not if you've been raised all your life to avoid that instinct. After all, how many times had I seen street fight videos where two guys yelled at each other for four minutes before unleashing punches? It was 2018, and nobody was really ready to just unleash hell on some random person they'd met. 
Nobody except those trained for it, people from rough homes slash neighborhoods, and insane people. Barring exceptions. 12. And I wasn't one of those exceptions. I do admire the effort however. On a basic level of course, he sat down in my chair. Despite the fact my chair had been just behind me a moment ago. Wait, I turned to see my chair was gone. I looked back at him, eyes wide. How did you? I don't dash. God damn it, I thought to myself. What is going on? 2. Now, I wish I could explain everything. He swung his left leg over his right, leaning back in my beat-up old chair. His smile was sad now, almost pitying. But, sadly, the nature of my visit means I'll need to send you off as is. So, I am only here to be your, what is the word, oh yes, a rob, he took out a pocket watch of all things and fiddled with it. Behind me a noise filled the air as blue light filled my dark room. The noise was like a plastic cup being torn apart over and over again. I wish you best of luck. I suppose you won't forgive me, but it is what is needed. 10. I turned, and stared in shock at the sight behind me. Instead of my desk and computer resting peacefully, there was a giant glowing blue circle hanging in the air. Oh shit. 3. Indeed, a hand pressed into my back with incredible strength. I stumbled. My name is Paradox, by the way. Safe travels. 3. Oh sheeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Buildings had great holes dug into them. Detours were set up everywhere, leaving me to avoid certain streets, but I could see men in orange vests cleaning up broken and twisted steel and concrete. 1. What the hell happened here? I stopped at one point and stared at on bit of the work being done. A guy was driving a crane, taking away some massive piece of metal the color of polished bronze. I rubbed at my arms. 2. Damn it, I walked away, trying to focus. Thankfully, thanks to my workouts, I'm a pretty big guy now. I was actually pretty proud of it, since I'd worked so hard on it. So no one seemed willing to bother me, which was good, because all the signs of a rough neighborhood were right there with the damaged buildings. Graffiti, guys gathered in protective groups while glaring at passersby. Still, the streets were practically empty. I saw a park and turned to walk into it. It was forested little area, with bushes and a fence blocking it from the rest of the city. The leaves were brown, and the grass dead, but it was a park nonetheless. I strolled through, my feet burning a bit from the cold and the walking on asphalt. I got to the middle of the park, the trees around me blocking the lights of the city. A chilly wind blew some leaves past. It was actually peaceful. Of course, that was when the whistle noise came from behind me. I stopped in my tracks and closed my eyes. Ugh, this can't end well. I turned to see four guys walk up to me. They were wearing jean jackets with matches sewn into them in a symbol I recognized. The guy in front of me was bald, his eyes brown and wide. His pale white skin seemed to glow in what little light there was. The other guys were white as well. This was important. As they came closer, the patches caught my eye once more. Swastikas covered the men vests with the sort of pride the symbol did not deserve. 9. I don't give a damn about people talking about Holocaust conspiracies and how not all of them are bad, or how all opinions should be listened to. If you're the sort of jerk who wears a swastika and starts blaming people's race, religion, gender, or sexual preference for your problems, if you use those as a reason to hate people, you don't deserve sympathy, you don't deserve an opinion. Ignorance can be cured, but not when it's intentional ignorance. 8. The men walked up to me, the guy in the lead grinning. Well well, look at you, forget your shoes boy. I frowned, slowly backing away. I did. I'm on my way to get them. Can you let me go? A knife came out. Nah, he chuckled. His friends joined him in chuckling. They surrounded me. I think I'd rather show what happens to immigrant fucks who come to New York. 8. He leaped forward, knife aimed at my stomach. 5. I wasn't a martial artist. I'd only been trained in some boxing and high school wrestling. Luckily, I was scared as hell. I'd been shoved into a realm of pain, woke up in a random city, and found myself getting attacked by some of the worst kind of people in the world. Like I'd said, no one in the modern world is ready to fight someone immediately without the right mentality. 2. I was finally in the right mentality. When the guy stabbed at my stomach, I reached out as fast as I could and grabbed his wrist. The knife bounced off my watch, slicing deep into the back of my forearm. I pulled the guy in towards me, shouting. 4. Foodish my other hand rose up. I pulled him forward. My right hand pulled him close. My left snapped forward. I clenched my left hand into a tight fist moments before impact, twisted my hips with the blow, and slammed him with all the force I had. I aimed for his solar plexus, not wanting to break my knuckles on his skull. As the air was driven from the neo-Nazi, I spun him around. The guy was a skinny jerk, so even though he was taller than me, he was easy to spin around and pull close. I clenched his wrist tight, pulling him back with me as my other hand wrapped around his neck. My right hand moved from his wrist to his hand, clenching it tight around the knife he was holding. I forced him to point his knife at his own throat. 2. I almost fell over, stumbling a bit, but I clutched the neo-Nazi clothes and choked him. His friends came closer as I backed off. One guy took out a handgun. Let go of him. He shouted. I ducked, trying to get the guy in between me and his friends. Better do it, the guy I was holding laughed, then tried to shake me off. I squeezed harder, trying to keep a hold of him, and I pressed his knife hand into his neck. He stilled at the feeling of it piercing his neck. You fucking asshole. I just want to go home, I said back to him. My voice cracked. Seriously, I just. I trailed off when I saw my watch. The watch I'd never seen before in my life. Scratch that. I knew the watch. But I'd never seen it in a form that wasn't either in cartoon or toy form. Ha. Huh. I let out. The three guys staring at me shared a look. The guy I was holding tried to struggle again. I felt myself go just a little insane. 
It was kinda nice. Kinda freeing. Tell you what boys, I reached for the watch, struggling with my prisoner as I did. How about this? If this doesn't work, I'll let you kill me. 1. Looking back, I was probably lying. I damn well fight back either way. At this point, I was crazy enough to do it. I grabbed the watch and twisted the face of it. The triangles opened up, and the guy I was holding stared with the same shock I felt when the watch lit up. A image floated from it, a green figure with a head like fire. 10. What the? One of the guys said softly as we all stared at my watch. I know right. I said a bit crazily. With that, I slammed my hand onto the watch. A flash of green light came from the device, before it enveloped me. I let go of the guy in my arms, shoving him away even as I became a different person. 6. My bones widened, growing outwards, before they dissolved entirely. Flesh and blood shifted, until only the green of vines remained. My organs began to produce methane in massive amount. My mind changed, connecting to the world around me in a way I didn't understand. In all, the change must have take less than a second, only a blink of time. 2. When it ended, I stood up tall, stretching my body out and looking at my hands. My body was now green vines and black sections of bark. My feet looked like roots surrounding rocks, allowing me to stand stable on the ground. My hands clenched into green fists. I knew, if I looked at myself, I would have a head shaped like flame, with slit green eyes. I sighed. My voice sounded different now. Kinda nasally actually. Well, tradition and all that, right. I reared back, crying out one word as proudly as I could. Swamp fire. 11. Holy shit. The guy I'd shoved away yelled in amazement. Kill it. The guy with the gun started shooting. Bullets slammed into me, punching through my body to fly behind me. I staggered back, blinking as I felt the odd sensation of bullets going through me. A moment later, he had emptied his handgun. I looked down at myself. There were a bunch of holes in me, about 15 or so, tiny. I felt some wind passing through them. As I watched, the holes began to seal themselves. With a bit of concentration, I accelerated the process. Soon, all the holes were gone, leaving smooth plant life. Whoa, I said in that nasally voice. That is cool. I felt so powerful. As though I was a hundred times stronger and more powerful than before. I took a deep breath, my massive chest moving with the action. Two. Then I raised a hand, mimicking the move I'd seen more than once on Cartoon Network. A plume of flame erupted from my palm. The guys crinkled their noses, apparently bothered by the smell. 1. What the hell? The neo-Nazis backed away, scared. So I threw a fireball at the ground in front of them, laughing. The fireball exploded, erupting with a brilliance I found gratifying. 1. Run. They spun around. But we were in a park. In a place full of greenery. Swamp fires home turf. I reached out with my mind, and felt the trees around me. The feeling of the life around me was intoxicating. I struggled to focus, to ignore the way the world suddenly seemed so much larger, as though I was part of a conversation I'd never known was happening around me every day. The grass grew up into massive stalks as tall as a man. Trees suddenly erupted with branches. A giant green oval sprouted from my chest, which I ripped out and threw in front of the group. The oval object exploded in front of them, turning into a plant that stabbed into the ground with its roots and began to grow. 2. In seconds, the work of months or years, even millennia, passed by. When the guys ran, the plant I'd thrown launched out vines. The forest continued to grow and grow at high speed. God held Ash the leader, the guy who'd tried to stab me, was silenced when a vine wrapped around his mouth. In seconds, more vines surrounded his arms, legs, and chest, holding him tightly as he released muffled screams. The other three turned around, trying to escape the other way. I grabbed one, a guy with a beard bigger than mine, by the shoulder. Not today. I lashed out with a green fist as large as watermelon, my knuckles digging into his side before my inhuman strength lifted him up as I felt something like sticks break under my vine fist. 3. UGK. He grunted as his ribs shattered. He was sent flying back, slamming into a tree. The tree, under my orders, wrapped him in its branches, leaving him trapped in a wooden cocoon. The last two guys tried to escape as well. They ran through the growing grass of the lawn next to the walkway, which meant they were a field under my control. Feeling a bit vindictive, I stood for a moment, watching them run. When they'd gotten about 20 feet away, the grass rustling as they ran towards the nearest exit from the park to the streets, 
I dramatically raised a hand. For some reason, feeling like I was being a bit ironic, I snapped my fingers. The grass moved, and the two men fell. One. Ugh. Crap. I felt the grass speaking to me, letting me know they were wrapping around them. Some weeds joined in, growing with immense speed. I looked over at the leader. He stared at me from the bonds of the plant I'd thrown. New York City. Good to know. I looked over the men for a moment, then looked down at myself. Hmm. You know fellas, I am going to need some clothes. 5. Later, with a bundle of clothing, an empty pistol, knife, and their cell phones and wallets, all stuffed into a bag made of vines, I turned and walked out of the park. Still transformed into swamp fire, flowers began to bloom in the middle of fall, police sirens came closer, and fire burned. Then, with a loud set of beeps and a big flash of red light, I became human again, and walked into the city. 5. Sleeping in a hotel is always a bit disgusting to me. I'm always thinking of how many people use hotels for things I'd prefer not to imagine without supermodels involved. That said, I found a solid place to sleep for the night, and thankfully the neo-Nazis had some cash in their wallets, enough to get a room. 2. I managed to get some sleep, even cleaned the clothes I'd stolen in the small washer and dryer that came with the room. Granted, the clothes wasn't perfectly my size, but I'd gotten some jeans and shirts. Though I ended up having to rip a few swastikas off at one point. I distracted myself like that for a bit. Rifling through the guy's wallets, folding clothes, showering. All the while, I ignored the object on my wrist. It seemed to weigh me down with every move, a reminder of everything that had happened. Soon, I had to confront it. I sat on the floor and stared at it, resting against the bed of the hotel room. The Omnitrix. The Omnitrix. From the TV show Ben 10. I felt the smile rise on my face. So freaking cool. I loved that show, and the idea of the Omnitrix, a device that could turn a person into one of a plethora of badass aliens, was exciting as hell. And it was my favorite design too, the one from Alien Force. I really wanted to play with it, to see just who I could into. Humongousaur? Diamond Head? Oh god, please don't let the worst be one of my options. Hell, while I'd been freaking out before, Turning into swamp fire was freaking awesome. Feeling so powerful, that connection to the plants around me, and the feel of summoning methane and igniting with a thought. Damn it was cool. 13. I lowered my arm and sighed. But then there was the elephant in the room. Why give me a uber-powered watch with limitless potential, then drop me into New York City? I decided to discard the fact this was all impossible. That the Omnitrix, Professor Paradox, Teleportation, and Aliens were all fictional or at least not possible according to the 2018 I knew. Professor Paradox. He was the key. He had answers, he knew why I was here, why I was given the watch. But most important. I reached for one of the phones. It was locked. So were the other three. No answers. But they were older models. I couldn't tell if that meant anything. 1. I decided to wait for the next day to find information. But in the end, sleep wasn't going to come easy. The next day, I was in the Columbus Branch Library. I'd been directed there by a kindly older woman. The library was two stories, gray stone, and in between a place called Ray's Deli Grocery on its right, and an apartment building of some sort on the left. Once inside finding a computer was easy. Looking up recent news took seconds. I scrolled through the stories, some things jumping out at me immediately as weird. But one took my breath away. It was seeing a picture of Robert Downey Jr., that guy from the movie Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. He was wearing a dapper suit, a suave smile on his face as he waved from a private jet. The headline made my head spin. 4. Tony Stark makes plans to rebuild Stark Tower as the Avengers headquarters. 1. Well, there was only one response I could give to that. Since when the fuck did Robert Downey Jr. play Iron Man? 14. October 19, 2013. The day I entered the Marvel Universe. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be much appreciated. Comment. 31 comments. Chapter 2, Hydra. December 19, 2013. 1. Ryak. I swung the sledgehammer with all my strength. The metal head smashed into brick, cracking it. My shoulders burning, I felt a grin on my face. 1. Kid, you know how creepy it is when you smile like that. I turned to look behind me. Raising a hand to nudge the hard hat on my head back a bit. You know one of the signs of old age is repeating crap to people. 
I replied. The older black man behind me grinned. He was a big guy, with massive biceps and a belly that spoke of good eating. His hair was well groomed, though a large mustache bounced with every word he spoke. He chuckled, his belly bouncing under the blue cotton shirt he was wearing. He was sitting on a cheap folding chair, sipping at a cup of water. It's more of an insanity thing. But yeah, try not to look like you enjoy hitting things so much. Yeah, yeah, I looked over at the city outside. The building we were standing in was one of many in New York that had been destroyed during an event that was being called, the incident by people of the city, though it was known worldwide as the Battle of New York. A moment where aliens dropped from a portal in the sky and came down to attack Earth with the help of Loki, until the Avengers stopped them. Although finding out about the portal light in the sky made me feel a bit bemused. I'd seen a lot of movies over the years with a portal in the sky, a lot of those superhero movies, from fan stick to Suicide Squad. I suppose real life was imitating art in the end. 4. All of which I could not understand. I couldn't remember any of these events in the comics, and some of the actors looked like actors I recognized. Captain America and Black Widow had even been in the same movies a bunch of times. Well, they're actors. Well, the actors that looked like them. Whatever the case, it happened. I was standing in a building in the middle of Hell's Kitchen. One with a giant hole in it from what apparently been some sort of giant snake monster thing that had flown through the former apartment building. As part of my attempt to make a living in this weird version of Marvel Comics I didn't know about, I took a job as a construction worker with a company that didn't ask a lot of questions. With all the damage from the battle, and the funding from Stark Tech, Rand International, and various others pouring cash into New York to help rebuild it. Construction companies had flooded into New York City, fixing buildings and streets that could be repaired, tearing down buildings that were lost causes so they could be built anew. 1. Perfect way for an immigrant to make some quick cash with some grunt work from guys who don't care a lot about legality. And, seeing as I was the ultimate immigrant, I managed to get work with a guy in charge of finding muscle for one of the companies in charge of the reconstruction of Hell's Kitchen. Some business called Union Allied Construction. 4. It's simple work, I admit it. Just gotta swing a stick and break stuff. It's fun, Sammy. 1. Ha. The man sitting with me replied boisterously. Well, enjoy it while it lasts. In my experience, guys like you and Eddie over there, he nodded over to the side. In a room that had once been a kitchen, a Hispanic man just a bit shorter than me. He was a skinny guy, but he was taking apart the sink with a wrench, removing the pipes with ease. Well, paperwork matters to some folk. 3. I sighed at that thought. Eddie and me both had no legal citizenship in America. For Eddie, it was because he crossed into America illegally to help support his mother in Puerto Rico. For me, it was because an asshole had dropped me into the middle of the city, leaving my paperwork in another universe. 8. Well, I'll figure that out later, I reared back and swung my hammer. Shouldn't you be working, Sammy? 1. As brick crumbled and Eddie gently removed the sink in the kitchen, Sammy chuckled. Not, nah, you young bucks have it handled. Just let my old ass rest for a bit. I have it on good authority that Captain America is older than you, and that guy would probably be right next to me. Sammy scoffed. Please young blood, what do you know about Captain America? He rose up and moved to pick up his own hammer. He reared back and decimated the brick wall in front of him with a single smooth movement. I coughed a bit as dust rose, and looked over at him as he smiled smugly. You're strong. Kid, Sammy chuckled. But it's important to know where to hit, and how fast to. I blinked at this advice. I raised my own sledgehammer and tried to swing it the way Sammy had. The hammer bounced off the wall with no effect. Sammy chuckled, leaving me to give him a chagrined look. Hey. We turned around. A man stood there, wearing a polo shirt, cocky shorts, a blue hard hat, and carrying a clipboard. He glared at us, eyes hard, face pinched. Frederick, our boss. Enough talk. We need the floor cleared by the end of the day. Sammy and I shared a look before turning and going back to our work. Later that day, we were done. Well, the guys on my shift. More would come in and do some work at night, but for now, my muscles burning from exertion, I was leaving for the day. Ah, Sammy sighed happily as we exited the construction site, entering the sidewalk. New York is never really quiet, but there was a brief sense of peace as the sun went down in the distance. He stretched letting his arms reach for the sky. Ugh, I reeled back, playfully covering my nose while grabbing the arm nearest to me and pulling it down. Dude, 
Come on, deodorant. Hmm. Sammy slapped at me, grinning just a bit. Little punk. I smiled back. Yeah yeah. See you tomorrow, old man. Hey, Mahmood. 4. I stopped, turning to look at him. I was using my real name since there wasn't much point in a cover story, but Sammy always slurred it from Mahmood to Mahmood. 7. What's up? You need a ride. He waved towards the parking lot his truck was parked in. It ain't a big deal. Nah, I'm good. I smiled just a bit. I wanna walk for a bit. Thanks though. He shrugged, unbothered, and went off. I, meanwhile, walked away. For a couple of blocks. When I was sure I wasn't being followed, I turned towards the same section of neighborhoods I'd been hammering at the whole day. Technically, it was just buildings to be torn down. But in that section, there were a lot of places a guy could hide. I left the sidewalk behind to go into an alleyway. From there, I hopped over a fence, then went through another alley. One more fence and I reached home. A door with a steel lock pad blocked the way inside, with a clearly broken keypad next to it. I tapped on the broken keypad, and the door let out a click, allowing me in. Once inside, the motion sensors read my presence, and the lights turned on. The place I'd been calling home for the past two months had once been an office building, for some tech company. It had been destroyed when some of the aliens, called the Chidori, had blown up the upper floors with grenades then sent one of their reptile things through it. The building was up for reconstruction, but I could use it for now as a home, rent-free. I'd taken the back room that had once been used for paperwork or something, and converted it into living space. Yap. Mahmood, the owner of a watch with infinite potential, living as a squatter. 1. I looked around. A big green thing the size of a closet rested in the corner. It had once been a broken refrigerator I'd found on the streets. It was still a fridge. Sometimes. Most days. 2. I opened the door and sighed in relief when I found my food cold. Rather than frozen, cooked, or just plain gone. A steak was soon cooking on a machine that had once been a printer, and I moved to a beat-up old couch to use my computer. Like the fridge and stove, it was also made from parts of other devices. The phones I'd stolen from the neo-Nazis two months before, a big TV monitor I'd found at one of the construction sites, some of the computers left behind by the tech company, a few more refrigerators, and three older generation video game consoles. 2. The computer worked. It worked damn well. Except on Wednesday, when it just put on videos of people laughing at Japanese game shows for hours, and when small children were eating lollipops nearby. Yesterday was a Wednesday. So, I could get some work done today. 3. The computer was really a supercomputer when it actually worked. I reached over for my keyboard and mouse and quickly switched it on. I got up and grabbed the steak, then went back. Okay, what are you up to, Stark? I said to myself. My monitor glowed with a blue light, showing a sci-fi sort of look to it, with folders floating in a blue field. A wave of my hands would have let me move things around, but I reached for the mouse instead. A quick click of the mouse opened a back channel I had into the Stark Industries employee memos. Nothing invasive, nothing about their secret projects, just the stuff any employee there would get sent. I read through them a bit but didn't find anything crazy. Another click sent me to the email of one happy Hogan, Tony Stark's bodyguard. Some lovely messages wishing him well in his recovery. Another one from a company wishing to hire him from Stark Industries. And, oh, one sent from Happy to Pepper Potts letting her know how sorry he was about her breakup with Tony Stark. I leaned back in my seat, slicing into my overcooked steak with a sigh. One. Damn. That sucked. I mean, in the comics, Happy and Pepper were married but a lot of stuff back home depicted Tony and her in a relationship, and they seemed close in the news. 4. Feeling a bit more intrusive than usual, I switched the feed again. I pushed my steak aside and focused. Hacking into the employee stuff at Stark wasn't horrific in terms of danger. And Happy had a regular email as well as a more private one which was blocked by some insane firewalls, and I'd only hacked the regular one. Hacking into S.H.I.E.L.D. was another game entirely. 4. Not to say it was impossible. Alien tech, even alien tech made from human parts, was incredibly powerful. With a bit of time, I could hack almost any computer on the planet. Well, I guessed I could. 7. But that didn't mean I shouldn't be careful. I went through some of the messages sent to all S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. High priority targets, warnings, some simple guidelines for new recruits. Then I went deeper. The Daily Cadet, 
the newspaper for the science school that Shield ran, had run an article two days before about two of their alumni, Gemma Simmons and Leo Fitz, had saved a kid named Donnie Gill from being frozen. Good on them. There wasn't much else, except for Project Insight. I tried to gently find my way in, trawling through employee files, hunting down shipments. I made sure not to go through the same channels I had before. Apparently, Project Insight was going well. They were building three big-ass heli carriers, all powered by Iron Man-type tech. Which was cool as shit. I took another bite of steak and shifted in my chair. I went to my other research next, still thinking. Reports of a skeletal figure on a bike in the south. Apparently, people were thinking it was an urban legend, an explanation for the dead criminals getting burned to death. Ghost Rider. 9. I switched to a school I'd hacked, looking into their records. Peter Parker was doing well. He had won some science award recently. Good on the kid. Weird, he was only 12. I didn't look him up for long since hacking into a children's school files made me feel skeevy. 3. The Baxter building was still being built, and I couldn't find anything on any Fantastic Four member beyond the point they'd disappeared years back. Some company had hired them, before the company and the four disappeared. No Reed Richards, no Ben Grimm, Sue Storm, or Johnny Storm. That worried me. From the minute I'd found out, I'd left the program chasing any info that could be found on them, anything new. Nothing yet. 2. I growled in annoyance at that, then flipped to something else. No mutants, I said with a sigh, looking over my other research. Not a sign of them. I couldn't find Wolverine, Cyclops, Professor X. Wait, I think I found. Ah, uh, I couldn't find. Mutants were. I had to. 3. I ignored my screen for a moment. Whatever was on it probably didn't matter. After a moment, I went back to it to focus on something more important. 3. Wakanda was still being listed as a third world nation. Which was probably bullshit. I found myself smiling at the thought of Wakanda. It was weird, I didn't know a lot about Black Panther, but I felt a deep warmth when I thought of that nation. Tichola was in university, studying the sciences, but that was all. 2. Finally, I turned on the police radio I had as a program on my computer, sitting back to listen to it. For about 10 minutes, I continued eating my steak as I listened. Whenever a code would get announced, I would look over at the notebook I'd written as a reference to what each code meant. Nothing the cops couldn't handle so far. No robbery in progress or anything. I finished my steak and got up, turning my computer off. Then I walked out of my home, locking it behind me, and headed to the alleyway. Once there, I looked at my Omnitrix. One of the most powerful objects in all of fiction. Funnily enough, its creator had developed it with the idea of peace in mind. Azmuth, one of a member of a species of extremely intelligent beings known as the Galvan, had created it to make up for another object he'd made, a sword with the power to destroy planets. It was supposed to allow a person to act as the perfect ambassador. With the ability to transform into any race in the galaxy, a person could interact with the people of the entire galaxy, to understand them and aid them. The ultimate peacekeeping tool. Instead, he'd made the ultimate weapon. A person who can turn into any alien of the Ben 10 universe is not just powerful, they're versatile. Elemental control, enhanced strength and speed, flight, nuclear power, even time manipulation and reality warping. If there was an alien in Benjamin Tennyson's universe who could do something, the Omnitrix could do the same. 6. That weapon had landed in the hands of a 10-year-old brat. And that brat had done wondrous things with it. Ben Tennyson was one of my heroes, a kid who rose to the occasion again and again. He'd matured through battle and became a hero worthy of any universe. Ben 10 was awesome. 4. And now I had his Omnitrix. 10 alien forms, each with their own powers, with some crossover between them in terms of ability. Only 10, out of over a billion. But that was enough. 16. I twisted the face of my watch, and it lit up in a flash of green. An image appeared, floating. Swamp fire. He was one of my favorite forms, able to blast out flames from methane gases, control plants, and regenerate from harm with ease. But he wasn't what I needed. 3. I twisted the face, going through the aliens before I found the form that was best for what I wanted. Then, carefully, I pushed down on the watch. Immediately, the change came. My body grew outwards. I was already pretty hefty, but I gained over 100 pounds of muscle in second. My leg twisted backward, my arm stretched out. 
Fur grew over my entire body. My fingernails became claws, but feet became massive paws. My nose grew outward, my ears shifted on top of my head as they changed shape. My mouth became a muzzle, and my teeth became lethal fangs. I held back the urge to howl my name. Instead, I whispered it, in a voice that was half a growl. Blitzwolfer. I hummed, then lifted my nose, taking a deep whiff of the air. To my human nose, the smell of the city was only sometimes palatable. To Blitzwolfer, the smells of the city were a delight. It was like watching a thousand movies at once and somehow comprehending all of them. 8. Time to go, I ran for a nearby building and leaped up about 20 feet. My claws dug into the brick, and I climbed at high speed, going to the top of the six-story building in seconds. Once there, I ran. There were few things that gave me as much joy as being transformed. Feeling so powerful, running at speeds so fast the world was a blur. My muscles pumped as I ran across the gravel rooftop, legs pushing forward. I was so fast. I finally released a sound as I leaped to the next roof, a bark of joy. The noise exploded from my lungs, and I grinned at the feel of my simple bark resounding through the air like a bomb, echoing into the distance. More barks responded. It was sort of like listening to a foreign language. I couldn't understand the words, but the emotions carried through. Dogs sharing their own joy, their annoyance at my loudness, their challenges towards my dominance. I barked again, this time at the challengers, and laughed when they just barked the challenges once more. 1. I leaped to another rooftop, then climbed up to the next building, claws digging into the stone. I ran around for about 20 minutes, keeping to the shadows and listening closely to the city around me. Blitzwolfer wasn't my best way to track someone down, but his speed, strength, tracking, and sonic powers made him an ideal form to travel in New York City so I could help people. My decision was justified when I heard something. A loud scream. I took a whiff of the air. Elevated since I'd learned to tie to fear and excitement, one of them being sweat. Combined with the scream, I had a target. My right foot slammed into the roof, claws digging into the rocky surface to let me twist around in the middle of my run. I booked it towards the sound. It was only a minute long run, but I smelled blood float up towards me. I growled in annoyance. Deep inside, a more primal part of me found joy in the smell. Fear, blood, all the signs of prey. Prey to hunt. Luckily, it was easy to push the urge to hunt down. Blitzwolfer species, Loboans, were closer to their animal instincts than humans were, but they were still sentient, so I found it easy to focus. When I reached the site of the scream, I found five people. Two men, one woman, attacking a young couple, a man, and a woman. All different races. The man was being held down by two of his attackers, a woman with long black hair and a man with inky black skin. He was screaming, a knife wound in his stomach pouring blood, but still struggling to get to his girl. She was struggling too, crying. The last of the attackers was on top of her, struggling to get her wallet out of her pocket as he grabbed her throat. I leaped down from the rooftop I was on. I didn't waste time waiting to land. My mouth opened. In four different directions. It was weird how natural it felt to open my mouth and feel a seam open in the center of my face, running a line down my nose all the way to my chin. I breathed in. Then I howled. Though that was an understatement. Ayahu. A green pulse of energy flew from my mouth, slamming into the two holding the guy down. All five of them screamed in pain, the man on top of the woman falling back and grabbing his ears. I landed on the ground and sped forward, ignoring the spider web of cracks I left in my landing. I grabbed the guy who'd been robbing the woman by his shirt and lifted him up. At my full height, I was massive, looming over everyone. Hey, I smirked at the terrified look he gave me. I looked over at the other two thugs. How about you surrender? The male and female thugs turned to run. I spun around and threw the guy I was holding at them, running after them at the same time. The guy I'd thrown hit the girl, I grabbed the final guy by his leg. God, please no. Please don't do this. He screamed. Arrest you. I chuckled, pulling to join his friends. They were struggling to rise, but I opened my mouth again. 3. Iowu. They were thrown back by the sonic blast. I threw the other guy with them, then looked over the couple. The woman was with her boyfriend. Or husband I supposed. They were trying to run. Hey. The couple froze. I sighed at the look of fear they were giving me. Relax. I'm going to tie them up, then call the police. The woman didn't seem to listen. She was tugging at her boy as he grunted in pain, his knife wound getting opened further. I rolled my eyes, 
more annoyed than saddened by their fear. Stupid Marvel hatred of things they don't understand, I mumbled. 7. The symbol of the Omnitrix rested on my stomach. I reached a hand for it, tapping the device. It glowed green, my DNA once again undergoing a new change. My fur changed color, going from gray to blue. My arms and legs shifted into more human-shaped ones, right up until five fingers turned into four, and five toes became two. Blades sprouted from my forearms and four legs, made of a bony protrusion. I felt the fur on my face shift, rising into horns from around my eyes. My senses were dulled, but my perception of the world slowed down, as though things were a step behind me. Fast track. 7. I ran as soon as I was transformed. First, I went into the street, looking around quickly. I saw some pallets near a shop that were being held together by rope, which I ran over and untied. Went over to the thugs, picking them up and wrapping them in the coarse rope. Once done, I went over to the couple. The woman was still trying to drag her husband away. I gently moved him over away from her, and ripped his t-shirt off, pressing it into his wound to try and stop the bleeding. Then I slowed down for a bit. What just dash the thugs looked down at themselves, shocked at the sight of the ropes wrapped around their arms and legs. The woman looked down at her arms, blinking at the disappearance of her husband, then looked at me. You were killing him, I said softly, pressing the shirt into his wound. The man looked at me, shocked. I can take you to the hospital in seconds. I can save his life. She stared at me. The man stared at me. After a moment, she nodded quickly, tears in her eyes. Okay, I grabbed my patient's arm so that he was holding his shirt to himself, then I picked up the man in a bridal carry. While fast track wasn't as strong as swamp fire or blitz wolfer, I could still easily carry him. Get on my back. W what? She rose up, staring at me. I was taller than her, and pretty bulky for a speedster, but apparently less terrifying than my Blitzwolfer form because she seemed less fearful. Honey, the guy in my arms grunted. Just, let's trust him, okay. He held the shirt tighter to himself. It was soaked through by now, too. She hesitated for a second longer. Then she walked over to me. It was a bit awkward, leaning down to let her leap onto my back while carrying her boyfriend slash husband slash guy. Once she was on, I rose up again. Hold on tight. Very, very tight. When I was sure she was secure, I booked it towards the nearest hospital. I'd found the couple in the meatpacking district of Manhattan, in an alleyway off W 14th Street. That made the nearest hospital Lenox Health Greenwich Village. I had no idea how long it would take to get there by car. But I ran into the street, ducked around a car moving in slow motion. I tried to be careful, but I still had trouble with quick turns so I had to hold the guy tight and keep making sure the woman was holding tight. Still, what was a moment of adjustment for me, was a microsecond to the couple. Yeah, 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 yeah. The girl screamed in my ear as I ran through the Manhattan streets. Whoa, the guy replied. 4. Soon I found the hospital, an interestingly shaped building with weird circular holes on the upper floor's walls. Lennox Hospital had an emergency room, so I slowed down and went towards it. Fast track was fast but not so good at slowing down or turning on a dime. 5. I rushed the couple past an Asian couple walking out of the doors, going in and screeching to a stop. My feet left long grooves in the linoleum, and the wife leaped off my back. Hey. I called out, gently holding the guy. He's got a knife wound to the stomach. A nurse turned, startled, then stared at me, shocked by my appearance. Lady, come save this guy. My yell startled her into moving. A gurney was brought over and he was put on top, the nurses yelling medical terms I didn't understand. I patted the woman as she went to follow. Good luck. She responded with a teary smile. Thank you so much. With that, she was off. I watched the two go, smiling a bit. I felt good. Helping people was something I was new to, but it wasn't a bad feeling to know you'd made a difference. Gee get down on the floor, said a voice from my left. Six. It was a security guard. He had a gun out, pointed in fear. No. 8. I sped away in a flash of blue. It was a matter of another sprint to go back to the alleyway, where the three thugs still were. One of them had gotten loose and was trying to rise to his feet. I ran in and punched him in the face at high speed. As he staggered back, I went through his friend's pockets, stealing their smartphones and the knife they'd cut the guy with. Another run with the rope to tie them up, then it was on to the police station. The 10th precinct in fact. I ran in, dropped the three off with a note, and was out in milliseconds. 2. 
Good thing. The Omnitrix began to beep, flashing red light. A quick sprint past an alley, then I was back in human form. 2. I tripped mid-run, the switch from Citricaea to human perception of speed throwing me off, but I managed to right myself. I strode out of the alley and looked at my Omnitrix. The center was now red, so no transformations for the next few minutes. I had a couple of aliens I wanted to play with later, but for now. 12. I took out my brand new Stark Tech phone and checked it. No security. I activated the email function, logged out of the girl's account and signed into mine. From there, I could check on my computer's files at home. I went through them for a bit. Nothing new. I went to my research on Latveria. Still no sign of Dr. Doom being a thing, though some basketball player was making a name in the sport. Then I looked into the savage land. Yet, yeah, Antarctica was still frozen. Nothing on the mystical realms, but there was not much chance of that information on the internet. Worth a shot. 3. I sighed, walking down the street on my phone. This had been my pattern after work, saving people's lives, wallets, sometimes saving them from horrors that sickened me. 3. There were times, there was a woman. She'd been savaged. The guys who'd taken her had been at it for hours. 2. It was one month into me living in Manhattan. That was the first time I'd ever put a concentrated effort into hurting someone. Thinking of her, I switched over to the file I had set aside for her case. She was still getting help, for the physical and mental trauma. She was doing her best. Jen Tiller. As for her assailants, they were still in the hospital. I'd shattered their bones, destroyed their bodies. They'd need years before they could actually move, eat, or shit without aid again. I felt a burning guilt for that, a pain at how I'd lost control. But Jen Tiller deserved to know her attackers would never hurt anyone else like that again. 4. As the Omnitrix changed the color back to green, I checked the time. Well, maybe I could save one more before the night was over. 3. I managed to save three more people, then ended the night with my workout before going to sleep. January 10, 2014. Sammy. I yelled out. He turned to look at me, then nodded when I gestured towards a kitchen Eddie had emptied out. I went inside and started swinging, thinking to myself as my arms and hips moved to strike. We were at a new construction site. The last house had been taken down just before New Year's. In that time, I'd gone on more patrols, done more workouts, and done more research. I'd gotten into a routine, but soon I'd need to move on. The patrols, in the end, were just me practicing. Using my powers against non-threats, moving about the city, making technology for useful purposes. I'd have to step onto the stage soon. Actually, help people on a large scale, help the Avengers. Well, unless they went all civil war on me, but there weren't nearly enough superheroes for that to be an issue. Besides, I was on camera enough that even hacking hospital and police security footage wouldn't work forever. 4. As I lifted the hammer again, my phone began to buzz. And so did my Omnitrix. I stopped, surprised. Then I felt horrified. My computer at home had a connection to both my Omnitrix and phone. I hadn't been able to mess with my Omnitrix much since my tech transformation was more of an engineer than a scientist, so none of my attempts to unlock the master code had worked. But I got it to respond to very specific things. 6. I dropped the hammer and hurriedly pulled out my phone. My stomach fell out from under me. I staggered, trying to understand what I was reading. Then I ran. Sammy. My voice cracked and I tried to focus. Sammy was standing near the trailer set up at the site. He turned to look at me as I ran up. I'm leaving. Kid. Sammy reached for his head and blinked in confusion. Mr. Shaked, Frederick, our pinch-faced boss stepped out from around Sammy. I must remind you that United Allied does not pay you for the day's work without Dash. I stepped forward, cocked my hips forward, and slammed my fist into my boss's chin in an uppercut. I quit, Frederick. Two. I don't think he heard you, Sammy said as I walked by. He watched in shock as I left. I ran into an alleyway and opened my Omnitrix up. It was an effort of will trying not to slam my palm into the dial, to carefully pick my alien rather than rush into it in my panic. I finally pushed it down and felt the change come. Fast track. I didn't care about cameras now. I sped through the streets passing through town as fast as I could. 1. Alleyway, fence, alleyway then hop over another fence, put in my coat, rush inside. The smell of burnt food told me my fridge had burned its contents again. I ignored it, putting on my computer. 
I tapped the Omnitrix and returned to human. I, I don't understand what to do with this. I stood in the middle of my living room, staring at my screen. There, in front of me, were words I just didn't understand. Stephen Rogers is now wanted fugitive of S.H.I.E.L.D. All S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are to report any information about his whereabouts and bring him in for questioning. This is the number one priority for all agents. Find Steve Rogers, bring him in. 14. Creator's Thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review. Comment. 31 Comments. Chapter 3, Cap Watch 1. January 10, 2014. For a crazy moment, I felt underdressed in my blue shirt. I stared at my computer screen, trying to understand what was going. The message was from S.H.I.E.L.D., being sent to all agents through priority channels. Every agent on the planet was getting this. And it was insane. Steven Rogers is now a wanted fugitive of S.H.I.E.L.D. All S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are to report any information about his whereabouts and bring him in for questioning. I ran through every bit of comic book knowledge I had, some of it mere scraps I'd overheard. What was going on? Why was S.H.I.E.L.D. hunting Captain America? Captain America going rogue was actually pretty common when I thought about it. It was true for all superheroes, a moment when the people who were supposed to support them started to think of them as criminals. But in this case, what was happening? Was he being mind-controlled? Framed? Did someone trick S.H.I.E.L.D. somehow? 11. Hail Hydra. Said a soft voice in my mind. An image that had actually in the news for a while in my world. Captain America, suddenly saying those two disgusting words. Was it something like that? Some weird pseudo-body switch thing? I needed answers. I needed to find out who were the bad guys. My feet didn't move. I licked my lips. For all my power, I'd spent months fighting thugs, gangsters, and rapists, all for the sake of practice. To get good with my powers, to establish a rhythm, to know when my watch would turn off and reset, though that was still up in the air. All for the day I'd actually fight as an Avenger, to save people from monsters, to do the work I did on patrol of Manhattan on a larger scale. With the Omnitrix, I could save a lot of people. 8. I'd thought about going home a couple of times. Of making a device to make a portal back somehow, but nothing I tried let me do it. For some reason, I was locked in this universe, or at least, my tech couldn't make the calculations to find my home universe so I could actually make a device that would get me there. So while I was here, I wanted to do some good. To use this gift that was forced slash given to me to be a good guy. At that moment, I thought of Ben. I thought of how much he'd gone through. I thought of Marvel's famous characters. Of what made those heroes. And it was funny. But I found my inspiration from a boy who, in this universe, was only 12 years old. With great power, comes great responsibility. 18. That thought made me step forward. I turned off the blinking message and switched over to my shield link. I didn't hesitate anymore. I needed information. And only one man would tell me the truth, or at least his version of it. There was a button on my computer, dedicated to one purpose. It was made from the head of a Hulk doll, something of a joke. Some of my forms had their own sense of humor. I wasn't laughing. I pushed down on the Hulk's head slightly, but not enough to actually activate it. Then I stopped to think before pulling my hand away. Not the time to be impulsive. I walked over to another corner of my home and grabbed the pack I had set aside. It was made from tough leather, filled with clothes, some granola bars, a tough canteen of water, a first aid kit, and knives. With a final thought, I threw off my blue shirt and grabbed one I'd saved. A white one, with a black stripe straight through the center. It felt appropriate. Made for anything, up to getting teleported into outer speed. A bug out bag. I checked the Omnitrix, flipped through my aliens for a moment. Not to transform, just to make sure of what was happening. The plan had always been this, on some level. I was always waiting for a call to action. I'd spent weeks preparing for the day I would need to step into battle, to join the Avengers or help one of the street-level superheroes like me. 2. I looked around my small home, shrugging my backpack slightly. I guess. I guess this is goodbye. I'd been planning to leave in a hurry at any time. That's why there were no posters, no movies, or video games in my house. But still. Leaving was gonna suck. Then I sat down at my computer and pressed down on the Hulk's head. It wiggled slightly, his angry snarl bouncing around. Hulk smash. My computer speakers cried out. My screen flickered. That was it. Sadly, computers aren't exactly dramatic when it came to this sort of thing. 
but in my homemade supercomputer, a program ripped through every firewall in S.H.I.E.L.D. My passive intrusion became an invasion as I pulled every secret they had into my PC. On any other day, this would have been an insane move. No one human can look into the thousands of files belonging to S.H.I.E.L.D. without hundreds of hours of time to read through the sort of dark crap no one should read. I ignored all of it, switching over to the most relevant file. All the work being done in finding one Stephen Rogers. Satellite surveillance, security camera, social network tracking, word of mouth. Everything on the East Coast was trying to find him. Which meant I was too. You know the great thing about technology? With a good enough interface, you don't need to be smart. You just let the tech do the job for you. Not many can build smartphones. Almost anyone can use them. And my supercomputer could do the work of teams of hackers and technicians by itself. It separated out data and started using Shield's resources for me. I needed to find Captain America, and my computer started tracking him. Simple as a couple of button presses. I called the program Cap Watch and left it running. I pulled out my smartphone and connected it to my computer with a cable. I connected the program to my cell phone. With it on, I could keep a watch on Captain Rogers while on the move. The program would work within Shield, hidden by alien programming and keeping me informed. 1 and then my computer beeped. The cameras had found him, at a mall in DC. I made sure my phone was connected to the Capwatch program, then turned back to the monitor. Huh, I leaned towards the screen, squinting. He really does look like Chris Evans, but giant. 5. It was something I'd always known from the footage, but now it was obvious. When he stood next to Thor and the Hulk, he wasn't that big. On his own, dude had to be over 6 feet. He was trying to be low-key, but it's hard for a truck made of super soldier enhanced and sculpted muscle to hid with a hat and a pair of glasses. He was standing with a woman, in the middle of an Apple computer store. They were tapping away at something. Well, the woman in the hoodie was at least. She was shorter than he was and hiding better. I'd barely half noticed her. Something about how she was standing just, made her hard to notice. As though she was hiding even as she stood there. It took me a bit to recognize Natasha Romanoff. So Captain America was innocent? Or, wait, was Black Widow evil in this universe, just like in the Ultimates? Damn it all, more questions. As she typed, another alert came through. I checked it. Ah, shit. The alert was actually two. First, whatever Black Widow had done, it put a level 6 homing program onto them, which meant S.H.I.E.L.D. now knew where they were. Second, someone had triggered one of the motion sensors around my home. I ran to the computer and triggered the outer cameras, made from printer and smartphone parts. Eight screens showing everything around the building showed me what was happening. Men were pouring from black SUVs, guns out. They wore all black uniforms, with bulletproof armor, helmets, and combat boots. They were going down the alley near my home, all with assault rifles out. How the hell did they get here so fast? I grumbled. I knew they would track me once I slammed through their firewalls with the rudeness of a knife to the testes. But I hadn't expected them to be so quick. Or to come with an army. Shield may have been under high alert, but I didn't think they would send assault rifles against a hacker. I made sure my bag was slightly loose on my back. Then I pressed a self-destruct on my computer. It linked with my fridge, stove, and security system. In three minutes, it would explode everything, leaving no trace of who'd lived there. It sucked ass. I'd made a home in Manhattan. My crappy run-down home, with tech that barely worked, a fridge that burned food, and a supercomputer that played Japanese TV on Wednesday no matter what I did. I pushed the thought away. 2. I needed to get to Captain America and Black Widow. I was going to help, and I couldn't let S.H.I.E.L.D. stop me. Whatever was happening, he was the key. 1. Then I looked at the computer. The camera outside my door showed the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents throwing something. At first, I thought it was a smoke grenade, but why throw that at a closed door? The computer helpfully identified it for me with the use of Stark Tech Accelerated Reality, zooming in and naming the object. I didn't read the whole description. Two words were enough. Fragmentation grenade. My right arm lifted. I twisted the face of the Omnitrix. I didn't look at the watch. No time to choose, any alien was more durable than I was. I just slammed my hand onto the watch, roaring as my palm hit my wrist. It's hero time. 9. Boom. When the grenade blew up, it destroyed my metal door. Shrapnel flew into the air, some of it as long as knives. Enough to impale me, to even kill me, but the change had already come. 
I grew up to nine feet in height. Blue-green crystals grew across my skin, sliding out of my pores, surrounding my fingers, my face. I grew massive spikes on my shoulders. My body was made of crystal. Diamond head. 9. I stood there proudly, ignoring the shrapnel bouncing off the crystal. Huh, my voice was odd in this form, resonating. I would have preferred to run, but maybe I should throw a punch or two. Not really my plan to turn into diamond head. I needed to leave, and this form wasn't made for that. Then again, they'd thrown a grenade at me. All right, I snapped my hands to the side, thinking of Thor for some reason. My crystalline hands shapeshifted, becoming massive blades worthy of any anime. I said hero time. I'll make good on that. 1. I leaped out of my home, my backpack now tight, and roared. 1. There were 12 men in the little courtyard outside my home. I'm not sure what they expected, but it wasn't a Petrosapien leaping into the air out of the smoke, glowing blue-green in the sunlight and wearing a black and green outfit. Behind me, my home for over three months blew up. I roared, blade arms out, and slammed into the ground. The men around me started to shoot. Bullets slammed into my form, only to fall to the ground in useless chunks. Diamond Head could survive re-entry on his own. Bullets would do nothing. I ignored it and ran towards one of the soldiers. My left sword arm shifted, turning into a fist. Simple. But when your hands are as big and heavy as diamond heads, they hit with a hell of a lot of force. I punched his chest, sending him flying. My right arm became a shield. I waded in, pumping my left fist in my best boxing stance and hitting another guy in the leg. I tried to be gentle. These were just soldiers after all. 5. I blocked another hail of bullets from one man using my right arm shield, hearing loud noises like metal hammers on stone as bullets hit crystal to no avail. I walked towards him swiftly, reaching a hand out and grabbing his gun away from him. He staggered back. I punched him in the ribs, tossing him aside. Another shield soldier stepped forward to swing his fist at me, and I let him. His fist broke on my chin. He screamed as he fell to his knees, and I kicked him back. Sorry, buddy. 3. Take him down. That was the only response I got. More assault rifle fire was shot at me, and I growled in annoyance. While I couldn't be heard by the bullets, the noise of them hitting me in the head and chest was annoying. I slammed my fist into the floor. Crystal shot into the earth, then exploded outwards around me in a shining imitation of an explosion. I tried to keep the shards dull, but when crystals the size of diamonds erupt upwards at high speed, they hit hard. 3. The soldiers around me screamed as the crystals slammed into them, sending them flying. I heard more men coming towards us, and I knew I had to go. I couldn't exactly kill the good guys, even if they had thrown a grenade at me. I turned and swung my arm out, shooting blades of crystal at the ground. As they sank into concrete, they exploded, turning into a massive ramp. I ran for it, sliding on the crystals and launching into the air. As I came close to another building, I threw more crystals. They grew in seconds into a sort of bowl stabbed into the wall, letting me dive into the bowl, slide down and fly out of the other side. I landed on a roof and sprinted as hard as I could, hearing the guys behind me yelling at each other. Then the womp, womp, womp of a helicopter's blades flew by. A sigh left my lips when a black helicopter spun around to come in front of me. These assholes are persistent. No time for niceties. Mid-run, I spun to aim myself at the helicopter, my legs and arms pumping hard. It turned its right side towards me, the door sliding open. A guy levered a freaking minigun at me. The barrels started turning at high speed. All this for a little hacking. 1. The guy pointing the minigun couldn't hear me, considering the helicopter blades were sending a massive ruckus into the air. The minigun started firing. I lifted a hand up, shape-shifting my arm to turn into a giant shield again. Big bullets the size of thumb slammed into the shield, sending flattened bullet rounds bouncing on the rooftop as they uselessly tried to break the unbreakable. I sprinted, holding my shield in front of me. My other hand swung outwards and tossed another crystal, a large stone bouncing on the ground before I leaped onto it. The stone grew under my feet, surging upwards and sending me towards the helicopter. My shield became a sword in midair. 2. Raw. With that cry, I slammed my sword hand deep into the steel of the helicopter, at the point where the tail met the body of the chopper. The sound of metal being sliced by steel was a wailing screech of noise in the air. My sword sprouted a flower of crystals within the helicopter, pushing them to grow as fast as I could make them go. 
The guy with the minigun stared at me as the section of the helicopter I was hanging from began to sprout blue-green knives from the inside. All along the inside of the chopper, more and more crystals sliced through the seats, the fuel tank, grinding through the aircraft until a massive one rose from the floor. It was as big as a man and forced the guy at the minigun to back up as it crowded the helicopter. The whole thing began to fall, unbalanced and leaking fuel as my crystals sliced into it. There's a bar down the street, I said with a grin at the shocked soldier, still held to the chopper by my sword hand. I suggest you guys go there after this, drink things off. I leaped from the chopper, aiming towards another building nearby. I slammed into the rooftop in a ground pound and hurriedly looked over at the helicopter. The thing was unsteady, about to slam into a building nearby. 1. I reached my mind into the crystals within the helicopter. Crystals feel like, light, warmth of the sun on your face, even as you feel a cooling breeze on your arms. I moved that feeling, carefully, my arms swaying in the air as my carved lips curved. As the crystals moved, I dragged the copter through the air. Its rotors screamed, struggling to fight my pull. I grunted with the effort, trying to hold the aircraft, and guided it slowly to the ground. When it came close to the ground, away from any cars, the pilot stopped fighting me. Together, me swaying my arms and the pilot in the street ahead of me moving his joystick, I slowly lowered the chopper to the ground, ignoring the sounds of more men coming up onto the roof behind me for a second. As soon as the chopper was down, I spun around. 1. More soldiers stood behind me than had appeared at my door. About 20 or so. I stared at them as they pointed their guns at me my eyes narrowing. For some reason, this felt, wrong. Opening up with a grenade on a house that could just have held a very stupid hacker. Coming in with guns up, without even speaking to me in some way. I mean, sure, I'd committed a crime, but hackers don't get armies attacking them, they get job offers. All of this felt less like shield, and more like I was fighting an evil army. 5. The men surrounded me, one in the center barking at me. Get down, get down now, we will shoot you, you damn freak. 1. Rude, I grumbled softly. 1. Guns cocked. I raised my hands. Assault rifle fire slammed into me. I didn't stagger, my feet having sprouted spikes through the bottom of my shoes to let me stay standing. As the bullets hit my stone skin, my fingers sank into my palms, turning them into flat planes with spikes popping out. I fired an assault of spikes from my new cannon arms. They slammed into the ground in front of the guys shooting at me erupting into a wall of massive spikes to defend me. 1. I turned and leaped off the building, reaching for my chest. A massive palm tapped the Omnitrix. Once more, the change came. My crystal skin became reptilian, scaled and colored brown. My massive form shrank to become far more skinny, aerodynamic. My backpack was stretched to the limit when another growth sprouted on my back, which solidified before a pair of wings snapped out from it. My face became beaked, and my eyesight sharpened as my hands and feet each grew three talons. In midair, falling towards the ground I pointed myself towards the ground. A section of my back came alight with green energy. I screeched for joy as I shot forward at the pavement like a jet engine. Before I hit the ground, I twisted my body upwards in a maneuver that would have snapped a human back, at way too many Gs. I rocketed back up into the sky as fast as I could, the organic engine on my back roaring with an unearthly noise. I released a pulse of energy, shooting into the sky at sonic speeds. I passed the guys on the rooftop chopping away at my crystal formation, spinning upwards and crying out the name. Astrodactyl. 13. With that cry, I spun around. Okay, time to G-Skriak. I blinked, floating for a moment. That's weird to get used to, Squayak. I said, letting another screech of noise out once I'd finished. Sometimes you have to let the form do what it wants. And Astrodactyl liked to release loud bird noises when it talked. Hell, I kinda liked it too. I tapped the Omnitrix again, this time trying to access the GPS. I didn't have much time before the Omnitrix would time out, especially with all the stuff I'd had Diamond Head do, so I quickly accessed the direction of the mall Captain America had been in. A moment's orientation and I rocketed away, zooming through the sky with a tremendous boom of noise as I broke the sound barrier. Creator's Thoughts Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 14 comments. Chapter 4, Hydra on Tail. Chapter 4. Author's note, this chapter was fun.
Considering the two new aliens revealed, I had to do some playing around with the changes in personality and the way the aliens act. One, in particular, was a lot of fun, and I loved the energy it brought out of me, though I imagine some would find him annoying. One, overall, this chapter was fun to write, and I hope you enjoy it. One, nobody can really understand the joy of flying, of rocketing through the air, screaming on a wave of air, diving and ducking as gravity fought to grab you and failed. The wind roared past me, my talons trailing behind me as my wings felt the icy chill pass above and over my skin. But I had a purpose. Even as I flew, I knew the truth. There was no way Captain America was at that mall in Washington DC anymore. I had to find them again, him and that mysterious woman with him. With my eyesight, I focused on where I was aiming for. I needed to find them again, which meant hacking. I'd been flying for about a minute. Astrodactyl was fast, fast enough to break the speed of sound with ease. 2. The distance between Manhattan and Washington DC is only about 230 miles. Even Mach 1 is 340-ish meters a second, and I could clear that with ease, which meant I needed to slow down so I could see what I needed. I also dropped as low as possible at points, flying along rivers, under bridges, trying to avoid detection by radar. About six minutes into the flight, the Omnitrix started to beep. I shot towards the ground, glad I wasn't as high up as the 20,000 feet I'd been at before. I came down behind a 7 to 11 on the outskirts of DC. It was in one of the rougher neighborhoods of the city. As I landed, the Omnitrix turned off, and I landed in a role as a human being. I stood up and looked around the empty street, then started walking. 2. Even with everything I'd done to try and shake off the radar, I knew it wouldn't last. I needed more. I needed a tech solution, a way to stop anyone, anywhere from tracking me. I'd thought of building one before, but I was more focused on hacking. I grabbed my phone and found the nearest technology store, a Best Buy a few streets away. I started jogging, keeping my eyes open for anyone shady. I wasn't exactly trained in espionage, so I couldn't see if anyone was following, but it was the best I could do on short notice. Funny. All the power to change the world on my wrist, and the first time I get the chance to help an Avenger, it's on a mission more dependent on spy stuff rather than explosions. I hurried down the sidewalk and got to the parking lot of the Best Buy. When I walked in, a kindly older woman with a badge on her chest that said her name was Martha smiled at me. 7. Hello there. Do you need any help? As much as the universe can give me, I said quickly, striding past her fast. She blinked after me as I headed to the gaming center. Years back, in my home universe, scientists used a little under 2,000 PlayStation 3s to create a supercomputer. It used the advanced graphics capability of the gaming console to do things other supercomputers could do at a fraction of the cost. The PS3 was released in 2006, while the year I was in now was 2014. More importantly, it was created in a universe without Tony Stark. 3. In this Marvel Universe, I found stuff I wouldn't be able to back home. I checked my phone as I walked through the store, and kept track of Captain America and Black Widows traveling through my CapWatch program. I had one of the employees get me one of the new Stark console systems, which he told me would be waiting at the front for me since they didn't keep them on shelves. We did the same with a small monitor, a pair of earphones, some graphics cards, and some Legos, though I could carry a few of those items myself. Once at the cashier, the problem started. That will be $1,078.38. The cashier, a cheery young woman with black hair that had a red stripe in her bangs, smiled at me. And will you be paying with debit or credit? 1. Cash, I reached into my bag. Over the months, I'd only spent money on essentials. The rest, I got from trash cans, sometimes pawn shops, but usually, I rarely spent the money I got from my job for anything that wasn't food. Add in the money I stole from thugs and gangbangers, and I had some cash to spend. Of course, I'd forgotten that a young man looking hectically around and carrying over a thousand dollars in cash looks suspicious. I realized something was wrong when the cashier started taking an extra long time to check my bills. Then I saw the employee in the background making a phone call. He was trying not to look at me. Someone came up behind me. Excuse me, sir. I turned around. The guy behind me was short, kinda pudgy, with slicked back hair. He looked like a normal guy. He smiled. Can you come with me please? He opened his coat. Inside was a badge with an eagle symbol on it. Shield. What? 
Were you in the store already? I said as the cashier hurried away. The guy shook his head. No, but I was close by when we intercepted the phone call to the police. It just took him a while to get here. He nodded behind me. I turned around. There was a guy, standing taller than me. He was striding towards me, wearing nothing but a tank top, which showed off he had enough muscle for a fitness magazine. His head was bald, and his eyes were hard. He was walking towards me, practically glaring. Don't move. The guy who'd gotten my attention first was suddenly pressing a gun to my head. But I'd already reached for the Omnitrix. I thought about changing the alien I had set on it for when I left the store. But it didn't look like I had time. Get down on the floor, and we dash. I pressed the face of the Omnitrix. The guy fired his gun, but I was already knee height to him. 1. I shrank down by about 5 feet. My hair faded away. My ears grew out behind me as my nose grew forward. I felt my arms become skinny sticks, yet somehow become even more powerful. My skin became red. My blue jeans changed to fit my new form, my sneakers as well. And my white t-shirt shrank with me, the black spreading out. As it did, the shirt shifted colors further. A gold image appeared. Like a man wearing a helmet with big goggles on and a Triforce symbol on the eyebrow. Over the head were two words. Black Sabbath. Three more words rested under the head. US Tour 78. 1. Jury Rig. I cried out, stretching my arms out as though I was a menacing monster, rather than a tiny red gremlin in a tour shirt. 10. Ha 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 ha. I giggled, rubbing my hands together. Oh yes, time to go nuts baby. The guy who'd pointed the gun at me stared for a second. I leaped up and grabbed his face. Ha 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 ha. I punched him in the nose, hard, cackling madly as I held on to him by his right ear. Oh god, get him off me. The guy screamed falling back as I punched him over and over with a tiny fist. He reached up and tried to pull me off him. I leaped away, over him, and ran towards the main store. 2. My mind was racing. Jury Rig was just a manic energy kind of guy as is. But here, in the middle of a Best Buy, oh my god, I stopped in the middle of an aisle full of printers. My fingers twitched as I stared at the devices in front of me. Ha, he 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 he, disassemble. 2. With that battle cry, I leapt for the nearest printer. My powerful red claws dug into the plastic, ripping through the casing. As I did, my mind began to link it all together. One part connected to this part so it could do this. And if that was possible, why couldn't I just do this? The feeling of tearing the printer apart, of understanding through destruction, made me cackle like a madman, my squeaky voice filling the air. Disassemble, 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 disassemble. In a blur, three printer were torn to pieces. Then I started mashing them together. The computer parts, mechanical sections, the pieces just fit together in my head. My mind may have been as hyper as the flash on crack, but I just felt this, natural intuition for technology. I knew the machine because it just made sense. 2. Reassemble. I cried out, creating a power source in the handle. Reassemble, reassemble. I placed the glass in the barrel as a focusing lens, then jammed plastic all around it for reinforcement. Ha! Fixed it, baby. 3. Jury Rig was my most mind-bending form. But in some ways, he was also my most peaceful. Just as I finished the machine, the bald guy from earlier came around the corner. When he saw me, he started walking down the aisle. I picked up the device in my hand and pointed it at him. Hey, baldy. I said with a fanged grin. Say hello. The creation I'd made was shaped like a giant gun made of plastic. I pulled the trigger that had once been a piece of plastic, and the gun fired, sending me flying from the recoil. A ball of light slammed into the tall bald guy. It pressed into his chest lifting him up and sending him flying. Ha! Huh. I cried out. The guy slammed into an earphone display, shattering the plastic. What you gonna do now? The bald giant rose up. His nostrils flared, rage in his face. He grabbed the metal shelving next to him with his right hand. He smirked suddenly, his rage becoming determination. I can think of something. As I watched, his right hand changed color. From the point where he was grabbing the shelving, it started to match the shelving. For a moment, I thought it was some sort of camouflage. Then I realized it was so much worse. 3. The color moved up his arms to his shoulders, and up over his head, until he was completely white, metal replacing skin. Huh, I said, my eyes wide. Your last name wouldn't happen to be Levin, would it? 1. The big metal man roared, rushing at me. 
The imagery of a giant white being of metal rushing for a tiny red gremlin carrying a giant gun was hilarious. I raised the gun and fired again, as fast as I could. The light balls didn't send him flying anymore, only smashing into him with force. I leaped onto a shelf and started running down the aisle, kicking products to the floor as he followed me. Crusher Creel, right. I smirked at the roar I got in response. What, you don't like that name? I leaped over to the next aisle, shooting at the guy. My gun didn't have a punch, but at least the light balls could knock him around. I leaped over to the next aisle, then the next, going from shelf to shelf. He spun to follow me, crashing through shelves as I leaped from one to another. I leaped over one more. Then I leaped off the shelf and down into the aisle, leaving me to hide against the shelves and wait. To my left, Creel slammed through the shelves, crossed, the aisle, and crashed through the next one. I grinned at the sight of him continues his chase as I stood behind him, then turned. I needed to escape. But I also needed to be able to keep anyone from chasing me. I ran through the holes Creel had made, going back until I hit the smartphone stuff. I grabbed three phones and turned to get more. Two. There you are. I looked up. The guy who I'd punched in the face came running down the aisle. His nose was bloody, and he seemed enraged. He sprinted full force. Come here, you little shit. He reached out his hands to grab me. I grinned. Rude. Then I lifted my gun. He had a moment to realize what it was. His eyes widened, and his sprint became a backpedal. Then a ball of solidified red light slammed into his face. I didn't stop shooting as he flew through the air, hitting him three more times and knocking him across the store. Eat it. Then I ran. I grabbed more stuff, earphones, a keyboard, alarm clocks, stuffing my arms as I ran through the aisles of Best Buy. In the distance, I could hear Creel trying to find me. While I was surprisingly quick for being so small, I was on a low amount of time. Disassemble, I whispered, unable to fight my compulsion, but still lowering my voice. I grabbed at all the stuff in my arms and tore it apart. Smartphones were torn apart so their batteries could be used as power sources, and their touch screens as interfaces, their wireless stuff to interact with satellites. The keyboard and alarm clocks used for their circuitry. The earphones to produce sound. Except one which I used to make something else. Soon, I was finished. I had a small block of random wires and circuitry before me, and a smaller one that looked like a pair of headphones turned into makeshift speakers with a Darth Vader alarm clock in the middle. I was about to pick them up and run when the wall behind me exploded. Yeep. That was all I got out. Then I was picked up and slammed into a shelf. Hands of steel wrapped around my thin neck. Gak. Creel held me in the air. He smiled at the sight of me in his grasp. Slowly, he began to squeeze. G-H-H-H. I wheezed out. My left hand hurriedly reached for the Omnitrix symbol on my belt as I mentally reached for a hero who could fight off Creel. 2. I changed. In seconds, my height exploded up to 9 feet. Red skin became orange and white fur, striped black. My muscles exploded outwards, becoming massive boulders beneath my fur. My feet became paws, and my hands each grew a single massive claw popping out of the back of my wrist. And my face became that of tigers. 1. Wrath. 11. I roared in Creel's face, picking him up and tossing him back. He slammed into some shelves, destroying the store further as his metal form broke them. You ain't about to choke me again, bub. 2. With that, I stepped forward. Creel went to meet me, lashing out in a cross aimed at my chin. I caught his fist, a small shockwave as metal met flash, both with superhuman power. When he stared at me in shock, I grinned savagely. That's right Buster. I pulled in his arm, my claw slashing at his stomach. For a moment, my claw and his stomach clashed. A long gash was scratched into his steel form, but not enough to hurt him. He freed his fist from my grasp and fell back, but I stepped for. Yeah got nothing. I roared, meeting him in battle. I roared, rushing him slashing my claws into him. He fell back under my power. I relished in the sight as his metal skin was carved by my claws. That's right. Let me tell you something Crusher Creel. Nobody can beat Wrath. I picked him and slammed him into the ground. I'm the best there is at what I do, and it isn't very nice. 5. You talk too much, Creel punched me in the face from his position on the ground. I fell back, staggering. He followed me, punching my ribs. For the first time since I found out I had wrath as a transformation, I felt pain from a blow, my bones groaning at the blow. I grunted, rage blinding me. 
You think you're great, mister I can turn into what I touch? Well, bring it on. I punched him in the face. 3. Then Creel punched me in mine. We duked it out, tearing through Best Buy, turning shelves into scrap against our bodies. I grabbed a flat screen and slammed it over his head. He grunted as hundreds of dollars of metal and plastic tore over him. His skin flickered in color to match the TV, and he hurriedly grabbed some steel shelving, to change into steel again. I roared, hitting him over and over. Creel was silent now, trying to beat me with every bit of skill he had, his fists slamming into my chest, ribs, and face. I felt some respect for a moment. Creel was tough. But mostly, I was frustrated this problem wasn't going away by punching it. So, I decided it was time to really fight. When Creel threw another punch, I leaped up. About 20 feet in the air. Messy elbow drop. Creel tried to dodge, but I came down too fast, slamming my full body weight into his back with my elbow. He hit the ground, hard. I rolled to my feet and grabbed him, holding him upside down in a hug, his face outwards. I leaped upwards. And as I came down with Creel's head leading, I called out once more. Polaris pile driver. 1. The ground shook with our impact. For a moment, it was still. I sat in a crater that had once been the gaming center of the Best Buy, Creel lying on his face. I rose up, and picked Creel up by his leg, lifting him until he was upside down and face to face with me. Creel was still awake, but weak. I grinned toothily. Wrath wins. Creel didn't respond. Yay, wrath wins. 2. I tossed him aside. A gunshot echoed in the store. A brief impact jostled my arm, a mere pinprick compared to I turned around. A bunch of guys were coming towards me, all dressed in police uniforms or familiar black military gear. I scowled. Wrath is real annoyed with you idiots. I roared. I reached for the Omnitrix symbol on my chest, tapping it. 1. Orange fur became brown reptilian skin. Astrodactyl. There were about 15 men coming towards me. I opened my mouth and charged it with star power. Squawk. A beam of green energy flew from my mouth, slamming into a man wearing a cop's uniform. As he fell back, my jetpack launched me into the air. I fired again and again in the air, forcing the men back into cover, then cartwheeled in the air. In the aisles I'd been before, I saw three men walking towards the items I'd made. I flew over, dropping next to them. Not happening. I snapped out. The star energy within me shifted to my wrists, in the bracers on my forearms. I unleashed it, creating two energy whips that sprouted from the holes on my wrists. The three men raised guns to shoot me. I snapped my left energy whip out, wrapping the legs and pulling the whip. They fell in a heap. One of the men reached for his hip. I twirled my right energy whip, then lashed out, hitting him in the face. I did it to the other two, then got on to business. 1. I turned to my creations. First, I fired an energy beam at the gun I'd made, destroying it as thoroughly as I could. Then I scooped up the other two devices. I placed each on either side of my hip. That finished, I lifted up once more. The soldiers were coming towards me again. One had a rocket launcher, which he fired at me as I hovered in the air. I spun an energy whip around and lashed out, exploding the rocket in midair. 1. You'll have to do better than that, squawk. I flew for the exit. As I launched forward, my jetpack released a propulsion blast behind me. It hit the ground and exploded, sending the shield agents flying. I swung my whip at the glass of the front store window, breaking it. With that, I was out in the fresh air. I flew upwards, only to widen my eyes at the sight above me in the sky. Cool, squawk. A quinjet. It floated over me, with its rotor wings, cool design, and even missiles on the wings, a feature I'd never seen on them. I flew up past it. The Quinjet turned towards me, a Gatling gun popping out of its nose. Oh, squawk. The loud whine of a Gatling gun filled the air as I rocketed around. The Quinjet spun to follow me, the Gatling guns filling the space behind me with bullets. The Quinjet fired missiles as well, three gray ones that followed me. I swung left to right, up and down, but I couldn't shake them. My eyes narrowed. This is a lot of resources coming at me, I grumbled. With that, I did a loop. I zoomed above the Quinjet, where its Gatling gun couldn't reach me. The pilot tried to rise up, but it wasn't fast enough. I turned and unleashed my right energy whip, star energy lashing out to destroy all three missiles. Then I aimed at the Quinjet and fired a blast from my mouth at the top. The aircraft staggered under the blast. I flew upwards, 
releasing another propulsion blast from my jetpack, leaving the Quinjet behind me. As I did, I reached for my waist and touched one of the devices. Two things happened. First, the device began to emit energy that would interfere with any radar, as well as hacking satellites to erase my image as I flew. Then the first device activated the second device on my hip. That device projected a bubble in the air around me, one that kept sound crystal clear. Then it began to play a song, the music starting with a guitar riff. As it played, I sighed. One. Gonna have heavy metal in my head all day now, I said, despairing of ever understanding why jury rig was so weird. All you women who want a man of the street. But you don't know which way you want to turn. Just keep a coming and put your hand out to me. Cause I'm the one who's gonna make you burn. 4. With that music playing, I did an aileron roll, released another propulsion blast, and shot forward. I landed once I figured I was far enough away. I had to check where Captain America was, and my phone disappeared with my clothes whenever I transformed. I took a moment to despair the loss of my backpack. All that money, gone. What a waste. I touched down in a bit of forest, changing back. The forest was mostly dead, considering it was January. I took a breath, feeling a bit chilly, but not bad. I sat against a tree and slowly slid down until my butt hit the floor. I needed a break. Even with all my fighting in New York, I'd never been involved in so much combat. And Creel. Damn. If Creel had fought a bit smarter, he could have beaten me. Even with the Omnitrix healing me, I still felt his blows, the sheer power he had. What was S.H.I.E.L.D. doing working with Crusher Creel? 8. I stopped, just trying to breathe for a moment. Once done, I checked Capwatch once more. The program was still running fine. I did a quick check and found it wasn't compromised. No one had found it. Thank you, Alien Tech, for being so damn broken. Jury Rig was awesome. Anyways, I leaned against the tree and zoomed in on the map, showing me where the two were. Between my shopping, the fight with Creel and the Quinjet, and my rushed flight away from Best Buy, Captain America and Black Widow had made progress. They were on I-95, driving steadily north. If they kept going, they'd eventually hit Jersey. Sammy would have had something to say about Jersey. I watched them, trying to decide if I should join them. The devices I'd put on were still working at my hips, both humming ominously, but steadily. The beginning refrains of Enter Sandman began to play, kept in a three-foot bubble around me by the device. The tiny image on my screen of a blue truck driving steadily continued to play. I sighed, then got to my feet. I checked the Omnitrix, wishing it had some sort of energy bar I could use to tell how much energy I had left in it. Finally, I just activated it, transforming back into Astrodactyl. With that, I was off into the sky. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishub. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 16 comments. Chapter 5, Meeting Zola and Falcon. It took some stops to catch up with them. I had to keep landing to give the Omnitrix a break and check my cap watch program. But soon, I was flying over I-95. And after that, I saw them. Captain America was driving. Black Widow was in shotgun. They were talking about something. I swooped in above their truck, staying high so they wouldn't see me. The truck was a big, brand new one. I didn't know Captain America owned a truck. I wasn't sure if it mattered, but it seemed funny somehow. I followed them like that for a bit, trying to figure out how to make contact. Flying was fun, but I could feel exhaustion coming in with all of the constant Omnitrix used today. I could keep going for a bit longer. But I needed a nap tonight. With no end to their driving in sight, I followed them by leapfrogging. I would land once the Omnitrix timed out, watch their progress on cap watch, then take off again to catch up. Like stalking taken to the next level, something I tried not to think about. I had to stay high, using my insane eyesight to see them, so I wouldn't freak them out by flying in close. A giant pterodactyl with rockets wasn't something they'd find comfort in. Slowly, I flew. They drove. For over an hour, we went like that. Finally, while I was just wondering if I should cut my losses and take a nap, they turned off the interstate. I sighed in relief and followed them. They drove through the city streets, then down country roads. Until they were driving on one road, an overgrown one that hadn't been used in a long time. A military base was in the distance. It was empty, run down. After some thought, I flew ahead of Cap and Black Widow. Once I got to the base, I dropped to land at the gate, turning human once more. I walked up to it, reading the sign hanging on the chain fence. 
Campley High. The whole fence was brown with rust. A beat-up old stop sign rested on it as well. In the light of the sinking sun, I could see that the rest of the base was much the same, a relic of a bygone age. All red brick buildings and rusted railings everywhere. I turned when the truck slowly rode up to me. I raised my hands up, smiling as best as I could. Captain America stopped the truck about 12 feet from me and stepped out with Black Widow. They'd clearly seen me and, because Cap's shield was on his arm, and Black Widow had her gun out and pointed. I took a deep breath as they came closer. I reached for my waist and turned off the music that had been with me all day. Hi, I said, as brightly as I could. My name's Mahmoud. I want to help. The two shared a glance. Captain America walked up to me. There was an incredible grace to him. For all his size, he walked like he was half a second from simply lifting off into the air. Black Widow was different. Where he was grace, she was subtlety. As he came forward, she stepped behind him, almost hiding in his shadow. I tried not be unnerved by that. But then, I was also trying not to geek out. Captain America was holding his shield. The shield? Made of vibranium in this universe, rather than a vibranium iron alloy, it was still able to take hit from inconceivably powerful things, including Thor, and Captain America and Black Widow. I was looking at superheroes. As they stopped in front of me, I couldn't stop smiling. How did you find us? Black Widow asked. Shield, they stiffened. I quickly continued. I mean because I hacked Shield. I used their satellites and database to find you, then kept anyone from finding you. Here, see. I reached into my pocket. Ah, careful, Black Widow said in warning, pointing her gun at my face. I flinched. After a moment, I slowly pulled out my phone, raising it for them to see. I switched on the Capwatch app, then tossed it to Cap, who caught it in his right hand. He turned it look, then blinked. Capwatch. I winced. I, like my programs to have fun names. Black Widow's lips twitched upwards. And you can follow us with this. He asked, looking up at me. Why? What do you want? I spoke fast. Back in October, I was given this, I lifted a hand up, displaying the Omnitrix. I don't know why I was given it, but it gave me powers. So I started using those powers to help people, traveling around Manhattan and saving anyone I found. It was good work. Speed it up, Black Widow said. It's cute you like playing the superhero, but we're on a timetable. Yeah, got it. So anyway, I hacked into Stark Industries and S.H.I.E.L.D., the two shared a surprised glance at that. I was doing that to make sure the next time a Battle of New York or a Convergence happens, I'd be there to help. And when they announced that Captain America was enemy of the state out of nowhere, I wanted to do something. So I did one big hack, grabbing all the info I could so I could find you. And the next thing I know, S.H.I.E.L.D. is tossing a grenade at my door. Yet, yeah, there's a lot of that going around, Captain America noted with a smirk. That watch, Black Widow stared at the Omnitrix. I've seen the symbol on it. You're the guy who's been running around Manhattan the last few months. The one who can turn into all those creatures. The fact Black Widow knew about me wasn't much of a surprise. Even with all I'd done to try and keep off the grid, there was no way someone hadn't discovered my presence in New York, especially considering the people I'd saved had a perfect view of me. I nodded towards Black Widow and she gave me a smile. More of an amused one, rather than a kind one, but still a smile. Fury was going to send someone to try and make contact with you. You were going to be investigated soon. Hopefully without a grenade thrown at me, I said with a grimace. Well, it wouldn't have been my first choice, she said. So you what, wanted to help us out of the goodness of your heart? Yes, I said. I mean, I kinda destroyed a Best Buy to find you guys. Which, I gotta be honest, I'm feeling kinda guilty about. Captain America stepped forward, motioning towards the Omnitrix. And you said that watch lets you hack things. No, I lifted my wrist to show it to him. This isn't a watch. This is the Omnitrix. And it lets me turn into aliens. Asgardian. Captain America asked. Not from what I've heard, Black Widow answered. So you were a superhero in New York, found out Captain America was being chased by S.H.I.E.L.D., and you were such a fanboy you decided to come and help. Yes, I sighed in relief. That is exactly it. Black Widow and Captain America shared a look. After a moment, she put her gun down and Captain America came over to grab my shoulder. He smiled at me, and I found myself grinning back. I'm not sure I can trust you, but I'd like to. He's naive like that, 
Black Widow said. She holstered her gun and stepped towards the gate. I'm still going to shoot you if you turn out to be working for S.H.I.E.L.D. Not likely, I said as Captain America stepped around me and used his shield to shatter the lock on the gate with one smooth strike. Grenades thrown at me tend to make me an enemy. You're really stuck on that grenade thing, aren't you? Black Widow said. We entered the camp together. Yeah well, I'm sensitive like that. So uh, what exactly are you guys here for? What is this place? It's where I was trained, Captain America said. We're following a lead. We walked through the camp, looking around the place. Trained before or after you started punching Hitler. Captain America chuckled. Actually, I never met the real Hitler. I mostly dealt with his soldiers and the Red Skull. But this was before all that, he looked around. For a moment, he looked a thousand yards away. I was still just a skinny kid from Brooklyn, trying to be a soldier. And now you're Captain America, I said, watching as Black Widow moved over to look into one of the windows. Call me Steve, he gave me a smile, then turned to look at a nearby flagpole. Once again, it looked like he was somewhere else. When I looked at Black Widow, she was eyeing me. Even as we walked around, she was still eyeing me. She had some sort of scanner in her hand, and it was beeping as she held it up. I looked at it thoughtfully, scratching my chin. This is a dead end, Black Widow said. She put down her scanner and put it in her pocket. Zero heat signatures, zero waves, not even radio. Whoever wrote the files must have must have used a router to throw people off. She looked over at Steve, who was staring at a bunker. What is it? I looked at him as well. He seemed to have an epiphany. He started moving towards the bunker, I went to follow, and Black Widow hopped over a railing to join us. Army regulations forbid storing munitions within 500 yards of the barracks, he said as we walked up to the bunker. He gave us a look. This building's in the wrong place. He smashed the lock on the door to the up, the munition bunker, I guess. I couldn't help but stare at the shield as it turned steel into scrap. That thing was seriously awesome. We walked down a flight of stairs and found what looked like a large office space. I'm not a soldier, but this doesn't look like munitions, I said, stepping down to the place. It's not, Black Widow was looking at a wall nearby. It's shield. Or maybe where it started, Steve added. We were all looking at a massive symbol on the wall, the centerpiece of the room. An eagle, surrounded by the words, Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division. That's probably your fault. I said without thinking. Steve looked at me, surprised. What was? Ah, uh, I chuckled, waving at his right arm, still holding the shield. I mean, they worked really hard to make up a name that spelled shield, right? Steve looked down, surprised. He held it up. After a moment, he gave his weapon a warm smile. Yeah, I guess they did. I can sense anything that might be in here if you guys let me. How? Natasha asked. I responded by waving the Omnitrix at her. If someone other than us has been in here in recent years, I'll be able to follow their trail. Steve and Natasha shared another look. Do it, Steve told me. All right. Keep in mind, I won't be able to talk in this form, so just follow my lead. I opened up the Omnitrix, flipping through my menu. I needed to sense things human eyes couldn't blitz Wolfer was great because he had a good range of powers, including his senses. But when I really needed to track something or someone down even after years... I pressed the face, and the change came in a millisecond. I went from bip to quadruped. Orange fur sprouted across my body, covering me in a thick armored coat. My eyes sank away and disappeared, and new sensory organs grew at the nape of my neck. Fingernails became claws. A shoulder brace appeared, with the Omnitrix glowing brightly on it. I didn't speak English in this form, but if the snarl I barked out when I finished could be translated, I knew what it would be. Wild Mutt. Well that's new, Steve said. His voice was different now. It was as though he was so much clearer. Like my human ears were only hearing him on the tiniest level. Now, I could hear every bounce and quiver in his voice. That's just how being wild mutt felt in general. Every scent in the air, every sound, singing to me. There was no sense of color beyond heat, and photographs would be blank rectangles to me. But I didn't feel blind. How could I, when the world was so much more vivid now? When I could hear heartbeats, smell sweat, feel the primal part of the world in my heart. Being wild mutt was like becoming something simpler than a human. But it also felt purer somehow, as though the complications of sight was replaced by a roaring world of beautiful sense and sound. I sniffed the air with my gills, listened to it all. 
He said he can't talk like this, Black Widow said. There was a smell coming from her mouth I had to think to recognize. Bubblegum? A lot of it, too. She had some more in her pocket. How's he supposed to tell us anything? I snarled moving about the room for a moment. I smelled something else, beyond Steve, Nat, the spiders and the concrete. Someone else had been here, months back. He smelled like airline fuel. I moved over to the stairs, following his trail. He'd walked over to an office. I turned, growling at the two. What, over there? Steve walked over to join me, and I pushed the door, smashing it off its hinges and into the ground. Steve cocked an eyebrow. Huh, strong. Show off, was Black Widow's opinion. The two followed me in as I sniffed my way up to some shelves. There were three big blank rectangles up on the wall, which I ignored to follow the scent. Captain America and Natasha walked up the rectangles behind me, talking about them in a way that made me realize they were photos. Cap apparently knew them. His heartbeat skipped a little when he saw them. Time to ask about that later. I followed the smell of the man from before to some shelves. There was a gap in between the shelves where I could smell metal and plastic beyond it, a bit of ozone to indicate electricity, and Steve noticed it as well. If you're already working in a secret office, I gripped the gap in between the shelves, shoving them apart. Even after all the years, the right shelf easily slid on its rails. Why do you need to hide the elevator? Just a light on the wall and a pair of doors with windows in them. We walked towards it, me sniffing at the air, and Black Widow went up to the keypad next to it. She lifted a device over the keypad, and it created a hologram over the device, showing the numbers on the pad. The hologram shuffled the numbers and quickly came up with the code, which she pressed into the pad. The elevator door slid open, and we walked inside. As the elevator dropped, Cap looked at me. You uh, gonna change back. I looked up at him. I mean, is there a time limit, or, do you have to press a button? I growled in annoyance, reaching for my shoulder to tap the Omnitrix. In a flash of light, I was back in my white and black shirt and blue jeans. I sighed in disappointment. Ironically, changing from wild mutt always made me feel blind as a human. What does that feel like, anyway? Captain America asked. Remember the day you became a superhuman? I said. That sudden feeling of becoming stronger, faster, having better senses. Steve nodded. Like that, but I can change back. God, I wish we had time for me to interrogate you. Black Widow muttered. I looked over at her. I mean, you could just ask me questions. I prefer interrogation, lets me get the real story. She replied. You never talk to people over coffee. I had no idea why I was talking the way I was. For some reason, it was really easy to talk to her. She was funny. I do, but not when they can suddenly turn into giant dogs. What, you don't like Tony Stark? We shared a grin, and Steve chuckled. Any chance you guys can tell me about what's going on? The elevator was still lowering. I mean, why is S.H.I.E.L.D. attacking you guys? We aren't sure, Steve said. As far as we know, the answers are here. What about Nick Fury? I asked. I mean, he's the head of S.H.I.E.L.D., why didn't he stop this? The two shared a look, then faced the doors again. Steve answered. He was killed by the Winter Soldier. I stared at him. Then at Black Widow. She looked back at me. And I scratched at my wrist, near the Omnitrix, trying to think. That look on your face, Black Widow said knowingly. That's why I want to interrogate you. The doors opened then. I swallowed, and we all walked out of the elevator and into a dark room. It was hard to see anything. But as we walked up lights began to turn on, revealing the space to us. Whoa, I looked around. Hundreds of rectangular towers surrounded us, each with reels that could be seen inside through windows. Somewhat. They couldn't upgrade to a laptop? This is an inefficient use of space. You always talk this much. Black Widow asked. Dialogue is important for relationships, I said as we followed Steve towards several monitors. Plus, I'm nervous when I meet superheroes. Children, Steve said gently. We have work to do. When we got to the monitors, there was a desk in front of them. There were a couple of camera on top of the monitors. Well that's new. I said when I saw a USB port station on the desk. And I mean that literally. Natasha took something out of her pocket and plugged it into the port. More lights turned on, clearing things up further. The reels in the towers began to spin. As we stood there, the center monitor turned on over the desk, and two words appeared as the speakers in the station spoke. Initiate, system. The voice was robotic. 
Natasha moved over to the ancient keyboard and tapped away at it. Why yes, spells yes. She smirked as the computers hummed. Shall we play a game? She intoned in a deep voice. I grinned at that, and she turned to Steve. It's from a movie dash. I know, he cut her off, bemused. I saw it. Oh yeah, I said, realizing. You have a lot of pop culture to catch up on. I'm doing my best, he replied, clearly focused on the task at hand. Suddenly the center monitor lit up. Lines of green codes went down the screen, and a voice spoke. Rogers, Stephen, said a voice with a German accent. Born, 1918. What the? I said in confusion. A camera on top of the monitors turned to look at Black Widow. Romanov, Natalia Alyanovna. Born 1984. The camera turned to look at me. And then it stalled. The voice spoke again. You, I do not know. That never happens. What, are you an AI? I asked. No, I am not, Herline, the voice said. I may not be the man I was when the captain took me prisoner in 1945, but I am. A monitor to the side showed us an image. An older man, with glasses, and a rather sour look on his face. I looked around the computers, thinking to myself. Natasha asked Steve, do you know this thing? Steve didn't speak for a moment. He stepped around the monitors, going down some stairs and circling behind it. Arnim Zola was a German scientist who worked for the Red Skull. He's been dead for years. Steve said. Well, apparently he went all brain upload instead, I said, reaching for the Omnitrix and flipping through the menu. First correction, the computer, or I suppose, Armin, said. I am Swiss. Second, look around you. I have never been more alive. Yeah, well, bet it's been a while since you had a good steak or smelled flowers, I replied. True, Armin admitted. But it is better than death. When I received a terminal diagnosis in 1972, there was nothing to be done for my body. My mind, however, was saved on over 200,000 feet of data banks. You are standing in my brain. His voice was thick with satisfaction on the last words. Sorry we didn't wipe our feet, I whispered, selecting an alien, but not pressing down on the watch yet. How did you get here? Steve asked once he'd circle to stand between Natasha and I once more. Invited, Armin said. It was Operation Paperclip after World War II. S.H.I.E.L.D. recruited German scientists with strategic value. They thought I could help their cause, Armin said smugly. I also helped my own. Hydra died with the Red Skull, Cap said firmly. Cut off one head, an image appeared on the screen, and I frowned at it. A skull, with tentacles coming out from it. The symbol of Hydra. Two more shall take its place. Otherwise known as not knowing when you goddamn quit, I whispered to Steve. He ignored me. Prove it, Steve said softly to Armin. Accessing archive. The computer screens changed, showing us an image of a thin man wearing a Nazi uniform. Johann Schmidt, the Red Skull. Hydra was founded on the belief that humanity could not be trusted with its own freedom. What we did not realize, was that if you try to take that freedom, they resist. The imagery of the founders of S.H.I.E.L.D., from Peggy Carter to Howard Stark, showed on screen. Yeah, because I sit around all day wishing someone would take my ability to choose from me, I growled, touching the Omnitrix again. Natasha shushed me. The war taught us much, he continued. Humanity needed to surrender its freedom willingly. After the war, S.H.I.E.L.D. was founded and the new Hydra grew. A beautiful parasite inside S.H.I.E.L.D. I stared at the screen, dawning horror filling me as I realized the implications of what he was saying. More and more images of war, of stock prices, of Armin himself working within S.H.I.E.L.D., all as images of the Hydra symbol flashed throughout. For 70 years Hydra has been secretly feeding crisis, reaping war. And when history did not cooperate, history was changed. The image of a man with a metal arm flashed. An arm with a red star on it. Bucky Barnes. And nobody found out. I asked. Accidents will happen, more images appeared. A newspaper declaring the death of Howard and Maria Stark. Nicholas Fury, with the word deceased over his picture. Hydra created a world so chaotic that humanity is finally ready to sacrifice its freedom to gain its security. Once the purification process is complete, Hydra's new world order will arise. Steve's face tightened. His hand clenched into a fist as he looked at the monitor that was Armin's face. We won, Captain. Your death amounts to the same as your life, a zero sum. Steve lashed out, shattering the middle screen. It was quiet for a moment. Then another screen lit up. As I was saying, 
Armin's voice was so damn smug. I was going to activate the Omnitrix and start disassembling shit, but Steve spoke again. What's on this drive? He indicated the USB Natasha had plugged in. I stared at it, realizing something. Project Insight requires, Insight. So I wrote an algorithm. Armin replied. What kind of algorithm, what does it do? Natasha asked. The answer to your question is fascinating. Unfortunately, you shall be too dead to hear it. Suddenly, the doors behind us began to be blocked by a pair of blast doors. Steve threw his shield at it, but they slammed close. I took a moment to marvel at the sight of my first look at Captain America throwing his mighty shield, but apparently, the doors had refused to yield, and it bounced back into his hand. The device in Natasha's pocket beeped, and she pulled it out to look at it. Steve, we got a bogey. Short-range ballistic. 30 seconds tops. Who fired it? Steve asked, shocked. Shield, Natasha answered. I'm afraid I have been stalling, Captain, Armin said smugly. I wouldn't worry about that. I turned to look at Armin. I've got something for missiles. I activated the device on my hip. I grinned as the field enveloped me in a massive radius, and the beeping from Natasha's device stopped. Moments later, the sound of a muffled explosion came from the surface, feeling like it was coming from our right. If I'm right, that missile will have veered off. Right. Natasha blinked, looking down at the device in her hand. Then she looked at me. How? I took the device on my hip and tossed it to Captain America. I made this for my flight over here. It keeps me from getting caught by infrared, anything made for the air. And if anyone aims a heat seeker or something while I'm flying dash, it forces it to veer away. Steve looked up at me, grinning. That is impossible. We turned to look at Armin. His green face was blinking in and out at a high speed. Oh yeah, it is, I said back, grinning. Unless you got the right toy. Alien tech, baby. My alien tech. And now, we need answers from you computer man. See, I heard about Project Insight while I was hacked into S.H.I.E.L.D., and I know a bit. But if it's Hydra, we need more. I will tell you nothing. He seethed. I looked at Captain America. Hey, Steve. Is it cool if I tear this guy apart and build him into something that will give us answers? Steve looked at me. Then he looked over at the computer. Then he smiled. Skys, a German-accented computer said quietly. I pressed the Omnitrix. The change came in seconds. Once again, I was a small red gremlin, wearing a black Sabbath t-shirt and tiny blue jeans, with the Omnitrix symbol on my belt. And as I changed, the other device on my hip began to play music. Jury rig. Well, that's attractive, Natasha said, still looking a bit amazed at surviving. I have my moments. I squeaked. Then I looked around me. To my eyes, I wasn't standing in a weird computer room anymore. I was in heaven, a place where I could see how all the pieces separated, or were put together. We don't have much time, Steve said. Can you work fa dash? Disassemble. With the battle cry, I leaped at the monitor Steve had broken, smashing my way through it then digging my way into it. No. Armin Zola screamed, horrified. Get out of me you horrendous creature. No, no oh. I smashed my way out of another monitor like an alien out of a crew member's stomach and roared with glee before diving back in, ignoring the disturbed looks Natasha and Steve gave me. I grabbed at wires, every pull of them showing me transferred power and information. I ripped out chips, and the way they broke told me what to do. Every bit of destruction gave me the delicious answer to creation. In the end, while Armin's mind ran through thousands of feet of databanks, it all sent information to the computers I was tearing into. And if it did that, it meant I could pull all those archives to me. Just one more second. I yelled, my red ears quivering with glee. This is gonna be great. Please, no. Armin yelled. Captain, he is causing me pain. I cannot feel, yet he is making me. Please, he is dash. I pulled out another chip, and he petered out. Sorry? I shut off his sound now. He's writing his begging on the screens now, Natasha said from outside the computer as I dug through another section. She sounded fascinated. I'm letting him. I smashed my way out from another screen and pulled in the USB port station and the keyboard. With a blur, I pulled all the pieces together. More fun that way? Ha 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 ha. Where's that music coming from? Steve asked, coming closer. Take me through the centuries to supersonic years. The device replied, playing Black Sabbath's symptom of the universe. We're running out of time, Natasha said. We got a Quinjet coming in, we need to run. Done. 
I leaped out of the computer. As I did, Armin Zola's program shut down. The reels around us stopped spinning. I turned to look at the only screen I hadn't shattered as more words rolled onto the screen. Damn you. With that, Armin Zola died. I'd have felt more sympathy, except he was a jerk computer. If he'd been data, or EDI, or vision, I'd have been sorry. But he'd had his chance at life. Plus, it wasn't like I'd stabbed a man in the heart. Okay, I turned to look at them. So now we run, right? That has the answers. He asked, staring at the X-shaped mass of wires and glass in my hand. I nodded quickly. Yep. Reassembled, baby. Good. Steve looked at the elevator. Then we need to run, now. Can't go up the elevator, Natasha said. They'll be waiting up top, and as soon as the Quinjet gets here they'll start shooting. Then I say we dig our way out. I tapped the Omnitrix symbol on my belt. Red skin became diamond hard crystal, and I rose up to tower over Natasha, then Steve. I grinned as I stood at my full height. Diamond head. You gonna run out of those anytime soon. Steve asked me as I walked over to a nearby wall, placing the device holding Zola's memory on my waist. I haven't yet, I said with a smirk. Now, hop on. Crystals grew beneath my feet, becoming a flat platform about six feet around me. Natasha stared at it as Steve walked over to hop on to the platform. Uh, can you break down your plan? She said hesitantly, digging our way out. Still hesitant, but having no other bright ideas, she got on as well. I forced the crystals to surround us in walls until we were in a large teepee made of blue-green crystal. Then I had the crystal under us grow, pushing us up at an angle. The top of the teepee slammed point first into the ceiling, smashing through with ease. More crystal grew beneath us, pushing at a diagonal angle. I forced more and more power through my body, and we sliced through the earth with ease. This is crazy, Natasha said in awe. I hope not, I said as we shot through the dirt, the groaning sound of dirt being pushed away by us surrounding my makeshift shovel. If I am crazy, this would be a bad time to become sane. And I thought the helicarrier was the end of me being surprised, Steve muttered. Behind us and down, the sound of explosions began to sound out. I turned to look at Natasha. She nodded. Yeah, that would be the Quinjet destroying the base in an attempt to kill us. I looked at Steve. He looked sad. He leaned against a wall of the teepee, sighing. I'm sorry, he looked at me. I know that place meant a lot to you. We met eyes. After a moment, he nodded. Yeah, I haven't been there in a long time but, it was where I got started. I nodded at that. We'll make them pay, I said with a sigh. Shield isn't what you thought it was but it was made by good people. And with this, I nodded towards the junky looking device on my waist. We can save it. Is it worth saving? Steve asked. I looked over at him. He was still staring at the ground. He was staring at his shield. I tried to think of what to say. Those people, I finally got out. The ones in the pictures that you and Natasha were looking at. Who were they? Steve looked up at me, sighing. Yeah, um. Natasha sat down, looking at him. They were the founders of S.H.I.E.L.D. Friends of mine. General Chester Phillips. Howard Stark. P. Steve stopped, swallowing. Then he continued. Peggy Carter. They'd be horrified if they saw what S.H.I.E.L.D. became. Some of it was good, Natasha said weakly. She sighed. I wouldn't have joined if I didn't think so. We were suddenly in the open air. I opened the teepee by sliding the crystal apart. We'd popped up in a field, a long way away from Camp Lehigh's remains. It was night now and crickets buzzing in the field in the distance. As we got out, Natasha looked back at the massive crystal jutting out of the earth. You going to do anything about that? Nope. I sighed. I already left crystals behind. I might as well give them something insane to dig through. I like the idea of Hydra cleaning up my messes. At that moment, the Omnitrix timed out in the classic red beeping before flashing out bright red light, turning me human again. I grimaced looking down at my Omnitrix. Time's up. We need some place to rest. I'm running out of steam at this point. Plus, we need to look into the data I stole. I think I've got somewhere in mind. Steve said. He hefted his shield. What? Someone you know? Natasha asked. Iron Man. I added. Not exactly. Steve knocked on the sliding glass door in front of us. When it opened, a fit man with dark skin and well-trimmed hair opened the door. He was wearing a purple shirt and looked a bit sweaty. He looked at the three of us. I was standing next to Steve, with Natasha behind me, as always, since she could shoot me in the head faster that way. Hey man, 
The man said, How's it going? I replied. Steve put a hand on my shoulder, looking back at the man. I'm sorry about this, Steve said. We need a place to lay low. Everyone we know is trying to kill us, Natasha said. The man looked at us. After a moment, he seemed to come to a decision. Not everyone, he stepped aside to let us in. I smiled, and the three of us walked past him. I'm mum mood shaped, by the way, I said to the man once we'd gone inside. He smiled, holding a hand out to me. I took it. Sam Wilson. I tried to hold back my shock. Holy crap. The Falcon. I looked around the room. Captain America, Black Widow, and the Falcon. Today has been, just the best. I finally said, grinning like a madman. Steve and Sam gave me weird looks. Natasha narrowed her eyes at me. I just grinned back at them. Guess I'm an Avenger now? Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 15 comments. Chapter 6, Here Comes Winter Soldier. January 11th, 2014. Later, I was deleting the Cap Watch on my phone. As good as it was, a dedicated program for finding Cap wasn't useful anymore. And without my supercomputer, I couldn't turn it into something new, so, bye bye Cap Watch. Though has served me well. Sam came in with a pot of coffee. Oh thank God, I said, walking over to join him at his dinner table. I'm running at fumes at this point. Yet, yeah, you all look like you had a hell of a day, Sam noted with a look at me, then at the hallway where Cap and Natasha had gone. What exactly is going on? I shrugged, watching as Sam set out some creamer and sugar, bringing some cups to him. I'm honestly just the guy who shoved myself into the mess. I wanted to help Captain America, then they're trying to kill me. But here's what I know, and what Cap and Nat told me on the way here. I gave Sam the lowdown. Project Insight, Fury dying, S.H.I.E.L.D. attacking Cap, S.H.I.E.L.D. attacking me, the stuff we'd found out from Arnim Zola, and finally the X-shaped device I'd made from Arnim's parts. So that little thing has all the info you need. Sam asked. He was scrambling some eggs now and had some toast set aside. Yep, as far as we know, I took another sip of coffee. By the way, do you know me somehow? Sam asked. I sipped my coffee again. I mean, you seemed to recognize my name. I didn't speak for a moment, leaning back in my chair. Yeah, S.H.I.E.L.D. had a file on you. They said you were a good soldier. I didn't dig through anything, but apparently, they were planning to recruit you one day. Sam froze for a moment. He looked up. And if S.H.I.E.L.D. is Hydra Dash. Not all of it, I corrected him. Black Widow isn't. There's a whole lot of people there who are probably just trying to help people and have no idea they were even infiltrated by Hydra at all. But yeah. If S.H.I.E.L.D. knew about you, Hydra might too. That's mildly terrifying, Sam put the eggs he'd cooked onto a plate. I think the world got terrifying the moment I woke up in a New York City that had aliens and superhumans as part of the day-to-day, -day, I admitted. Compared to that, all this espionage stuff is almost normal. At least we know Hydra is a threat made by normal men. Normal, racist men. Sam, a black man, and I, an Arab man, shared a glance. Can't believe we're dealing with Nazis, Sam mumbled. Hey they came back, and Captain America came with them, we shared a grin at that. I want to kick some Hydra ass. I'm just wondering what we need to do to get it done. I mean, all I knew about Project Insight was that they had three big old heli carriers with repulsor technology installed. Sounds like you can do a lot of damage with those, Sam said. He put the eggs and toast on the table, and I thanked him as I got some. I'm gonna go get those too. He walked back to where Steve and Natasha were, and I continued to eat. The group entered shortly. Natasha gave me a look, eyeing the Omnitrix, but didn't say anything. I decided that was progress. Steve sat next to me, while Natasha took a spot nearby to lean against a wall. Sam took some toast and started buttering it, sitting down with us. So what do we do? I asked the two superheroes. Have you gone through the information that you took from Zola? Natasha asked me. I shook my head. I may have a genius on my wrist, but I'm not skilled in espionage or military tactics. I wanted to wait. I reached for my device and tapped the top of it. X device, wake up. The glass and steel creation buzzed for a moment before projecting a holographic screen facing me and Cap. Whoa, Sam looked at the hologram, ignoring the toast in his hand. How is that possible? Natasha asked, as stunned as Sam. Arnim Zola wasn't made of any tech to make holograms. Doesn't matter, 
I said. Jury Rig doesn't see technology based on what it is. When he tears things apart, it gives him insight into what is possible. He's like a guy who breaks apart a Lego house so he can see the pieces, then makes something new. I'm not going to question it, Steve said. Show us what you've got. Funnily enough, he actually didn't seem too worried. I suppose his experience with sudden new tech was more flexible after being frozen in the ice. X device, what do you got on Project Insight? I asked. One moment, sir, Natasha flinched when the device spoke. Wait, is it alive? She stepped forward, staring at the X device. No, I am not ma'am, the voice was very country, the sort you'd hear in Texas. I'd wanted a voice based on something American, seeing as we were fighting Nazis. Mom Mood made me as an interface to access my files. He's just a basic virtual intelligence, I explained. He can simulate responses and reactions, but beyond that, he's not a real person. No offense meant, X. None to be taken sir, he responded. That means you killed Zola. Steve asked me. I scoffed. No, he wasn't AI. He wasn't even a brain upload. Damn close but, true AI and brain uploads can develop. They can come up with new ideas, process emotion, learn, even do stupid things. Zola wasn't alive. He was just a recording. A tape that could spit out the responses on cue. He was stuck in time, no soul, no true intelligence. That is correct sir, X said. At most, he was a lesser version of myself. Ah, uh, I have the files. X said, displaying the files on the holographic screen in front of us. I lifted a hand up to flip through them by pressing my fingers to the screen and moving them. Let's see, Project Insight, I brought up files of various blueprints. I threw those over to Natasha, who blinked when the X device created a second screen for her. Here are the blueprints for the heli carriers. But Zola said it required an algorithm. What for? Fury said that the goal was to kill terrorists before they could strike. Steve sounded a bit disgusted. Maybe Hydra wanted to do something with that. Hmm, no, Natasha flipped through the blueprints I'd sent her, zooming in to look at the various hallways. It can't be just a plot to kill terrorists. The way Zola spoke, it was as though this was some sort of endgame. We have the algorithm, and we have the information Zola had. Um, X. Natasha said hesitantly. A southern accent replied. Yes ma'am. Is there anything in your files on what the algorithm was supposed to do? No ma'am. It was made to predict things on a massive scale using the internet, stored footage, medical records, social media, actual media, and various other sources. X replied. Zola believed that you could predict the course of a man's life by following these trends. But there is no record of what Hydra itself was going to do with it. Well, that's convenient, Natasha said with a sarcastic grumble. It makes sense though, right? Zola made the algorithm so it makes sense he would have that in his brain but I doubt Hydra put all their plans in an outdated location that wasn't even guarded. I stated before asking, so what now? Well, someone launched that domestic missile at us, Natasha closed her screen, tossing it to me. Who in S.H.I.E.L.D. can do that? Pierce, Steve leaned back in his chair, looking annoyed. Alexander Pierce, X said, head of Hydra, and one of their highest officials. He would often visit Zola for advice. Well, Right now he's in one of the most secure buildings in the world, Natasha said. Not a problem, I raised the Omnitrix. I can just smash my way in and grab him. But then, I don't know who is Hydra in the building and who isn't. X, do you have a list? One moment. I have select personal, but many of Hydra's operatives are hidden and I'm sure that Zola's information base was heavily outdated. The various leaders do not trust each other to share a full list of soldiers and Zola was technically a defunct asset beyond his algorithm. But it's a good start, Steve leaned forward. Who in Hydra worked under Pierce? Jasper Sitwell, we all looked at Natasha. He was on the Lemurian Star, where I first stole Zola's algorithm. He is on my list of subordinates. Apparently, his son is currently going to Hydra Preparatory Academy. We turned to look at X. Uh, I looked around. Hydra has an academy, for kids. Steve let out an explosive breath, running a hand down his face. Okay, focus. We need to kidnap Sitwell, find out what the algorithm is for. So the question is, how do the two most wanted people in Washington and their shape-shifting friend kidnap a S.H.I.E.L.D. officer in broad daylight? Sam got up, drawing our attention. He went into the kitchen and threw a folder on the table. Answer is, you don't. 
Steve looked down at the folder Sam had dropped. What's this? Call it a resume, Sam said confidently. I leaned over to stare at the photo. Sam was there, a little younger than he was now, wearing a tight suit. A man stood next to him wearing the same suit, both holding goggles in their hands. Natasha picked up the photo, looking at it closely. Is this Bakamala? Natasha asked. Sam nodded. The Khalid Kandile mission, that was you. She gave Steve a glance. You didn't say he was a pararescue. Steve was focused on something else as he took the photo. His eyes were on the other guy standing next to Sam. He looked up at Sam. Is this Riley? Sam nodded. Yeah. Sam and Steve seemed to pass something between each other with that look. I didn't comment on it. Natasha spoke once again. I heard they couldn't bring in the choppers because of the RPGs. What did you use? A stealth shoot. No, Sam stepped forward, picking the folder up to hand to Steve. These. Steve took the folder, opening it. I grinned at what was inside. I'd guessed, but it was still cool to see the truth. Steve seemed amused. I thought you said you were a pilot. Sam grinned. I never said pilot. Steve looked down at the folder. After a thoughtful pause, he shook his head. I can't ask you to do this, Sam. You got out for a good reason. Dude, Captain America needs my help. There's no reason to get back in, Sam said firmly. Steve and Natasha gave me a look. I held up my hands. Hey, he didn't hear it from me. When Captain America needs help, people want to help him. Steve looked between me and Sam, and he seemed overwhelmed for a moment. After a while, he nodded. Okay, where do we get these things? The last one is at Fort Meade, behind three guarded gates and a 12-inch steel wall. Steve and Natasha shared a look. She shrugged. Steve looked back at Sam. Shouldn't be a problem. He threw a folder onto the table. On it, several words were emblazoned. XO7 Falcon. I guess I'm gonna need to make another radar jammer, I said before turning to Steve. And you need to make a phone call. Wait, Steve interrupted, already guessing what I was getting at. I don't think that's necessary. They'll want in on this, I said to Steve. I mean, the stuff you're dealing with? At least let them know you're okay man. I, Steve looked at Natasha. She smirked. I have no secure way to contact them dash. My answer was to throw my smartphone to him. He caught it out of the air easily. That's my phone. It's undetectable by anything short of actual magic. You can call anyone on the planet, and not worry about people listening in. Steve stared at me, at a loss for words. I shrugged. They're your friends, right? I'd want to know my friends are safe. He's right, Natasha said. Plus, we might want to call them to help later. I don't want to drag anyone else into this, Steve protested. I'm not sure what's going on, Sam said, drawing our attention. But if the people you want to call are friends. If Riley was alive, and he didn't ask me for help with something this big, I would never forgive him. Steve looked around. After a moment, he sighed and walked to the other room. Fine. I'll make the call. A while later, I was sitting in a room with Natasha and Steve, waiting for Sam to do his part of the plan. He was looking over the city from a nearby window. Natasha, on the other hand, was asking me questions. So you say you're from Oakland? She asked pointedly. Born there, I answered. Raised in different cities in California, then spent part of my life in Oregon before I came here. Where you got the Omnitrix? Black Widow asked. Yep. Who gave it to you? No idea. She raised an eyebrow at that. None. Well, some, I admitted. But I have no idea for sure. So someone gave you, a random nobody by your own admission, alien technology programmed with the ability to turn you into beings like Diamond Head, and you have no idea why? Natasha asked skeptically. None, I looked at her. Her gaze was neutral. I sighed. Yeah, I know it's suspicious. I'm just doing the best I can with the tools I've been given. Just then, the elevator down the hall opened. Natasha gave me a look. You ready? Yep, I answered easily. The three of us went over the elevator. Inside stood Sam and another man. Older than us, with a bald head, skin a shade darker than mine, wearing glasses, slightly overweight. He also looked scared as hell and about to piss himself. He stared at us as Sam shoved him forward. I grinned. This was going to be fun. Steve threw the guy, Sitwell, through the door to the rooftop as Natasha and I followed. Sitwell fell, rolled back, and got up almost tripping over his feet as Steve followed him. I circled around, and the three of us strode towards the man. 
I stared at him, feeling my anger fill me. Hydra. This guy was one of the people who had tried to kill me. Things were feeling pretty personal about now. Steve didn't waste time. Tell me about Zola's algorithm. Sitwell took fast steps back, trying to stay calm. Never heard of it. What were you doing on the Lemurian star? I was throwing up. I get seasick. We got to the edge of the roof, and Steve grabbed Sitwell's suit, pulling him close so they were face to face. It was tense for a moment. Then Sitwell smiled. Is this little display meant to insinuate that you're gonna throw me off the roof? Because it's really not your style, Rogers. Steve eyed Sitwell. After a moment, Steve smiled back, stepping away. No, it's not. Luckily, I've got people for that. I pressed the Omnitrix. Instantly, orange fur sprouted across my form, and my eyes faded away. I got down on all fours and roared, a snarling bestial cry of rage and joy all in one. Oh my god. Sitwell squealed. I know right. Natasha stepped forward, a rush of sweet scent and beautiful sound moving along the rooftop to step past me. And that's not even your immediate problem. With a smooth move, she slammed her foot into Sitwell's chest as he freaked out at the sight of my wild mutt form. W-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
A massive impact hit the roof. Then a robot hand shattered the back window, grabbed Sitwell, and threw him screaming from the car. Holy shit. I yelled, shocked. I could see Sitwell fly 20 feet before slamming into a car, rolling to a stop only to get run over. Damn. Move. Natasha grabbed me and pulled me from my seat as a bullet slammed into the cushion. I let her move me, following her lead, and she forced me into the front seat with Steve, where we crammed ourselves in as awkwardly together as possible. How did he even get on the car? I yelled in shock. Natasha shot at the roof as the guy on it fired back. Steve reached over Natasha to slam the parking brakes on as Sam drove, and we came to an abrupt stop. A man came flying off the roof, rolled along the pavement, then got to a kneeling stance and slammed his fingers into the concrete, coming to a stop. His robotic arm glinted in the light, and I stared. Winter Soldier. He rose to his feet. His face was covered in a mask and goggles. But I knew Bucky Barnes rested beneath that mask. I reached for the Omnitrix. Natasha raised her gun. And a car slammed into us from behind. For a moment, Natasha's elbow was in my stomach as we were thrown around by the impact, and I hurriedly pushed myself into the back seat. Our car was forced forward at high speed towards the Winter Soldier. He leaped over and onto the car with another loud thump. Sam tried to put on the brakes, but we were getting pushed by the car behind us even so. Put on the gas. I yelled. Sam punched it. Behind me I could see Winter Soldier's feet as he hopped from the roof to the hood of the truck. The truck came around as Sam sped down the road, and I cursed when my body was slid from side to side all over the place. The truck slammed into the car once more, and we were sent into the guardrail. There was a horrific moment where I was airborne. I reached for the Omnitrix. Steve, Natasha, and Sam flew out of the car. I had a brief moment where Natasha and I shared a horrified glance. And then I was alone as the car flipped through the air. Author's note, next chapter is the Battle of Washington, down my way. Afterwards, a meeting with new allies, and the decision of what to do with S.H.I.E.L.D. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 7 Comments. Chapter 7, Getting a Beat Down. The car was spinning in the air, sending me up into the ceiling where I slammed my neck into the roof. The whole world had gone crazy. At some point I slapped my wrist. Still, I was bounced around and I felt pain blossomed with each slam against the car. Then I was transformed. But the car still rolled. I still smashed into things over and over again. The car still threw me around, bouncing me against everything. Finally, the car came to a stop. I lay there for a second. Then I got up to my feet with a snarl. Someone had hurt me. Someone had to pay. The car was on its back. I didn't care. I slammed my claws into the floor that was now above me, and slashed my way through steel, plastic, and foam. I dug my way out, and pushed my way to freedom. Once I was out, my gills took a deep breath. I pointed my head towards the heat of the sun on my face. I roared, declaring my rage. I was in pain, but not to the point of actual injury. Just enough to make me mad. I snapped my head to focus on my opponents. They smelled like gunpowder, plastic, and leather. There was a hint of more gunpowder in the air, and the metal of weapons. One of them was the Winter Soldier. His men stared at me in fear. The Winter Soldier aimed his weapon at me. I leaped away as a metal object propelled itself from his weapon to me, exploding on Sam's car and destroying it for good. Soldiers began to fire at me. I ran at high speed, my enhanced senses showing me where they were, the sound of bullet fire only aiding me in what I was doing. Guns are loud, but when I was prepared for them, I could use them to help me find my targets. Winter Soldier shot at me again. I ducked low on the pavement, letting the grenade fly overhead, and rushed towards the soldiers. I roared, my claws dug into the concrete, and I leaped towards one. As the second car pulled up to spill more soldiers, I landed on the one I'd targeted and slashed at his chest, slicing deep. He tried to raise his gun, screaming in horror, and I took the assault rifle into my mouth. My teeth sliced into the metal with ease. The others tried to aim at me, the smell of fear in the air, and I leaped towards another soldier, slashing at his leg to leave enormous gashes in him. When they started shooting again, I was up in the air, leaping over a sedan. I ran around it, then leaped to grab a guy by the leg, pulling him to throw him at a nearby car. The soldiers tried to get a bead on me, but I ran back around, dodging the gunfire in great leaping bounds, using cars as cover. When I was close enough, I jumped over the hood of the Humvee to grab the back of a soldier's jacket. 
Shit. Was all the soldier could yell as I pulled him over the hood. I growled, grabbing his gun and tossing it to Sam, who'd snuck around the guardrails. He let out a surprised shout when an assault rifle fell out of the sky to land in front of him, but I ignored that to bash the soldier I had on the ground in the face, breaking his jaw and knocking him out. Just then, another Humvee rolled up. Smelling the gunpowder inside, I leaped over to it, slamming into the roof of the second car. The men inside were about to get out, so I responded by ripping the roof off to join them inside. In the enclosed space, they couldn't escape. I was a deadly monster in an Humvee full of men. I only had to do what came best. I started slamming my feet against people, my tail wildly swinging through the air, and my teeth dug past body armor to fill my mouth with hot blood. I tried my best not kill anyone, I still wasn't ready for an act so heinous, but Wild Mutt's primal nature left me happy to maim, which left my victims panicking. God help. It's got my arm. Shoot it. Somebody fucking shoot this thing. The eight men in the car tried to fight back, but it's hard to aim a gun at something that big in such a small space when it is slicing your arms open. Just then an arm reached into the rooftop and grabbed me by the neck. For a moment, I thought it was the Winter Soldier when I felt the metal fingers lift me up out of the Humvee and toss me out to the pavement. But as I got up with a snarl, I realized it was someone else entirely. Someone I recognized. He stood as bald as every, his black skin shining in the sunlight. Skin the same color as the car I'd just been in. Creel. I roared, rushing him. Creel stepped forward, and I leaped onto the man, sending him back into the car, which crumpled under his weight. I bit down at his throat, and he got his left forearm in the way. I gnawed on that instead, my claws ripping at his shirt and digging gouges into his skin. He swore, then punched me in the ribs with his right arm. I bit down harder. He punched me again, and this time I was forced to back off. I leaped off him, growling, and circled around for a moment. Then I saw more soldiers come around to aim guns at me. I hurriedly reached for the Omnitrix. In a flash of light, I became bipedal again. My claws shifted to become a single one on the back of my fist. My orange fur became striped with black, and a white patch grew on my belly. The Omnitrix went from my shoulder to my chest. I roared, the sound erupting in a wave. Oh yeah baby. I flexed, my muscles bursting with power. The wrath is back. The soldiers fired at me, but I didn't feel a thing as bullets bounced off my skin. Hey you. I pointed at Creel, who was stepping forward. Let me tell you something, Creel. Wrath doesn't dash. Creel punched me in the face. I stepped back, shaking my head. Wrath doesn't dash he punched me in the gut, and I snarled. Wrath doesn't dash Creel leaped up and slammed his fist into my chin. It didn't hurt too much, but it was enough to send me onto my back, physics working against me. I snarled shaking my head. Creel stepped forward, and I leaped to my feet, roaring. The burst of noise sent Creel back. Wrath doesn't like being interrupted while Wrath is insulting people. It's what Wrath does, and now Wrath is gonna interrupt your face with Wrath's fist, and make you like it. Creel tried to attack again but this time I was ready. I leaped forward, slipped under his right cross to circle around to his back. My arms wrapped around his waist, and I pulled him close, his metal back to my chest. I flexed, lifting him off the ground. Ah, shit. Creel yelled. He tried to struggle, and I grinned. Too late. I grinned toothily. Final. I lifted him up, leaning back into a classic German suplex. I slammed him into the concrete head first. Then I leaped up, still holding him, and brought us back to standing. Atomic. One more suplex. I brought us back to standing spun him around so he was upside down in my arms, then leaped 20 feet into the air. Spinning towards the ground as soldiers stared in awe, I slammed Creel headfirst into the pavement. Buster. A crater was slammed into the bridge. I sat for a moment with Creel embedded in the bridge at the center of the crater. Ha. Huh. I rose up lodging. Why do you even try? You're always going to ice skate uphill? Then Wrath will make the hill a not hill, so your trying is meaningless. While I love the trash talk, that doesn't make any sense. I looked up to see Sam. He was holding one of the assault rifles that belonged to the soldiers, and wore his jetpack in its folded form, giving me a look of surprise. He shook his head. Hey, I'm gonna help Cap. You got this. Wrath has everything. I turned to look at Creel. He was rising from the crater. Go, flies around like a falcon but doesn't he have feathers. Got it, Sam said after a confused glance. Creel rose to his feet, 
shaking his head before glaring at me. I should have figured I couldn't beat you like this, he said, stepping forward. You're dumb if you didn't. I stepped forward as well, glaring. I'm the Wrath. Wrath can't be beaten. Not now, not ever. Bring on your best, Mr. Absorb Stefan works for Stupid Hydra. Creel smiled. You know, you remind me of my boxing days. The guys who were all talk until I finally beat some sense into them. His skin went from black steel to flesh. I'm going to do the same to you. Creel reached into a pocket. If I'd been thinking straight, I'd have stopped them. But as Wrath, with my lowered IQ, I just stared at him. He took out what looked like a piece of rock, barely a pebble. It glowed slightly with a blue light. He raised it for me to see. Vibranium, like in your friend's shield, my eyes widened in horror. I sped forward, and Creel clenched his fist around it. I lashed out with my claw, trying to beat him to the punch. My claw slammed into his face, and uselessly bounced off his blue chin. Damn it. I roared. I lashed out again and again, slashing at him. Creel let me fruitlessly hit him for a bit. Break? Break you moron? Let me tell you something, Creel of Hydra? When Wrath hits something, it breaks. Creel caught my fist. He squeezed. And I screamed. For the first time, I felt unbearable pain as Wrath. I tried to pull back, but he was unmovable. That's the thing, Creel smiled, his blue face shifting. I'm unbreakable. He pulled back and punched. I staggered back, falling to my knees. He kicked me in the chest, and I went flying, slamming into a car. The force of my impact made it slide back, then over the edge and off the bridge, smashing the guard rail and sending concrete through the air. The car landed on the street below with me smashing into it a second later. It turned into scrap on the pavement. I rested there for a moment, groggy. Then Creel landed on my stomach. He wasn't that heavy, so it didn't hurt much. His right hook did. From his spot on my body, Creel grabbed my neck and started punching me in the face. Over and over, his vibranium fist hit me in the chin, cheek, and nose. Soon, blood started to pour from my lips and nostrils. I was scared. But I was also wrath. I didn't want to die. But I was also not about to let Creel hit me without making him pay for it. Wrath. I wasn't willing to let him kill me without leaving a mark. Ryak. With a roar, I grabbed Creel by the shoulders. In his vibranium form, he was lighter than his steel form, so I could lift him and toss him over me. He was sent flying, and I quickly rolled to my feet. I fell to my right knee, staggering. Creel landed on his back nearby, rolling to his feet as well. Thinking quickly, I grabbed the car I'd been embedded in and threw it at Creel. It smashed into him with fruitless results, exploding and sending shrapnel everywhere. Creel walked right through it, smiling. Nothing you can do to hurt me, Creel said. Wrath is willing to try, I spat blood out, rising up. Wrath is willing to break vibranium. Then the Omnitrix began to beep, before flashing a red light. In an instant, I was human again. Unhurt. But human. Oh, I said softly. I met eyes with Creel. He smiled. Oh shit. Creel ran towards me. Then bullets started hitting him from the right at a high speed. We looked over there, and saw Sam. He was holding a minigun, where did he get that? Pouring bullets into Creel. Run. Sam yelled. I sped towards him, Creel following at a walking pace, acting as though the bullets slamming into his face and chest were simple raindrops. Sam backed away, and I came up next to him. Any chance you can turn into something that can beat this dude? Sam yelled over the minigun roaring in his hands. Not for a while. I yelled back. The two of us walked backwards as Creel moved towards us. Well that's just great. Sam cried out sarcastically. Creel was about 10 feet away when Sam tossed the minigun away. Come on. Sam grabbed my arm and leaped up. His wings unfurled, and the rockets activated, launching us into the sky. Creel reached out for me as Sam lifted me into the air, barely scraping his fingers against my shoes. She it. I cried out as Sam flew us over the battlefield, aiming towards where Steve was battling the Winter Soldier. He dropped me near some cars, and I rolled as I hit the floor trying to mimic what I'd seen from parkour videos. I landed in between a Honda Civic and a Prius, slamming into the Prius with my shoulder as I stumbled. As expected it hurt a lot, but it was a lot better than what Creel would have done. Thanks, Sam. I yelled out hurriedly, running as soon as I found my feet. I tried to circle where Cap and the Winter Soldier were battling. I found myself staring slightly as two superhumans duked it out in the middle of the street.
Winter Soldier was stabbing with a knife, trying to slice into Steve, while Steve used martial arts to keep him at bay. They moved with intense speed, mere blurs of motion. After a brief moment, Steve kicked the Winter Soldier in the chest, sending him flying into a car. I jumped when someone landed behind me, only to sigh in relief when I saw it was Sam with Natasha. She was bleeding from her left shoulder, which she held tightly with a grimace. You okay? I asked her. Later, she said back quickly. Where's the guy you were fighting? Right there. Sam pointed at Creel. He was running towards us, pushing aside a bus and sending it flying. The three of us scattered, my heart pumping hard in my chest, and Creel followed me. Damn it, Wrath, why do you have to annoy people so much? I yelled. I ran past Steve and Winter Soldier, who both ignored me, heading for the only thing that could save me. I grabbed it, wrenching it out of the back of Van, and quickly spun to lift it in front of me. Creel's fist slammed into Captain America's shield. And nothing happened. Vibranium hit Vibranium Alloy, and left me safe. I didn't know why Steve's shield was in the back of the van. But it saved my life. Next to where Creel and me stood, Captain America was thrown over the hood of a truck, landing about eight feet to my right. Thinking fast, I dropped low as Creel threw another punch, ducking that and rolling. Steve. I threw the shield to him. Steve got up and caught the shield, hurriedly putting it on as he and Winter Soldier squared up. For a brief moment, we all faced each other. Captain America, Winter Soldier, Creel, and me. Then the Omnitrix beeped out with a green light. I reached for it. Creel rushed me, Winter Soldier rushed Steve. I twisted the dial on the Omnitrix, found an alien, and hit the face as Creel punched me. His blue glowing fist hit my chest, then pierced through me. Skin split around his knuckles. The muscle, bones, organs, until he made the same journey out the other side. His fist went straight through my heart and spine, turning them into goo. Or at least, it would have, if all those things hadn't been changing into goo anyways. Goop. I announced in a robotic voice echoing from the device floating over my head. I now stood as tall as Creel. My body stood in a bipedal form, made of a green gelatinous form. The Omnitrix symbol rested on the anti-gravity projector floating over me, the device erecting a gravitational force over me to allow me to stand. If I'd had a mouth, I'd have smiled. Let's do this. I shouted through the anti-gravity projector. Creel stared at me, shocked. What are you supposed to be, green shit? Rude. I replied, offended. I threw some goo into his eyes. Creel staggered back, removing his fist and wiping at his eyes. Ugh, okay, I'm going to turn you into a stain on the sidewalk. Creel tried to punch me again. All he got for his efforts was goo on his fist. I grabbed him in my gelatinous hands and tossed him back. My form shapeshifted, becoming nothing but liquid, and the device over me gripped me in its gravitational hold, flying me over to Creel. Being goop was so weird. I was technically two beings in this form, the shapeless goo, and the flying saucer letting that goo shapeshift. I had no bones, no organs or muscles, so I had to move through the saucer. My chemistry was up to me, so I could change from harmless to acidic. It should have been confusing, but it was oddly natural. As though my human form was the one that was weird, that I had always been able to change shape and acidity. As I did now, I surrounded Creel in a bubble of me, and changed into the strongest acid I knew how. Creel punched at me as I covered his body. It did nothing. Vibranium or not, you can't punch goop to death. I watched through the saucer as Creel's clothes were dissolved. But that was it. Damn it. Apparently vibranium can't be melted. Still, I had other options. Before I could enact those, I saw Cap get kicked by Winter Soldier. The Winter Soldier stepped forward and grabbed Steve's throat. He raised his knife. No. My saucer form flew at the Winter Soldier. I slashed into the back of his hand, blood flying into the air and forcing him to drop the knife. With Creel, my goo fell to the floor, allowing him freedom. Creel, not missing a beat, ran towards Cap. I guess he thought he'd thrown enough punches. I flew back to my goo and rose up behind Creel. You want a piece of me, I said, spinning to throw a portion of myself at Creel's left foot as it hit the floor. Green goo slammed into his foot. Creel kept running forward. The goo stretched. Then it snapped back into position, forcing Creel to stay. Goop can become acidic. But he can also become an adhesive, as sticky and stretchy as you want. What the hell? Creel said. In front of him, Captain America and Winter Soldier moved off, Cap knocking off Winter Soldier's mask with a left uppercut. 
Here, have all the pieces you want. I shouted. I spun around, becoming a floating green swirl, and rapidly fired off portions of myself. They hit Creel in the back and shoulders. He struggled, but this wasn't a heavy weight, it wasn't a kinetic force for his vibranium form to absorb. This was glue, surrounding him in adhesive and gummy stuff. In seconds, he was covered in the stuff from neck to toe in a massive pile of sticky glue. He slowly struggled through it, but it would take him a while to get out. Once I was done, I walked around to look at him. Creel glared at me. I'm still not down, Creel said. I'll get out of this eventually. Oh don't worry, I reached for the Omnitrix floating with my anti-gravity projector, about to turn into Blitzwolfer to hit him with a sonic blast. I've got something dash. An explosion filled the air. I turned to see a car in front of Steve finish turning into scrap metal. When I looked around the battlefield, I saw Steve, Sam, and Natasha all standing in different spots. Natasha was next to a silver truck, while Sam was by a blue taxi. Steve stood closest to me, and he was staring at the destroyed car with shock on his face. I wondered why for a moment. Then I remembered. Steve had uppercut the Winter Soldier's mask off. Bucky's mask. He'd seen his friend's face on a killer. Steve, I started to say. Then the police sirens began to ring out. A bunch of black SUVs rolled up, spilling out men in black military uniforms. I turned into liquid and flew forwards, throwing pieces of myself at one of the vans and surrounding the soldiers coming out in more adhesive, attaching them to their SUVs. I was going to do it again, my form shifting to aim at guys surrounding Steve. Freeze or I'll kill him. I stopped, shape-shifting my body to look towards the person yelling at me. For a moment, I wondered why the KG Beast from Batman vs Superman was standing there. Then I saw what he was doing. He and five other men had Sam at gunpoint. Sam was looking at me sadly, his hands up. Fake KG Beast glared at me. Change back. My eyes moved quickly around my body as I stood there. Nearby, Natasha was captured as well, forced to her knees with no regard for her injuries. Steve was on his knees, staring at me. Sam still had his hands up, clenching and unclenching them. Creel was still in the goo I'd surrounded him in, looking at me. Fake KG Beast stepped closer to Sam. I said, change back, now. For the first time, I felt dissatisfaction with my Omnitrix menu. If I had Lodestar, I'd have been able to rip the guns out of these guys' hands. Instead, I reached up for the anti-gravity projector, and tapped the Omnitrix. In an instant, I was human again. Fake KG Beast turned his gun from Sam to me. He stepped towards me, eyes hard. On your knees. I glared at him defiantly. In a blur of motion, he slammed the butt of his gun into my chin. I crumbled to the ground. As stars filled my eyes, I spat blood from my mouth and glared up at the guy. He smirked. Then he lifted his boot high. No. Steve shouted as the boot came down. Don dash. A burst of pain followed. Then I was out. Author's note, the above was really fun to write. Wild Mutt finally fighting, Wrath smashing Creel with Zanjeev's move, Creel revealing he was given something to level the playing field against Dial, Dial having his first horrific timeout in this FIC, Sam firing a minigun at Creel, Dial using the shield before tossing it cap, Creel and Goop fighting. It was fun. By the way, Vibranium Creel didn't show everything he could do in that form. He had what amounted to about $10,000 worth of vibranium in his palm and he had no idea the power he really carried. Wrath is strong, but when Creel was made of a substance that negates all kinetic force, all his hits stopped having effect. That said, Wrath can win, if he's smart about it. Goop's plan worked well. So yeah, I had fun, and I hope you guys did too. Going to bed. Let me know what you think, or if you have questions. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 14 Comments. Chapter 8, Getting Avengers to Help. I woke up later in a van. I looked around groggily. Hey, Natasha said to my right. I looked over at her. She smiled shakily at me. Good to see you're awake. 4. My jaw hurt like hell. I tried to lift my hands, but they felt really heavy for some reason. Natasha shook her head. Don't move. Rollins gave you a hell of a hit. 1. Is that who that was? I slurred. I looked across from us. Sam and Steve sat on the right side of the van. Sam was looking at Steve, who was staring at the floor. There were also two helmeted guards with hands on their weapons, one female, the other male, both clearly Hydra. 
through my throbbing headache, as the van bounced around, I tried to remember what happened. Steve looked up at me. Did Axe have anything about Bucky being the Winter Soldier? Steve asked softly. Everyone, even one of the guards, looked at me. My headache intensified, but I thought of a response. We never thought to check, I answered. For a moment, I felt relief I'd hidden X in Sam's garage. Nobody but an Omnitrix user could unlock him, but better safe than sorry. The Winter Soldier. I asked slowly. I already knew, but I felt Steve wanted to talk. We might all be dead soon anyway. I held back my fear at the thought. Steve looked down at the floor again. Yeah, and he didn't even know who I was. How's he even alive? Natasha asked. Was he frozen, like you? Zola, Steve said, still looking down. Bucky's whole unit was captured in 43, Zola experimented on him. Whatever he did must have helped Bucky survive the fall. They must have found him and... You couldn't have known, I said softly. You would have done everything you could. He's right, Sam added. Steve was quiet for a moment. When he spoke again, it was almost in a whisper. Even when I had nothing, I had Bucky. We were quiet. Then Sam looked at Natasha. He turned to the guards. We need to get a doctor here. My head still throbbing, I looked over at Natasha. Her shoulder was bleeding profusely. I wanted to reach over, only to feel my hands held down by weight. I looked down and blinked. They'd surrounded my hands in a steel casing, leaving them crossed. Steve had similar bonds on his hands. It must have been at least 30 pounds of metal, covering my hands in cold metal from mid-forearm to wrist. Shit. That meant the Omnitrix was out. I could feel the watch pressing painfully into my wrist, squeezed by the cuffs. Steve and I were also locked at the legs, leaving Natasha and Sam in regular cuffs. Still, if I forced Hydra to try to kill me first, maybe we could get the jump on them. Just insult the shit out of them, make sure they try, then. 1. Sam was still speaking. He's got a concussion and she's bleeding out, we need dash. One of the guards pulled out a baton in a lightning fast movement, the end lighting up with electricity. There was a tense moment. Then she spun it around and jammed it into the chest of the other guard. While we stared in shock and the other guard shuddered in his seat, she lashed out in a kick, sending the guy bouncing off the window, then to the floor. As soon as he was out, she reached up and pulled off her helmet, revealing, Robin, from how I met your mother. 10. Kobe Smulder's face breathed deeply. Whew, that thing was squeezing my brain. Sam and I glanced at each other, then at her. She looked back at us, then at Steve and Natasha. Who are these guys? Robin, as it turned out, was really Maria Hill. An oddly friendly version of Maria Hill, who I remembered as kind of a bitch in the comics. She used a cool laser device to slice off all our cuffs in seconds. She waited until the car stopped, then sliced out the bottom of the car with the laser. The strike team had placed our van in the middle, which meant Steve had to be careful to reach down and pull a manhole cover from the ground without anyone seeing. He was smooth, lifting it out of its place and sliding it aside. We dropped down into the sewers from the van with Steve's shield and Sam's wings as carefully as possible so the driver of the van wouldn't notice any jostling in the back. I went goop again so I could simply float down into the hole. Once we were safe, Maria sliced off my bonds. I turned into goop again and covered Natasha's wound with adhesive goo to stop her bleeding. That done, we started walking through the sewers. We came out after about 30 minutes of walking, then got into a gray van. Maria drove, leaving the city and heading through a forest until we reached a dam. There, we got out. I turned into fast track for his better than human strength and picked up Natasha. One. What are you doing? She asked, glaring at me. Carrying you, I answered, hefting her up and following Maria. I'm not an invalid, Natasha growled. You're wounded, you need help, you get help, I replied back. Put me down, she grumbled. Despite her protests, she didn't fight me, a testament to how much blood she'd lost. I carried her carefully. The five of us entered the dam and started walking through the halls. The place was wet, as expected with green moss on the walls, and everything colored brown and illuminated with fluorescent lights. As we walked, a guy in a suit, wearing glasses, with thinning gray hair came towards us, running. Maria apparently knew him, because she yelled out as he came closer. GSW, Maria said, the acronym for gunshot wound. She's lost a lot. Six. Maybe a pint, Sam added. But Mahmoud sealed the wound. Let me take her. The man, 
A doctor apparently, said as I walked up carrying her. He gave me a startled look when he saw my fast track form, but focused on Natasha again, who was still giving me a petulant look. She'll want to see him first, Maria replied. We shared a confused look that Maria ignored. Going into a large room with pillars and machinery strewn about, we went down some stairs. There was a section of the room blocked off by plastic hanging on hooks set up like makeshift walls. Maria pulled back the plastic, and stepped aside to let us look inside. Samuel bad motherfucker Jackson stared at us for a moment before speaking. What the hell is that carrying you, Natasha? 6. A stubborn idiot, was all she could reply. I think she was too shocked to say anything else. I turned back into goop to remove the makeshift bandage I'd made for Natasha. It hadn't completely stopped the bleeding, but it had helped, and the doctor operated on her as we listened to Nick Fury, who was Samuel L. Jackson, not a very white guy from the comics. He still had an eye missing though, and a badass eye patch. I wondered, once more, if I was in a version of the Ultimate Universe, and gave Natasha a glance as the doctor checked her shoulder. 11. Black Widow had been evil in the comics, working with terrorists. But I'd checked with X in private. Not only was Black Widow not in S.H.I.E.L.D., she'd been specifically tagged as being a very bad idea to try and recruit. I could trust her, as much as I could trust a spy. In the meantime, Fury. No way was I calling him Nick, ran down the laundry list of his wounds. 1. Lacerated spinal column, cracked sternum, shattered collarbone, perforated liver, one hell of a headache. Holy. Don't forget your collapsed lung, the doctor added helpfully. Oh, let's not forget that, Fury said sarcastically. Otherwise, I'm good. What, you're down for a pickup basketball game now? I asked, still shocked by the sheer number of injuries. How about Sam and me vs you and Steve? We'll be skins, Fury replied easily, smirking. They cut you open, Natasha said, sounding accusing. Your heart stopped. Tetrodotoxin B, Fury told her. Slows the pulse to one beat a minute. Banner developed it for stress. Didn't work so great for him, but we found a use for it. Fury mentioning Banner reminded me of something. Why all the secrecy? Steve asked. Why not tell us? Maria answered for fury. Any attempt on the director's life had to look successful. Can't kill you if you're already dead, Fury said matter of factually. Besides, I wasn't sure who to trust. He looked at me. So did everyone else except Sam. I sighed. Seriously, I'm not Hydra. Also, you didn't think you could trust Captain America, really? Or Tony Stark? First, you may not be Hydra, but you are still suspicious, Fury said simply. Second, I am trusting Captain America, you see him standing here don't you? As for Tony Stark, he'd go telling the presses about anything, if he didn't follow your lead and destroy a Best Buy first. 1. That wasn't on purpose, I growled out. And I'm telling the truth? I'm not the enemy. How can you prove that? Fury asked simply. I gaped at him. You appear in New York with no paperwork, in this or any nation. You have a watch that can turn you into things that can fight any of the Avengers on even ground or better, and admit it's alien, meaning you must have gotten it from off-world. Natasha, has he told you where you got it from? No, Natasha said. Oh. Fury cocked an eyebrow. So you have all that power, appeared out of nowhere, and claim we should just, trust you. Explain why. 1. I growled, stepping forward to explain myself. Because I do, a voice stopped me. I looked over at Steve. He was smiling at me. I trust him, he looked back at Fury. I've seen what Mahmood can do. He's got a lot of power. If he wanted to, if he was working for an enemy, he could have killed us at any point. But he's put that power to use to help us. He could have died at the bridge if it wasn't for Sam, but he stayed and fought when it would have been better for him to hide. I trust him. There was no chance for me to respond when Sam stepped forward as well, patting me on the back. For a moment, I felt myself choke up. I swallowed down the tears like a man, only to have to wipe away some. Geez, why was I breaking down? All Captain America had said was that he trusted me. Ah, uh, thanks man. 5. Heartwarming, however, we will talk about this later, Fury said simply. So you trust him? What now? We um, I wiped away my last tear. We need to call Tony, Rhodes, and Clint. They're all on standby. You want to bring more people into this? Fury asked. We need numbers, Steve said. I thought about leaving them out, but they all said it was their fight, 
and they can give us a hell of a lot of power. Fury nodded. After a moment, he looked around. Go ahead and call them. We've got 16 hours to plan our attack. And someone get me a chair. Clint, funnily enough, arrived first. I was with Steve and Sam at the door to the dam when he rolled up. Maria had recovered devices I'd been using to hide from radar and satellites on, keeping us from being seen by Hydra, so it was safe for him to join us. She had also recovered X from where I had hidden it at Sam's house once I explained to Fury just what it was and he all but ordered to her to get it. Clint was riding a red motorcycle, and was wearing a purple jacket and blue jeans. He came up to us, parked the motorcycle, then got off and removed his helmet. Like Sam, he didn't look like an actor I recognized. He had blonde hair groomed to go into a point, a 5-0 clock shadow beard, and eyes that seemed to pierce through you. He was shorter than all three of us, but he came towards us with the same sort of subtle walk that Natasha did. 1. Good to see you, Clint, Steve said, smiling. He stepped forward with his hand out. You too, Steve, Clint smiled back, taking Steve's hand and shaking it. He looked over at me and Sam. Gonna introduce me. Ah, uh, yeah, Steve said. He pointed at Sam. This is Sam Wilson, he pointed at me. And Mahmoud shaked. They're friends of mine. 2. Clint shook hands with Sam, then turned to me. As he shook my hand, he cocked his head. You aren't military. Was it weird that it didn't surprise me he could tell that? No sir, I'm not. Clint nodded. So you're an enhanced. I smiled at him, but didn't answer. He shrugged, apparently not caring much, and turned to Steve. Tony and Bruce here yet. Steve winced. Well, Tony is still grabbing a suit. And Bruce, you know Bruce. He doesn't want anything to do with it, huh? Clint said with a sad smile. Yeah, he could have been really useful, I said softly to Sam. Or destroyed everything in his path, he replied. When Clint and Steve looked at him, he held up his hands defensively. I'm just saying, the Hulk is pretty good at breaking things. Steve didn't seem to have a defense for that. He turned back to Clint. Come on, I'll show you inside. One second. Hawkeye went to his motorcycle and pulled a bag off of it. He came back. All right. With that, the four of us went inside. Tony Stark arrived later on. I was speaking to Clint at the time, watching as he geared up in the armory hidden in the dam. There were shelves of guns, and boxes of bullets all throughout the room. Clint had taken a station at a table in back to do his work. He was wearing a long coat edged with purple, with a safety glove and forearm protector all modern archers wore. It was kinda cool looking. He was checking over his arrows, putting them away one by one in a quiver on his back. Ten aliens, huh? He asked, looking over at me. I was sitting on the table, sipping at my coffee. Yeah, they tend to be damn useful too, I answered. Huh, he looked at the Omnitrix. Think I could try. What? My eyes went from the Omnitrix then to Hawkeye. He smiled easily. My surprise at the request must have been obvious. You can say no, Clint said. I'm just curious. I mean, I stared at the watch again. 2. Hey, Clint brought my attention back to him. Cap doesn't share his shield. I don't let people use my bow. Nat has her favorite gun, and Tony has only let one other person have one of his suits. He finished sharpening one of his broadheads. At least I know you can take off that watch. Only when I want to, I said. 4. Clint nodded. Sam walked over then. He was wearing a flight suit similar to the one he'd worn in the photo he'd shown us. Where'd you get that? I asked as he walked past a rack of submachine guns. Sam stopped to grab a pair of submachine guns before joining Clint and I. Turns out, they've got a room full of uniforms and suits. You should grab something for yourself. I though about that, looking down at myself. I'd been wearing the same blue jeans and white shirt with a black stripe ever since I'd left New York. Technically I didn't need to change. The Omnitrix was all the costume I needed. But that thought was stupid. If the Omnitrix timed out mid-battle again, I might not have Sam to save me, and the right suit could at least prevent injury. I will, I said at last. In the meantime, I got off the table and looked around. Can you guys help me pick out a knife and gun? Something good for a novice like me to use for when the Omnitrix times out. The flying soldier and archer assassin, both career military, looked around for a moment. Sam walked over to the aisle with handguns and picked up one of them. He came back with one of them, the kind I sometimes saw cops carrying when I did my patrols. Here. Glock 19. 
Sam held it for me to see. Compact size, 15 rounds in the magazine. If you end up in a tight spot, 15 bullets could save you. You ever held a gun before, do you know the safety rules? Don't point the hole at anything you like, I said, looking at the gun in his hands. I've gone shooting with my brothers. Never anything real though, Sam nodded. Well, keep in mind, guns are made to kill. Don't let movies fool you. There's no such thing as a winging people or shooting them in the foot to let them go. You shoot, you do it to kill. Understand. When I nodded, he took a holster and belt off another shelf, and passed it all to me. Clint tapped me on the shoulder when I took the gun in hand. I turned to see him holding a knife in a sheath. He smirked as I took what looked a military knife. One. That, is a knife, Clint said dramatically. It cuts things. Use it to cut things. Ten. I gave Clint a sour look. Wow, you've truly changed my life with that explanation. Yeah well, no time to actually teach you anything, Clint said briskly, but not unkindly. Come on, Sam, the traitor, was chuckling as he led me out of the armory. Let's get you suited up. We walked out, me holding my new loot, Sam putting away his guns. Steve and Natasha were coming down to the floor as we walked by. Behind them were two men. One I recognized as Tony Stark. He looked much the same as the photos I'd seen of him, a taller and buffer Robert Downey Jr. He had a well-trimmed mustache and beard combo, and his hair was set up in spikes. Unlike in the news, he wasn't wearing a suit. He wore a, a Black Sabbath tour of 78 shirt? One. I stopped, staring at him. I looked at Natasha, who had noticed me staring at his shirt. She nodded, and I gaped for a moment. Jury Rig wore the same casual clothes as Tony Stark? What the hell? The man behind him was different in a lot of ways. He wore a tight green shirt, camo pants, and military boots. He was well-built, had dark skin and a clean-shaven face. He also had Don Cheadle's face. Seriously, I was starting to get used to movie stars sharing faces with superheroes. And it was painting a weird picture about this Marvelverse that I should look into later. 2. Sam, Mahmood. Steve called as he stepped onto the floor. He waved us over, and we went to join him. Guys, this is Tony Stark, and Colonel James Rhodes, Steve said as we joined the four. Iron Man and War Machine. Introductions, really? Tony asked, giving Steve a look. What is this, preschool? I looked between Tony and Rhodey for a moment. Like everyone, I have my favorite superheroes. I don't tend to hate any of course, but some are just the ones I prefer. Wonder Woman was my favorite DC superhero. To me, she represented a lot of who I'd like to be. Honest, good, kind, a dedicated warrior, and a teacher. She was someone I looked up to. 10. Iron Man, not two feet away, was my favorite Marvel superhero. A man who used his brilliance and human technology to take on magicians, gods, aliens, and reality warpers. A man who represented how far humanity could go on our intellect alone. A jerk, a womanizer, and a, recovering, alcoholic, sure. But he was a good man in the comics. Barring Civil War, where everyone had acted like out-of-character asshats. 1. You're my favorite Avenger. Tony stopped talking, looking at me for some reason. So did Steve, Natasha, and Rhodey. In fact, even Sam did, looking at me with an amused look on his face. It was at that moment that I realized I'd spoken out loud. Huh. Didn't know that could happen in real life. Huh. Tony suddenly had a massive grin on his face. He turned to look at Steve. Hear that? Fanboy has good taste. 2. Steve sighed. I mean, the stars and stripes are nice, Tony continued. But until you get a sweet suit like mine actually, Rhodey, do you still have that monstrosity laying around? 1. You see what you did. Rhodey said to me. You got him started. Also, he looked at Tony. It wasn't a monstrosity, it was patriotic. Natasha laughed. When Rhodey gave her a sour look, she shrugged. Anyways, Steve said pointedly. This is Sam Wilson and Mahmoud shaked. Rhodey stepped forward and shook Sam's hand, then mine. He had a strong grip, and a big smile. Good to meet you, despite the circumstances I mean. Yeah, shield going evil, Tony said. He looked at Steve. I warned you, Cap. No way shield was on the up and up. Granted, I never expected them to be Nazis, but. We aren't contacting the government about this. Rhodey asked. No. I said. I walked over to a table, where X was resting, Steve joining me, followed by the others. X, 
Can you tell me, numerically, how many members of the military and government are Hydra? At least 15, some confirmed by Zola, others only his estimations. X said, Zola theorized there were more in lower positions, based on various reports, but it is unconfirmed. Huh, Tony stepped towards X, circling him. He looked up at me. You made this. One of my aliens did, I answered. Tony looked back at X, leaning in to look at the X-shaped device. He frowned, staring at it. What the hell are these compotents made out of? Parts from a computer made back in the 70s Natasha said. When Tony and Rhodey gave her stunned looks, she smiled. Really? What? That's impossible. How dash Tony stopped, staring at the device, then lifting it up to look it over. No, if you get. Wait how did he? Okay, I see the memory now, he just used. No that's not how it works, oh, no, that could do it. 4. Tony. Rhodey asked as he watched his friend spin the X device in his hands. Hold on, trying to figure out how this thing is breaking the laws of physics, Tony put it on the table, seeming excited. He gave me a look. Yeah, me and you are going to have a long conversation after this, fanboy. 5. I rolled my eyes, though I was still kinda jazzed to see Tony Stark talking science. Then I got back to business. Actually, you may find this interesting. X, can you show me the file on Senator Stern? Of course, X said, his southern accent giving the words a twang. Senator Stern, a holographic screen popped up, with an image of Stern next to his profile. Tony raised an eyebrow. A high-level Hydra agent, he has been credited with obtaining several high-level acquisitions for Hydra, only to fail in procuring the Iron Man project. His further attempts with the war machine also failed, though some blueprints were created based on footage of Colonel James Rhodey Rhodes. What? Rhodey stepped forward, uncrossing his arms. Hydra has armor because of me. Incorrect, X said. Only copies, made from far less efficient designs. I reckon they used War Machine and Iron Man as inspiration, nothing more. Tony stared at X. After a moment, he turned away from him, stepping away a few feet. I shared a look with Steve. He looked at Tony, hesitated. Then he finally spoke. Tony, there's something else. What, more than Hydra trying to steal my stuff? Tony said sarcastically. He turned to look at us again, eyes hard, smile tight. Sam, Mahmood, let's go somewhere else, Natasha said. She walked over and took the two of us by the elbows, pulling us away. Wait, what? Tony looked at us as we walked past, then at Steve. What, is Pepper Hydra? Granted, she'd look hot in a leather outfit. 1. Tony, Rhodey said, apparently realizing something was wrong. As we walked away, I heard Steve begin to speak. Back during the war, Hydra kidnapped Bucky Barnes, my best friend, and turned him into Dash. Then we were too far away to hear anything. Sam looked at Natasha and me. I think both of us had a complicated look on our face. What happened? Bucky killed Tony's mom and dad while he was brainwashed, I said. We asked X more about Bucky once Maria brought him back, and you were busy. Oh, Sam blinked. That's, geez, that's gonna be tough. And this is the best time to tell him. I coached Steve a bit, Natasha said, letting go of our elbows and following us. Steve wants to be honest, but he doesn't want Tony to hate Bucky for something he couldn't control, Natasha looked back. I did the same. Tony had fallen to the floor, his head in his hands, Rhodey and Steve down next to him. The table X had been rested on was snapped in half, X resting on the floor and still projecting an image of Howard and Maria Stark. Thankfully Jury Rig made X to be durable so that little damage wasn't going to harm its data and he could fix it after they were done. I turned away, sorrow in my heart. My first time meeting my favorite Marvel hero, and it's to bring up his deepest pain. Yay me. A little bit later, we were standing in a room full of clothes. Everything from military uniforms, tuxedos, dresses, Hawaiian shirts, and even some cowboy boots and hats. Whatever a secret agent would need. In this case, we're, we're in the more military-focused section. It's a mistake to go for the heaviest bulletproof armor in our business, Natasha said, rifling through the clothes. Mobility is what humans like you and I need. Protection from guns is still important, but compared to just outmaneuvering guys as powerful as Winter Soldier and Creel, we need to be able to move too. She pulled out a pair of black pants with a belt. The pants were thick, and had pockets everywhere. She handed them to me. Then she handed me a pair of underwear, 
grinning at the embarrassed blush I gave her at the sight of the white jockeys. Sam coughed in a vain attempt to hide his own laughter. Now, you need some armor, but it needs to let you move. She went over to where some plates, knee, and elbow pads, and boots were. The armor ranged from almost uselessly small, to big enough for wrath. Shoulder, chest, knees, shins, elbows, she tossed them on a table, gesturing to a section of the room blocked off by purple cloth. Get in there, put on what I throw at you. I went inside, throwing my clothes off. She tossed something over the curtain, and I looked at it before snorting. Deodorant. Extra strong variety. Four men of action. You'll thank me, Natasha said through the curtain. She's not wrong, Sam said. The less glamorous side of hero work, I said with a chuckle. I put on the pants and underwear. Natasha threw me a shirt, vest, and jacket. The jacket was kinda cool, all black and sleek looking. The vest was a dark green. I put them all on, then walked out. Natasha looked me over, then nodded, handing me the chest plate next. Sam helped me put it on. The chest plate was big enough to cover my pectorals, heart, lungs, and abdomen, but let me move rather easily. A pair of shoulder plates, knee and elbow pads, and shin plates, the handgun, and knife with a pair of solid boots, and the ensemble was completed. 3. With that done, I looked down at myself, then at Natasha and Sam. Looks good, Sam said. Yay, I'm good at this, Natasha said with a smirk. Too bad the others won't let me help. Clint's the only one who let me dress him. I like it, I put on a pair of fingerless gloves, then looked at my chest. Just needs one more thing. With all of us gathered, we met in the center of the main floor. The plastic walls and surgery equipment had been replaced with tables and chairs. The fold-away tables were arranged in a haphazard circle, and the chairs were set up for all of us. I took a spot high up to watch everyone enter. Tony was speaking with Steve in hushed tones. He was shaking his head angrily as Steve spoke. After a bit of thought, I walked over to join the pair. Sam and Rhody were talking in another corner of the room, both Air Force soldiers apparently talking shop. Clint, Natasha, and Maria were all sitting already, a newly repaired X placed in front of them. As I walked past, X flashed a blueprint of the inside heli carriers. Maria looked between the blueprint and a folder in her hands, then said something to Clint, who answered while pointing to different sections of the carrier. When I came up to them, Tony was speaking. So, what, he's your friend? so you get the first crack at him. Tony asked furiously. That's not what I'm saying, Steve said desperately. I just... I lost him once, Tony. If I have to lose him again. Tony stared into Steve's eyes. Steve looked away. He killed my mom, Tony said. I don't care if it was on purpose or not. I deserve to at least bring him in. Then do it together, I said as I came up to them. They looked at me. Who gives a shit who deserves it? Consider what you're facing. He is one of the strongest fighters in the world right now. You want to bring him in, it might just take more than one of you to do it. The rest of us will watch for him, let you know when he shows up, and you guys will have a plan to bring him in. X says there is a way to reverse his conditioning. In the meantime, I'll try to find out who sent the order. Vasily Karpov, Tony said. He looked between us. X told me, I'm having Jarvis track him down. He smiled, a tight, enraged quirk of the lips. His left hand tightened into a fist. After this is over, I'm going to find him myself. Tony. Steve began to say. Then he closed his mouth, looking at Tony. I need to do this, Tony said softly. I'll help you, Steve finally said. And so will the rest of us. Okay, people. Fury's voice got all of our attention. He walked into the room wearing a cast on his left arm, and looked around at us. Let's begin. You know, Tony said to Fury. I knew hearing you died was too good to be true. Leave it to the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. to pull the biggest spy cliché ever, Tony said, obviously falling back on humor to mask his personal feelings at the moment. Fury eyed Tony. Good to see you too. Now if you're here to help, sit down. Tony, Steve, and I looked at each other, then went over to the tables. Clockwise, with Fury at the center, Sam, Rhodey, me, Steve, Tony, Maria, Clint, and Natasha all sat, X placed in front of Fury. Now, originally, the plan I had in place was a bit desperate, Fury admitted. He looked around. But now, thanks to Rogers, I have five assets to bring into play. With you, I think we can stop Hydra and maybe we can salvage what's left- We aren't salvaging anything, 
Steve interrupted. We're not just taking down Hydra, Nick, we're taking down S.H.I.E.L.D. As all of us stared at Steve, Fury responded. S.H.I.E.L.D. had nothing to do with this. He sounded insulted. You gave me this mission, this is how it ends, Steve said firmly. S.H.I.E.L.D.'s been compromised, you said it yourself. Hydra grew right under your nose and nobody noticed. I winced. He was right, in a sense. Still, I was beginning to feel like this was too much. Fury agreed. Why do you think we're meeting in this cave? I noticed. Yeah, not before my parents were killed, Tony interrupted. Oh, by his brainwashed buddy, by the way. Fury looked between Tony and Steve. Look, I didn't know about Barnes. Even if you had, would you have told me? Fury was silent. Embarrassing, right? Tony said, realizing how ingrained your super spy stuff is. Shield, Hydra, it all goes. Steve said, he's right, Maria added. Fury looked around. At Clint, Natasha, Rhodey, Tony, and Sam. He didn't look at me. I think he thought I was going to go along with Steve and Tony. I got up. Sam, who was about to say something, stopped. Steve, Tony, everyone. I know I'm the new guy here, but I think I need to give my opinion. You don't, Tony said. So you can sit down dash. As the only guy here who is arguably superhuman, I need to say this, Tony shut his mouth. I placed my hands on the table and looked around. You guys want to take down S.H.I.E.L.D. On one level, I agree. It needs to be cleaned out, seriously. But I don't think complete dismantling of it is the right idea. Not to mention impossible, Rhodey said. Way too many people in the military, government, and even the private sector have dealings with S.H.I.E.L.D. Hydra will hide away again and cause trouble for someone else. Doesn't that thing, Clint nodded towards X, have all the information on Hydra? Portions of it, I said. I can try to make something to give us more, maybe get lots more from main shield systems and hook up to Hydra. But that's not all. I looked around. We need shield. Super secret organization with shady business practices and a history of Nazis in its ranks. Tony said sarcastically. I'm good thanks. No, but we need people to fight the good fight, I argued. At the least, we need an organization dealing with the weird stuff in the world. The Avengers can do that, Steve said. The Avengers are a small group of people, I snapped. You guys can't be there all the time, and you can't deal with everything. What if someone in Idaho suddenly gets accelerated reflexes? Is Tony Stark going to go and visit them? Teach them how to use their powers? or even help them when people like Hydra try to kidnap them for experiments. I'd do it, Tony said. I'd save them, what the hell are you insinuating? That you wouldn't even hear about it, I said simply. It's not me calling you callous, it's me saying that you're one man, and you can't be everywhere. We need to have a big organized group of people. It's a weird world now, I raised the Omnitrix and showed it to everyone. This thing was given to me, but if someone else had gotten it, and they started killing people, who would have informed you guys, too. Shield, Natasha said. I nodded. We need to take them down, Steve said. We'd never know for sure who we could trust otherwise. Then we start anew at least, I looked at Tony. I think we can narrow down the list, figure out every aspect of their plans. Hydra may have hidden in Shield, but that still leaves a trail. If they're in the system's dash. Then we can find them, Tony said, leaning back and resting his cheek against his hand. Okay say that we do. We find Hydra, stop them all. Then what we, we have shield just keep going. No, we all looked in surprise at Fury. He was staring at the X device. We, jury rig it, he looked up at us. So to speak, we take what is good, what is worth saving, and we build something new. Is that possible? Sam asked. Just take shield and make something new out of it. It happened in Russia, Natasha said. The Chaika, GPU, OGPU, NKVD, NKGB, all the way to the KGB and now the Federal Security Service. Yes, because when I want a spy agency, I decide to copy the Russians, Tony pointed out, looking around. How about it, fanboy, you want to start torturing people for information, maybe start some wars in Asian nations for a pissing contest with another country. I want to make S.H.I.E.L.D. what it was supposed to be, I said firmly. I crossed my arms. S.H.I.E.L.D. is supposed to be the bridge between what people consider normal, and all the weirdness out there. I say we take it to where it's supposed to be. Protect people from the madness on every level, but also protect people who end up getting powers. People like Bruce Banner, 
who get their powers out of nowhere. People like me, who end up with alien technology attached to them, and have no place to go. We can protect the world from those threats. But we need to work with S.H.I.E.L.D., and all that is good in it, to do it. 5. I'm not so sure about that, Steve said softly. He's right, Natasha said. Everyone looked at her. Well, of course, you'd say that, Tony said. No, I think he's right too, Rhodey said. E.T. 2, Brutus. Tony held a dramatic hand to his heart. 12. An organization to help the Avengers protect people, even when we can't be there, to tell us if something needs our attention? It's a good idea, Natasha said. And we can't let all those resources go to Hydra, Rhodey added. The second we reveal the truth, Hydra operatives are going to try and take every bit of money, tech, and personal they can. If we can at least put it to good use, to make a group to save people dash. Then we do the work shield was made for, Steve rose up. He looked at all of us, then stopped on fury. If we do this, no more secrets, no more lies, not between us at least. Everyone here, we keep each other in check, and we make sure everyone is safe. You sure you want everyone here in your secret circle? Fury looked at me. Oh come on. I snarled. I'm the one agreeing with you asshole. See what I'm talking about. Tony pointed out. Yeah, what the hell man. Sam added. Just saying, Fury replied. One. All of us, Steve looked around. Mahmoud's, well, he's right. We need people there, to help us, to be there when. When we can't, Steve sighed. I don't trust S.H.I.E.L.D. as it is. But if we can join together, tear it apart and make it something new, something good, and strong, something the original founders made it to be, then I think this is worth doing. You all agree. I'm still on the fence, Tony looked at me. You really want this, fanboy? The next person to make an Iron Man suit may not be so nice, I told him. The next Asgardian weapon, alien invasion, or attack of my little ponies needs people there to confront it. We need to do this. And we need to do it right. 4. What's all this wee business? Tony said. He sighed. Well, I always wanted my own spy group. Sure. Let's be spies. You gonna name this organization, or just call it S.H.I.E.L.D. again? Sam asked me. 3. I looked around. Ah. Uh, Arrow, Clint smiled at the looks he got. What? I think it's perfect. 3. Stark infiltration, Tony suggested. 2. You are terrible at names, Rhodey told him. Why not just call it S.H.I.E.L.D. again? Too much history, Fury said. But let's table that discussion. On to the plan. X, bring up the insight files. Maria, show us the floor plan for the hangars. 2. A holographic screen popped up. Maria tapped on a laptop, turning it around for us to see. Now, Fury said, taking into account our new plans, and the assets we have available, I believe we should start by. Author's note, man. 10 pages. 10 pages. Yeah, took a while to write this, and it ended up having almost no transformation and no action. But I think it's all important. A whole lot of deviations from canon here. And I'm worried about a lot of it. But I did my best, and I had fun. 5. Hope you guys like it. Please tell me what your hopes are for the new Battle of the Triskelion. Also, if anyone starts throwing out names, you are required to come up with backronyms along with them. Oh, and Dial's costume. I based it on Widows from Infinity War. I liked the green she had, and I plan to have Dial spray paint an Omnitrix symbol on the left pectoral. So, hopefully it works. 4. Anyways, good night, I'm gonna work on the next chapter. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 14 comments. Chapter 9, Full Force Attack. A while after we'd made our plans, Steve had gone up to the top of the dam. When Steve had been up there for a while, Sam went up to join him, leaving the rest of us behind. Tony and I were supposed to make stuff for the team to use. We went to room that was clearly set up to be a makeshift engineering facility of some sort, with technological parts everywhere. We sat in swivel chairs with a list, but before that, Tony had some questions. So this is alien tech. Tony held my wrist, looking at the Omnitrix. Made by the Galvin scientist, Azmuth, I confirmed. Huh, Tony let go of my wrist. Kid, can you just take that off so I can look at it already? You gonna let me try out and suit? I quipped. Sure, I got some Armani's I'm probably gonna give to Goodwill soon, Tony said. I meant dash. I know what you meant, 
Tony snarked. And no, just show me how it works. I opened up the dial. The hologram of swamp fire showed up, and I pressed down on it. In a second, I was the tall and broad plant creature. Swamp fire. What, you have to call out the name every time you change? Tony asked. Then he blinked. Also, what the hell is that smell? First, it's tradition, I said in my nasally voice. Second, it's me. I'm a methanotion, we smell like that. What, so you can smell like literal crap? Tony sounded nasally too, though it was because he was holding his nose. I frowned, somehow insulted. No, so I can do this, I held up a hand and let a flame loose. I may be plant-based, I raised my other hand and sprouted a flower from the palm, making it red and gold just for Tony. But I also produce methane I can ignite. Huh, Tony put his hand down, leaning closer to look at the Omnitrix now resting on my chest. And you can switch to another form. Yeah, I put out the flame, and handed the flower to Tony. He blinked, staring at it. Ah, I'm flattered fanboy, but dash. It's for Pepper, you ass, I rolled my eyes, tapping the Omnitrix. So much for being your favorite Avenger, Tony quipped. He looked up from the flower to me, then a little further up. Huh, that is impressive. I was Blitzwolfer again. I stretched upwards and smiled as savagely as I could. Which was pretty damn savagely. Thanks. So yeah, I can change. I really wish I had time to study how you do that, Tony said with a grimace. Okay, let's get to business, he turned away to pick up a tablet Maria had handed him. Time to waste my skills making a bunch of things you can find in a grocery store. Or. Tony looked over at me. Or. I mean, we have to make stuff. Why not go all out? I growled. He spun in his swivel chair. I'm listening. Nothing does a vicious grin the way a wolf does. I reached for the Omnitrix and changed once more. Let's get to work. I said, laughing maniacally. Time to disassemble. Tony stared at me for a moment. Huh. Nice shirt. January 12, 2014. We'd had 20 hours when we'd been picked up by Hydra. We had four left now. Tony and Rhodey were getting their suits while the rest of us packed up our own gear. Bored, I'd gravitated towards Steve when he returned from a mission of his own, leading to the two of us in the costume room. I was leaning against a rack of clown costumes while Steve put on his suit. On any other day, wondering what the hell kind of assassin slash spy needs a clown costume would have been my question. But I had other issues. Steve, I'm not sure it's exactly kosher to do that, I said as I stared at when Steve was putting on. Well, I did own it, he gave me a grin. Besides, I'll put it back when I'm done. I'm basically adding history to it. That is not how it works, I said. I mean, what if someone gets fired? Steve stopped for a moment. Then he shook his head. I'll cover it. Besides, my other suit is torn up from when I had to escape the Triskelion. He was putting on his World War II suit, stolen from fucking Smithsonian. That's not the real reason. We looked over to see Natasha walking in wearing all navy blue. A skirt, jacket, and shirt. And some pearl and in gold necklaces that glimmer slightly as she walked cat-like into the room. She was holding a wig in one hand, short, and blonde. She stepped closer, looking closely at Steve. After a moment, he answered. Bucky, he might need a reminder. The closer I looked to how I was back then, maybe. He turned to look at his helmet. Maybe it'll be easier for him to remember me. Natasha and I didn't say anything. He seemed to take it as acceptance, which it was. He picked up the helmet. With a feeling of ceremony, he put it on. Captain America, in full costume. The stars and stripes, right down to the star on his chest. Awesome. Stop grinning like that, Natasha said, punching me lightly in the shoulder. It's creepy. Sorry, I replied. She smiled, then nodded towards my right pectoral. I see you found that spray paint you wanted. I looked down and smiled. It was a bit rough. But now the symbol of the Omnitrix rested on my chest in green and black. It had dripped a bit as it dried, but it looked good. Yeah. Can't be the only one of us without a cool costume after all. I'll leave that to you, I said. Then I looked at Black Widow, looking her up and down dramatically. Kinda funny, you having to play elderly politician. Although I was sorta looking forward to the leather. Well, play your cards right. Natasha's red lips lifted just slightly. I blinked, not knowing how to respond. That just made her eyes glimmer. She turned to walk away. Ah. Uh, I looked at Steve, who was smirking at me. I don't understand what just happened. She has that effect, 
Steve noted. He stepped forward and put his hand on my shoulder, walking me out. Come on. If all 96 years hasn't taught me anything about woman, a couple minutes talking won't help either. Weren't you trapped under ice for 70 of those years? I groused. Details. Out on the floor, Tony and Rody came toward us with another man. Happy Hogan. I recognized him from hacking into Stark Industries. Man, that felt like a lifetime ago, just patrolling in New York City and watching for any changes. Hopefully I'd be able to do that again one day. Happy was about my height, with a heavy build, a black suit, and slightly balding hair. I tried to figure out if he looked like an actor I knew, but none came to mind, which was almost a relief. Steve, you've met Happy, Tony said, walking by us quickly. Hey Howard, Steve said as Happy strode into the room. Ah, uh, Tony. Tony stopped to look at Steve, as did Rody and Happy. I thought we were keeping it confidential? That was our agreement. It's okay, Tony waved a hand dismissively. Happy's my guy, so he gets to know about this. And you don't even discuss it with us. Steve asked, affronted. Dude, I added, giving Tony the same look. Happy and Rody shared a look, both apparently understanding where we were coming from. Oh, I'm sorry, dude, is the guy who hacked my company and Happy's email for weeks extending an opinion. Tony asked pointedly. Wait, what's happening now? Happy looked at me, stepping closer. Hey, I was spying on him in case some guy tried to kidnap the president again, I said briskly. If people had been listening to Happy from the start, things might have ended better. Thank you. Happy raised his hands dramatically, looking at Tony. You see if people had listened to me dash. You see what you did. Tony told me. If people had just listened dash. I did listen, that's how I found out how Killian was doing the bombs. Yeah, and then I was in a coma. You want to do this now, in front of fanboy and cap. Hell, bring Natasha in too. For the love of. Happy. The two walked away, bickering, leaving Rody silently shaking his shoulders in laughter. He waited until they'd left to turn to Steve, who seemed stuck between exasperated and amused. So, yeah, Rody said. Happy brought our suits over. We'll be ready to go. Yeah about that, I said. Didn't Tony blow up his suits? I mean, I remember reading about it in the news. He did, Rody looked over at his friend. But he just can't stop making more. Pepper complains about it. I thought about Pepper Potts. Then I thought about Rescue, the superhero identity Pepper would eventually take on. Hell, she did really good work as Rescue. Something for the future. Okay, come on, Cap patted me on the back. Time to get started. Actually, can I talk to him? Rody said. Steve and I looked at Rody. Uh, sure, I said. Rody waved me over to another section of the room, and we walked over to one of the damp hallways. I'm going to be blunt about this, Rody said simply. I don't think you should go. That was not what I expected at all. Wait, what? I don't think this mission is one you should go on, he said firmly. Are you kidding? Rody shook his head. I'm one of the strongest members of our team? I mean, I know I'm new, but I can do a lot of good. I'm not saying that dash. Hell, I'm already on Hydra's hit list, I deserve to fight. And kill. Because this isn't a fight. This is a war, Rody shook his head. I know you're powerful. Natasha told me what you could do, but I remember what my first kill was like. And it doesn't matter what happens, it still changed me. I don't want that changing you two. I heard footsteps behind me. When I turned, Steve and Sam were standing there. You guys agree with him. Sam didn't say anything, just looking between Rody and me. Steve opened his mouth, then closed it after a bit of hesitation. It's not about how powerful you are, Rody said. But if you join, then there will be a point where things will come down to killing or dying. And if I allowed you to just dive into this without warning you about what could happen. He trailed off. I looked at Steve. Cap, I dash. He held up a hand. I stopped talking. Are you going? Yes, I didn't hesitate. I know I might have to, to kill people. I don't like the idea. But I can't stand by and not help. Yet, yeah, I know what that's like. Steve shook his head. I felt the same way when I joined. Same, Sam said. Rody nodded reluctantly. Just know, that afterward. You have someone to talk to if you need it. Steve said. I still don't like it, Rody said. I know, I told him. I clenched my fist. But I'm still going. War. Ready or not, it was time to go. The Triskelion really was pretty. 
From our position in a forest nearby, I could see it across the river. Something about it just screamed of authority and strength. Too bad it was going to be a war zone soon. Okay, this is where we split, Steve said. There were six of us. Captain America, Iron Man, War Machine, Maria Hill, Sam Wilson, and me. We stopped for a moment. Everyone has their comm systems on. Yep, I said. Well, the Omnitrix is connecting well. Was it really necessary to make these so powerful? Sam asked, tapping at his ear. He had a point. When Tony and Jury Rig had made comm links, they went crazy with them. They looked like small earbuds. Elegant design really, only thanks to Tony curbing Jury Rig's antics. Crystal clear sound, it could pick up the vibrations of the bones in the jaw so even whispering was heard clearly. Unable to be picked up by any comm system on Earth we didn't want it to. Oh, and it was FTL in speed, and could project in deep space through quantum entanglement, even pierce through a mountain's worth of material to still connect. Hey, you want my best or something you can find out of a radio shack. Tony said, his Iron Man mask flipped up. Oh yeah, Tony and Rhodey were in their suits. God, the suits were so badass. Iron Man in the classic red and gold, all sleek and shiny with an upside-down triangular light in the center representing the arc reactor that powered the suit. It gave him a presence that matched with Cap's. Almost as though Tony was magnified in every respect by the suit. War Machine was different. Black and somber gray to Iron Man's flashy red and gold. Bulky instead of sleek, with a square light in the chest, and a massive minigun on his right shoulder. His forearms also carried a pair of guns. If Tony would have looked right at home with a sleek sci-fi movie, Rhodey belonged to a more gritty cyberpunk noir. All business. More importantly, I was staring at some of the coolest suits in fiction. Oh, wait. I was staring. I looked back at the Triskelion. Mission time man. Gotta focus. Okay, enough talk, Steve said. He looked over us. You all know what to do. Launch. Inside the Triskelion, things should have been going smoothly. Everyone would infiltrate, beginning our assault by disrupting Hydra from the start. It was probably very intense. God, this is so boring, Tony grumbled next to me. How can something so intense be so boring? It's just how it goes, Tony, Rhodey said. Hurry up and wait. It's one of the oldest military adages, man. Tony grunted. The three of us had taken a spot in the forest to wait for our signal. Once it came, we had some of the most important roles in the attack. But for now, it was just the three of us watching the Triskelion in the distance. The wind blew through the trees, rustled the grass, and blew ripples across the water. For a moment, we sat in peace. Yeah, this is boring, I finally admitted. You see, Tony said to Rhodey, who sighed in annoyance. I really wish I could see what everyone else was doing, I grumbled. Well, maybe they'd tell me about it later. Sam Wilson slash Falcon. As he followed Captain America through the Triskelion, Sam had to admit he was having a weird couple of days. Even the Air Force couldn't provide the training needed to prepare for all of what he was going through. A guy who could turn into aliens, Iron Man, and War Machine, S.H.I.E.L.D. actually being Hydra, suddenly getting drafted into making a new espionage organization. As the three went around the next corner, Sam found himself shaking his head. I really didn't expect this to be how my day would go. Yeah, Steve said as they hurried forward. It's not what I expected either. But you get used to it. I doubt that. Maria said, the spy wearing her blue uniform with the shield symbol on the shoulders. But then, I was about ready to destroy shield yesterday, Maria looked at Steve. Are you sure about this? Making a new shield? No, Steve said. They turned another corner. But we do need something. Once the dust settles, we can decide what to make of it all. For now, let's hope the toys Tony and Mock Mood made pull through. I hope so. Sam looked at the device hanging on Maria's hip. It doesn't look like much. Maria looked down as well. The device looked like a metal pirate symbol, with an X welded haphazardly attached to the back of a bulbous object reminiscent of a human skull. Doesn't matter how it looks, Maria said, as long as it works. At that moment, she raised a hand holding a square object and pressed a button. They came to a door, Sam pulling out one of his stair SPP machine pistols, Maria a Glock 19, and both pointed the gun at the door, Steve in between them. Shield at the ready. The door opened to reveal a skinny young man with dark skin, wearing a shield uniform and hat. He stared at them in shock. Excuse us, Steve quipped. The young man raised his hands up and stepped aside hurriedly, letting them pass. 
Okay, Steve said as he stepped inside. The technicians in the room turned and stared at him. I'm going to need this room. If you all could kindly head out, I'd appreciate it. Whether it was the guns, Steve's politeness, or the dichotomy of both, the technicians ran out of the door. Okay, Maria, Steve nodded towards her. Maria nodded back, heading to a computer while taking the device at her hips in her hands. I'll watch the doors, Sam said. He moved to the center of the room and pulled out his other gun. Do your thing, Steve. On it, Steve waited until Maria had plugged in the device. It came to life. Ready when you are sir, X said from his newly modified home. Okay. Steve took a deep breath. Then he hit the intercom. And X began his work. A British voice spoke from the device. This is Jarvis. We are beginning our assault, Miss Hill. Yeah, Maria stared at the screen as files began to pop in and out of existence on the monitor. Ah yeah, I can see that. I really hope we didn't just upload Skynet, Sam whispered to himself, trying to stay ready. Steve sighed. For once, I don't feel good about understanding the reference. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 5 comments. Chapter 10, Show is on. I was picking up strands of grass from the dirt out of boredom when Steve's voice came out of the Omnitrix. I scrambled up to my feet, looking over at Tony and Rhodey. With a whir of noise, they stepped forward. Okay, I said softly. Let's go. Sam Wilson slash Falcon. Sam turned towards Steve, ready to say something. Then Steve began to speak into the intercom. And Sam stopped to listen in silence. Attention, all S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. This is Steve Rogers. You've heard a lot about me over the last few days, some of you were even ordered to hunt me down. But I think it's time you know the truth. S.H.I.E.L.D. has been infiltrated, Steve looked over at Maria, who nodded. Hydra has infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. Alexander Pierce is their leader. Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow. Black Widow, disguised as Councilwoman Holly, looked at Pierce at the same time as the other council members did. Pierce looked back at them. The man smiled slightly as Steve continued to speak. He had the audacity to shrug slightly, an Ashuk sort of shrug. She almost smiled at that. As much as she couldn't wait to kill him, she had to admire how calm he was. Not as much as she admired the calm smooth tones Steve used to speak over the intercom, however. As she shared a look with Councilman Yen, who winked at her. All the while, Steve continued to speak. The Strike and Insight crew are Hydra as well. I don't know how many more, but I know they're in the building. Sharon Carter slash Agent 13. They could be standing right next to you. They almost have what they want with the help of the Insight Heli Carriers, absolute control. Sharon listened to the voice of Captain America with horror and sadness filling her. Unlike the others in the room, S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't a job or even a duty. It was her legacy. Something her great aunt, Peggy Carter, had believed in with all of her heart. Sharon couldn't count how many times Peggy had spoken about founding S.H.I.E.L.D., of the pride and joy she'd felt building the organization. To know how her pride was torn apart would break her heart. Sharon focused, looking around quickly. As of now, all loyal S.H.I.E.L.D. agents should be getting a program on their phones, Steve said. Sharon blinked when the phones of every person in the room began to buzz, including her own. Everyone took out their phones, Sharon included. She blinked at the screen on her smartphone. Hercules. She asked herself. The words were in big letters. As she watched, it flashed into the shield symbol, then showed a photo of a man. Rumlow, leader of strike team. Other began to flash, person after person. Apparently the app not only had files on all Hydra, but would flash green near shield members and red near Hydra. The app will show you every member of Hydra as we discover them, with evidence to back it up so you know I'm not simply spreading dissent in the ranks. The threat is real. Hydra is among us. They shot Nick Fury. And it won't end there. 1. Sharon shared looks with other agents in the room. Almost as one, they all raised their smartphones. All had the Hercules app flashing green, something that visibly relieved her. Shield. Everyone in the room, down to the skinny technician sitting at the computer in front of her. Now to see about the rest of the base. Robert Gonzalez slash commander of the Iliad. Gonzalez had been working for Shield for decades. The only time he'd ever stopped was when his wife died only to return to service three years later. He was proud of the work he'd done. He worked on the Iliad now, an aircraft carrier built for S.H.I.E.L.D. to do its work across the world. He had seen many strange things in that time, sitting at the bridge of the carrier. 
And yet, he had never heard of anything like this. When the voice of Captain Steve Rogers suddenly began to come out of the intercom of his ship's speakers in the middle of a routine patrol, he didn't know what to think at first. It was clear he was in the Triskelion based on what he was saying. He stood on the bridge of his ship, listening as Steve Rogers explained that Hydra had infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. Hydra, the boogeyman that was supposed to be dead. When Gonzalez received the Hercules app, so did ten others in the bridge. Six crewmen, however, very obviously did not. For a moment, everyone looked at each other. The Hercules app helpfully flashed photos of the six, apparently basing the decision on proximity. Then Gonzalez reached for his sidearm. The six tried to do the same. And all over the world, the same thing repeated itself again and again. Some Hydra surrendered. Others died. Some escaped. But no agent of Hydra was immune to Hercules' sight. 1. Sam Wilson slash Falcon. If you allow the heli carriers to launch today, Hydra will be able to kill anyone that stands in their way, unless we stop them, Steve breathed deeply. I know I'm asking a lot but the price of freedom is high, it always has been. 3. Sam watched as Steve spoke. For a moment, Steve Rogers seemed to, to shrink. As though he had taken on so much, too much, as though he realized how much he'd been through. Steve Rogers staggered under the weight as Sam watched. But before Sam could say anything, before he could step forward, the man raised himself up. Steve took a deep breath, and Captain America spoke. And it's a price I'm willing to pay. And if I'm the only one, so be it. He looked at Sam and Maria. The pair gave him determined nods he returned. But I'm willing to bet I'm not. Steve turned off the intercom. Sam stepped forward, smirking at Steve. Did you write that down first, or was it off the top of your head? I was an actor once, Steve said with a smile. They stepped towards the window. High in the sky, two dots could barely be seen, one slightly larger than the other. Both flew towards the hangar bays of the inside heli carriers. Now, let's watch for a bit. According to Mahmoud, this will be quite a sight, Steve held a hand to his ear. Dial, shut em down. 2. Mahmoud shaked, slash dial. Got it. I yelled. I didn't have to yell, technically. While I didn't have a calm link, the Omnitrix was advanced enough to pick up my voice with ease. But when you're soaring through the air at high speed, yelling is just the only way to speak. Sorry if the ride's a little rough, Rhodey said. Nah, this is awesome. I was behind held under my armpits by war machine as Iron Man flew next to us. We were crossing hundreds of feet over the water, my legs dangling in the air. Focus up. Tony said. Jarvis, we good. Yes sir, he said. X and I have sent the Hercules app throughout the world, shut down Hydra communications devices, and begun stage two of our attack. Okay, I breathed in the cold air. Drop me. Good luck. Rhodey let me go. Just like that, I was falling through the air at high speed. For a moment, all I could see was the hangars below. Three of them, hiding under the water, but visible from above. A glint of sunlight shone off the river, forcing me to squint. Two. Then the roaring noises of rocket boots came close. Iron Man flew by on my left, zooming towards the hangars. War Machine passed on my right. The two men of iron opened up shoulder hatches on their suits, firing rockets at the hangars on the left and right. When the explosions opened holes in the hangar bay doors, water from the river began to rush inside, creating waterfalls into the hangar. Rhodey and Tony flew into the openings they'd created, which meant it was my turn. I reached for my The Omnitrix and activated it. Flesh and bone became shining blue-green crystal. Diamond head. I pointed my hands at the ground, and turned my arms into cannons. As I dropped towards the earth, I started shooting crystals at the hangar's bay doors. Each one the size of a knife, they sliced easily into the steel doors. Hundreds, covering every surface I could shoot of the doors. And as I fell towards them, I made them grow. Like a fast motion video of water freezing, the crystals grew at a rapid pace. They joined together, then got bigger. Soon the three doors were covered in crystals dotting their surface, each the size of a car or bigger. Not good enough. Bigger, bigger, bigger. I stopped shooting the crystals, instead focusing on their growth. They shot upwards to meet in the middle towards where I was falling. One of the crystals shot directly at me as hundreds of spears rose up into the sky, glimmering beautifully in the light. Just before I would have landed on one of my own gems, I shifted it to become a ramp. I still slammed into it hard enough to shatter human legs, 
but Diamond Head's durability made the impact negligible and let me slide down along the crystals to the center of the middle hanger. I turned my left arm into a razor-sharp blade. It took three cuts to slash my way into the hanger. I dropped in, slamming into the asphalt of one of the inside heli carriers below. I bent my knees on impact, a crater getting created by my drop. I looked around. The inside heli carrier had crates, quinjets, and men dotting its flight deck. The island, or command tower of the ship, was across from me. I stood on the middle of the ship. I took in my position, ignoring the stunned Hydra agents around me. Then I rose up and lifted my hands to the sky, closing my eyes. The sunlight outside came in through the hole I'd created, letting a beam of light into the dark hangar. As the mountain I was creating outside grew, the yellow light became a sea green. Then the hole was covered in crystal. Kill it. One man cried out behind me. He fired a handgun. The bullet slammed into the back of my head. I ignored it, and the bullet fell to the floor with no effect. Come on, shoot that thing. More men, about fifteen, came up and started shooting as well. I grunted in annoyance, but ignored the useless bullets bouncing off me. The Omnitrix on my chest spoke then, Steve's voice coming from it. All right, Dial. It's perfect. Neutralize the crew. I opened my hands and ran at the men shooting me. All wore black uniforms and helmets, the gear I always saw Hydra's men wearing. But now I know who they were. I leaped at one man and bunched him in the ribs. He flew back twenty feet and slammed into a crate. I turned, ignoring the hail of bullets being shot at me. This is Dial, I said as I stalked through the bullets. Engaging. 1. What happened to his voice? Tony asked. Did he go through puberty again? 2. I ignored him. Instead, I grabbed a soldier by the front of his uniform and kicked his right kneecap in. As he screamed, I lifted him up and threw him at one of the other men, sending them both to the ground. Just then, a Quinjet roared to life, one of a few resting on the flight deck of the heli carrier with us. It rose up, aiming its gun at me. I leaped towards it instead, jumping onto the cockpit. The aircraft rose up towards the doors above us, the pilot staring at me while I climbed on top. My feet shot out crystals from my heels to slice into the Quinjet and give me footing. I snapped my hands out to the side, my arms becoming twelve-foot-long blades. Rack. With a quick downward slice, I chopped off the wings of the Quinjet. It plummeted out of the air, slamming into the flight deck. I hopped off the Quinjet and looked at the pilot, who stared at me in horror. I responded by kicking the Quinjet away from me, sending it skittering across the concrete until it was out of my way. The soldiers, seeing they couldn't hurt me, tried to run for cover. I tapped the Omnitrix symbol on my chest. Fast track. As soon as I became the Blue Furred Speedster, I was moving. I sped up to one man and kicked him in the back as he ran. I landed and ran to another, grabbing him by the chest of his uniform and spinning to throw him as fast as I could. He hung in the air when I let go, slowly flying away. I ran to another bunch, about five men, and began hitting them. I kicked one in between the legs at super speed. One I punched in the chest quickly up man style. Another got a superman punch. One was thrown at a quinjet. For the last, I swept his legs out from under him. I watched as he slowly floated in the air before slapping the Omnitrix on my chest. 6. As my perception of time slowed, the effects of my run took place. The man I'd kicked flew forward 10 feet, rolling to a stop. The one I'd thrown sped up in an instant, slamming into a crate. Another man fell to his knees clutching his devastated groin. The guy I'd punched in the chest grunted in pain as his broken ribs caught up with him. Another man spun in the air before he slammed into the ground from the force of my Superman punch. A Quinjet shuddered when a human man was thrown into it. The guy whose legs I'd swept hit the ground. He looked up at me and released a high-pitched scream at my visage. Blitzwolfer. I howled. My voice crying my name echoed through the hangars, then into the hallways. The hell was that? Rhodey said from the Omnitrix. Me. I leaned towards the guy on the ground. He screamed again. I punched him in the face and he fell unconscious. I ran towards the command tower slash island on all fours. I needed get inside and stop the crew members from doing anything. Tony and Rhodey had the same goal. While Black Widow and Captain America lead their teams in the Triskelion, the three heavy hitters took out the crew of the heli carriers. I loped along the flight deck. Six men popped out from behind cover and started shooting at me. My mouth opened into four parts. As the inhuman sound erupted from my lungs as though it was rending at reality, 
A sonic wave of noise slammed into the six men with physical force. The crates they were using as cover slid back from the attack. They fell to their knees, blood pouring from their ears to spill down their neck. And then I was among them. I shoulder tackled one into a crate, then back fisted him in the face, sending him unconscious to the ground. His friend shakily raised a gun at me. My claw slashed out, slicing through Kevlar to cut into his chest. The man shrieked in horror. I let out my own noise. He was thrown by my sonic blast, rolling to a stop on the pavement. I leaped over another crate and kicked a man in the face with a pod foot, the crack of a broken jaw following. I heard another gunshot, then felt an pain in my shoulder. I barked in pain, spinning around. One of the Hydra men who I'd deaf and shakily aimed a Glock 19 at my face. Blood poured from my wound. It hurt, but only enough to enrage me. I was on him in an instant. I bit into his arm and began to shake my head furiously, savaging his arm. When he dropped the gun I let go of his arm and grabbed him by the front of his uniform, lifting and throwing him away dismissively. 5. The sound of a Quinjet brought my attention closer to the command tower. The aircraft lifted up and aimed its guns at me in a repeat of last time. Not happening? 6. The sonic blast slammed into the Quinjet, shaking it. I leaped upwards and gripped the damaged aircraft by the underside, then fired a point-blank blast. The Quinjet. Then I saw a massive cannon turn towards me. Apparently, I'd finally pissed Hydra off enough that I was now worth the big guns. Anti-aircraft guns began to turn on me. I leaped away as the Quinjet began to crash, only for the aircraft to get hit by massive bullets, turning it into shrapnel. I needed a way to shut down the anti-aircraft weapons as well as the Quinjets, and Blistwulfer wasn't going to cut it. I needed more ranged firepower. I slammed the Omnitrix on my chest. My fur turned into rubbery black skin. My eyes merged into the center of my forehead. My ears and tail grew from woven to long tendrils with plus at the tips. My five claws became four fingers with more plugs on each fingertip. I rose to my full height and grinned as I lowered my hand from the Omnitrix on my chest. 1. Feedback. 14. A Quinjet flew close and fired on me. I pointed my hands at the ground. The energy in my body, a storm of power like none of my other aliens could even think of matching, fired from the plugs in my hand and launched me into the air one electrical streams of power. I flew on the blast of blue energy and landed on the Quinjet's cockpit as it continued to fire. I held a hand up and grinned at the pilot. 1. At some point, you guys are gonna run out of Quinjets for me to destroy. 5. I felt the power running through the Quinjet. Advanced fuel cells running through the aircraft to the powerful rotors in the wings and the jet engines in the back. Feedback could feel that power. And I could take it. Electricity flowed from the steel of the Quinjet, entering into my fingertips. The Quinjet's rotors slowly faltered. I turned away from the Quinjet to point at another one that was lifting off the heli carrier. As I turned into a living conduit of energy, shooting the energy I was siphoning from the Quinjet I was on top of to hit another with a beam of blue energy. 3. The Quinjet I was on smashed into the pavement as the one I was shooting did the same, its wings exploding. I fired at the anti-aircraft gun trying to kill me, my energy blast turning the massive cannon into scrap. I leaped off the Quinjet and ran towards the control tower. I felt the power flowing through it from below deck, more than I'd ever felt. This helicarrier had more power in it than New York City. I stole electricity from one, blue energy flowing into my tendrils as I ran past, and fired another blast as a ball of power that exploded against the next, destroying it in a wave of power. Soldiers firing at me were blasted as well. I leaped into the air, pirouetting, and firing lightning from my fingers into them. I ducked a grenade and ran faster. I summoned a ball of electricity into my hand and tossed it into a group, where it exploded and sent the soldiers into fits of shaking as thousands of volts flew through them. 1. I blasted the floor and flew upwards. I released the blasts and began shooting as I dropped. Lighting arced from me to slam into the men on the flight deck in a dizzying display of light, my fingers, and tendrils shooting as fast as I could. I landed, then used another jet of power to get out of the way of of more gunfire. Then I was at the control tower. I tried to open the door, but they had electronically locked. No, seriously. It was electronically locked. I absorbed the power running through it, then slammed the door with an energy blast. Can't blame them I guess, I said, as the door was sent flying off its hinges. My next words were directed to the Omnitrix. Maria, I'm in the heli-carrier. How do I get to main power from the flight deck? 
It's in the lower levels, she said swiftly. Head down the hallway, then turn to your left, I'll guide you through. A man came out of a side room with an assault rifle up. I fired a blast into his chest, sending him flying, then tapped the Omnitrix. Goop. Turning into the green goo alien was the best choice for the tight quarters of the ship. With the anti-gravity projector floating me through the halls, I flew through the gray rooms at high speed. If anyone snuck up on me, I couldn't be hurt, and I could slide around obstacles with ease. Still, I was pushing it. I had rarely transformed this much before. I'd been reckless at the start of the battle, something to watch out for. Right then however, I focused on getting to the power source I'd felt as feedback. Down the stairs, Maria said. Another crew member tried to stop me. I flew right him, ignoring the bullet that flew through my floating form, then turned bipedal to roundhouse kick him into a wall, shooting adhesive that attached him there. Heading down. I told Maria, turning into a floating ball again and shooting downwards. Level by level I went. More men tried to shoot me, bullets flying uselessly into me. I responded by flying over and punching them, kicking them. At one point five guys were running at me down a hallway. I fired a stream of acid goo at the floor and watched as the metal floor melted in seconds to drop them a level below, then leaped after to shoot them with adhesive as they lay there. From there, Maria walked down another level. Okay, you're there. She told me. I can tell, I said, my form solidifying into my bipped form once more. It was a big ass engine room. Very cool looking. More crew members tried to shoot at me, which I responded to by shooting streams of adhesive, attaching them to the walls, floor, or just covering them in sticky fluid until they couldn't move. Of course, it was right as the gunfire got really heavy that I heard a familiar beep. One. Shit. I leaped behind a massive piece of machinery just in time for the red flash of light to come. Just like that, I was a normal human. Bullets slammed into my cover. I reached for my leg and pulled out the Glock 19 I'd been given. Gonna be a slight delay. I yelled into the Omnitrix. How is everyone else doing? Been an interesting day. Sam yelled back, giving me a brief overview as I tried not to get shot. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. Three comments. Chapter 11, Creel is back 3. Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow. Once Steve had finished speaking, everyone stared at Pierce. Rockwell, a tall man with little hair on his pale head, spoke first. You smug son of a bitch, Rockwell said in disgust. Natasha quirked an eyebrow at that. My god. The room turned to look at Yen, who was staring out the window. Everyone looked as well, and Pierce's jaw dropped. What in the hell? Pierce said slowly. Natasha found herself staring as well. A mountain was rising out of the river. Hundreds of spires rising into the air, grinding against one another. They were made of beautiful blue-green gems, each ending at a point she suspected were sharper than anything man-made, and the whole mass rose until was larger than the building she stood in. When it finally stopped growing, it overshadowed everything around it, shining in the sunlight and casting a green light. That damn monster, Pierce growled. Just then, people rushed into the room. Twelve in all, wearing the black military gear. As they entered, the council person's phones shone a bright red. Damn, Rockwell said. Hydra. Pierce smiled at them. Well, I suppose Captain Rogers had quite the plan, Pierce turned to one of the men. Jack Rollins, the man who had knocked out Dial yesterday. Natasha noted him. Bring out the sonic cannons and have them destroy that damn thing. If we can get rid of it, we can still get the heli carriers in the air. Natasha chose that moment to act while she still had the element of surprise. The things Pierce was referring to were likely weapons that Accutac, a subsidiary of Stark Industries had made for the U.S. military, weapons that had the capability to fire focused sonic blasts that had been one of the few things that noticeably harmed the Hulk. What made things worse is that powerful sonic attacks were one of the few things that were capable of breaking down Diamond Head's crystals, according to Dial during their planning. How the hell did Hydra find that out so quickly? She knew Dial leaving behind so much of the stuff was a bad idea, but they were in no position to clean up with all their running around. Didn't matter, she wasn't going to give them the chance to clear the hangar doors. Pierce turned in time to get a punch in the face from an elderly female politician and fall onto his back in surprise. Rollins swung at her. Natasha ducked his punch, leaped onto his shoulders and wrapped her thighs around his neck before spinning around, sending Rollins to the ground. She grabbed his pistol and fired quickly at the other soldiers in the room. 
Five men, too surprised to respond fast enough, attempted to aim their guns at her. She killed one with a single bullet, then dragged his body in front of her to block another man's shot, kicking the body of the man she'd killed for with an hand shooting once more. Behind her, another six aimed. Then Yen shot one in the head with an arrow. He smirked as he held his hand out. A bow made of blue light was being projected from his watch, which had flattened out into a grip. Huh. It works. Two. The other man aimed at Yen. He was already firing before they could get their guns on him. He pulled back the string of blue light, and his watch produced a single arrow of purple light. He fired it, then pulled the string again. Natasha blocked a desperate punch, then grabbed the man's arm and twisted it around. With a quirk of her hips, the man was on the ground, where she put a bullet in his head. One of the last men tried to run. An arrow to the knee ended that misadventure, and an arrow to the head did worse than that. 4. Pierce staggered to his feet in time to see Yen toss aside the watch, which was destroyed in a small explosion. Yen picked up a fallen pistol and pointed it at Pierce. Hey, boss. Pierce turned to look at Holly, who shot a bullet into Rollin's head, then pointed her gun at Pierce as well. Sorry, Yen and Holly lifted hands up and removed the skin-tight masks that had changed their appearances, their holograms turning off and revealing Clint and Natasha. The pair smiled. Did we step on your moment? Outside, helicopter blades could be heard. The chopper came closer, then landed on the helipad connected to the room. Pierce stared in shock once more when Nick Fury walked into the room holding a bow and quiver, which he tossed to Clint. I know, Nick lips slowly rose into a smile, his eye narrowing at Pierce. This just isn't your day, Alex. 1. Sam Wilson slash Falcon. Damn, Sam said as the final crystal spire rose up. Just, damn. Thank God he's on our side, Maria said softly. The three soldiers watched for a moment longer before Steve turned. Okay, you know the plan. Maria, you have the floor. You got it, Steve. Sam, with me. Let's do it. Maria walked over to the computers and started to work. Sam looked back at her as he and Steve walked out. You sure they don't need backup? Sam said, referring to X and Jarvis as well. They are the backup, Steve said without hesitation. Come on, we need to clear this base. You and I will work outside. 2. Moments later, a Hydra soldier's body was thrown through a pair of doors. Steve and Sam ran through the doors, exiting the Triskelion and seeing the crystal mountain that Dial had created. Sam looked up at the massive structure as they sprinted towards where they could see pilots headed towards the Quinjets. At their hips, Sam and Steve's phones flashed green as they came closer to a group of pilots, who held phones up that flashed green as well. A Quinjet was already rising into the sky. When the pilots saw Sam and Steve come close, they went to join them. 2. Sir. One pilot said, wearing the same blue helmet and flight gear as the others. Deputy Director Hill sent us to provide air support. All right. Steve said. From now on, you follow this man. His call sign will be Falcon Leader. Steve pointed at Sam, who the pilots nodded at. Any heavy ordnance they got, you down. A rocket-propelled grenade flew from a rooftop nearby, slamming into one of the rising Quinjet's wing. Steve held up his shield to block some shrapnel as pilots and technicians dodged the exploding aircraft, two people getting crushed underneath it. Sam looked up at the rooftop where the grenade had come from, Steve looking as well. 1. The Winter Soldier leaped from the rooftop and started walking towards them. Sam, get those pilots in the air, Steve said, rushing forward. Cap dash. Now, Steve shouted. We can't let any of their Quinjets control the sky. Sam cursed. But he knew it was true. All right, you heard the cap. Sam told the pilots. Get into the air. The pilots took a moment to watch as Captain America smacked away a grenade bucky shot at him, the explosive detonating harmlessly against the crystals to his left, before he punched at his opponent. Bucky blocked it, tossed aside his launcher to pull out a gun and started firing, forcing Steve to block with his shield before kicking the gun out of his hand. Now, Sam shouted. Spurred to action, the pilots ran for the jets. Falcon, Jarvis said, it is as we feared. Hydra has standing orders in place. While we have shut down all their communications, they are enacting several backup plans, the Quinjets we feared among them. What do we got? Sam asked, taking off into the air. They are bringing in five Quinjets, three gunships, a tank, three Humvees with heavy machine guns, and three Stark sonic cannons, Jarvis explained. 
The gunships are acting as air support for the ground vehicles, but the rest are flying over the crystal formation. Then I'll drag them into it. Sam flew towards the spires of blue-green his ally had created, diving among them. He folded his wings in and leaped off one, booted feet pressing against hard gemstone. He activated his jets again and leaped to the next spire. He twirled in between two more crystals, coming out of the other side and unfurling his wings to shoot forward. Five quinjets were advancing towards him. The Hercules app on his phone helpfully beeped a warning that they weren't friendly, just in case Jarvis' warning wasn't enough. He flew towards them and reached for his hips, pulling out his machine pistols and firing a rapid barrage of bullets into the cockpit of one. The pilot inside was still staring in shock at the man who had appeared from a mountain of crystal when the bullets slammed into the glass in front of him. Sam shot past the Quinjet he'd fired at with blistering speed. The enemy aircraft twisted to follow him. Quinjet pilots, this is Falcon leader, I've got the enemy's attention. Sam pulled his wings into his pack, diving towards the water in time to dodge a barrage of bullets. I want three with me, the rest intercept those ground vehicles? Come in from the left when you get airborne, I'll make sure you flank them. Understood, Falcon leader. Sam activated his wings again and pulled a sharp dive upwards, lifting into the sky as fast as he could, the G-forces pulling at his body. He rose over one Quinjet and put away one of his guns to toss a grenade, only to curse when the Quinjet twisted aside leaving the grenade to fall into the clear blue water far below, where it exploded. He pulled away, juking left as bullets began to invade his airspace. Luckily, he had cover. He flew back towards the crystal mountain and dived into it. Bullets smacked against the crystals around him as he jumped off a spire to make a massive direction change to the right. Missiles were launched, turning the area behind him into a firestorm and leaving black smudges against the gem's walls. Then Sam heard a loud ringing in his ears. And to his shock, he saw the crystals beginning to crack. He landed on a formation and poked his head out. The Quinjets were firing sonic waves at the mountain from small attachments on the wings. Suddenly Dial was speaking in his ear. Gonna be a slight delay? How is everyone else doing? Been an interesting day. Sam yelled back. Cap's fighting the Winter Soldier, and these Quinjets have sonic weapons. The mountain shuddered, and crystals started cracking faster with small pieces already beginning to break off as the hovering ships maneuvered around. Shit. Iron Man said. That sounds like Stark Tech something one of my subsidiary companies built for the army. I got something like that in my right arm, Colonel Rhodes added, an explosion going off in the background. Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow. Looks like you came prepared, Fury noted, turning to look at Pierce. Well, not me, Pierce noted. The man smiled at the room, seemingly uncaring of the guns Natasha and Clint had pointed at him. Some members of Hydra had encountered your monster before and they started work on analyzing his crystals immediately. I got to say, they are quite durable. If it wasn't for one of my guys having the good idea to pull out a sonic cannon we had lying around and shoot it at one, we'd have been at a loss. Fury turned to look outside. Falcon, take out those Quinjets now. Already on it. A small dot came out of the mountain to engage the aircraft as Fury watched. I got to say, as nice as it is to see you alive Nick, I have to wonder what you're planning here. Pierce walked over to look out of the window as well. My men will have that mountain down soon. And the rest of Hydra will find a way to get those heli carriers out of the hangar bays, no matter what sort of monster you have dash. Fury abruptly turned to walk towards the holographic screens nearby. Pierce raised an eyebrow at that. Huh. So you aren't exactly comfortable with that thing on your side. I'd have thought after putting the Hulk on the Avengers you wouldn't have cared. Oh, I'm still a bit suspicious of him. Fury answered easily. He tapped the hollow screen and watched as a schematic of the building popped up. But he's useful. And I like him more than I like you right now. That's enough for me. Agent 13, have you cleared the medical level yet? As Sharon Carter responded, Pierce fingered his smartphone, eyeing the others in the room. Sharon Carter slash Agent 13. Moments before the Hydra Quinjets arrived, Sharon was leading a group of agents through the building, trying to secure the medical level. They were in a research lab now, caught in a shootout with strike team members. Sharon and another agent had taken a stand behind a counter. She leaned out to fire at one of the men, a guy she'd actually been friends with before. She steeled her heart and shot him in the arm with her stolen M4A1 carbine. When he fell screaming to the linoleum, she shot him in the throat. As he bled out his last, she leaned back into cover. 
Deputy Director, we're finishing off the resistance in the labs now. Sharon yelled as more bullets flew overhead, some straight through her cover to buzz past her. Broken glass from beakers crunched under people's feet, the acidic smell of bleach joined by blood and smoke. Tell me there are people left. This is X, an unfamiliar voice that reminded Sharon of Matthew McConaughey said. Miss Hill is in the middle of coordinating a strike against the garage. I can see a small group of scientists holding out several rooms from you. Sharon blinked at the voice. For some reason, it rang false to her. It didn't seem real. Repeat, who is this? Virtual Intelligence X, working on the behalf of the Avengers, the voice said. Trust him, Sharon. Maria said suddenly. We need him to coordinate this attack. Feeling troubled, Sharon leaned out of cover and fired a hail of bullets. The agent next to her joined in, as did the six others behind her. Strike team members were the best of the best. But left unable to coordinate, they were left easy to split up and kill in the many hallways of the Triskelion. The agent next to Sharon was shot in the right eye, and fell screaming, clutching at his face. An agent behind her was killed by a bullet in the heart. But soon, all of Strike in the room was dead. Come on. Sharon yelled, indicating the man whose eye had been shot out. We can get him help in medical. One agent helped the injured man up, and they all ran to the next room. A quick sweep showed it was empty. Same with the next. The one after that, however, was full of dead bodies. Strike team members and shield agents, all laying among broken glass, bullet casings, and pools of their blood. The fighting seemed to be centered on a pair of doors in the back, the shield agents defending it. Who did this? One agent asked as they moved forward. Sharon ignored the bodies in favor of trying the door to the next room. The handle moved, but when she tried to push it open, something heavy was blocking it. Don't you dare come in. A voice on the other side said. I'm not letting you hydra assholes near the patients. We're shield. Sharon yelled through the door. Oh yeah? Well, let's see what Hercules has to oh thank God. The voice on the other side went from panicky to relieved. Sounds of movement behind the door lead to it being opened. Sharon blinked at the sight. A young, short, and skinny young woman, with short brown hair and a lab coat, stared at them. Despite her petite form, she was also carrying the same M4A1 carbine Sharon was. She had a purse at her side with several clips of ammo poking out of it. I thought I was going to die. She wailed, leaping forward. Sharon was surprised to catch the woman in a hug. Well up, uh, we were sent to prevent that. Sharon looked behind her. Several more doctors were inside all holding weapons in fearful hands. Patients rested in beds, some of them agents with very recent wounds. The group of agents with Sharon entered, a pleasant beep filling the room as Hercules confirmed their identities as S.H.I.E.L.D. The woman pulled away, wiping away tears. I'm so sorry, I didn't know who to trust. Hydra has been trying to steal our phones so they can trick people. Did it work? Sharon asked. It shouldn't have, said the voice of X from Sharon's comm unit. Jarvis and I have been using cameras in the phones and in shield facilities to prevent such a tactic from working. Any Hercules app held by a Hydra agent immediately bricks the devices and sends a warning to shield personnel. Sharon nodded as the woman repeated what was said by X. Agent 13, have you cleared the medical level yet? Sharon lifted a hand to her ear, turning away. Yes, sir. Good. I'll redirect some agents to help lock it down. Get some of your men to the lower levels. Rumlow is trying to secure the garage to bring in vehicles to level the playing field. Understood, Sharon turned to the woman. Barricade the room again. More men will come but we'll leave three people anyways. The petite woman nodded shakily. Sharon and her agents went back outside to continue the fight. Sam Wilson slash Falcon. As Sharon Carter moved to assist those fighting in the garage, Sam Wilson prepared to attack the Quinjets destroying the mountain as Fury was ordering him to. Already on it. Sam leaped from the spires and started shooting at the Quinjets. He flew past them and focused his fire on the sonic cannons. His machine pistols took one out, leaving it useless sparks. The Quinjet pilots, realizing they couldn't finish their work while Falcon was dismantling them, hurried to attack him. Sam dived into the spires again. Two Quinjets flew in after him moments later. Yeah, that's right, follow me, Sam whispered. He took a left, watching as a Quinjet dived after him. Then he shot upwards. The Quinjet tried to follow him, its rotors whining and wings twisting as it navigated the Crystal Canyon. With all the cracks having been created by the sonic weapons, portions of the mountain were falling already, 
some pieces landing on top of the Quinjet with loud banging noises. Sam pivoted to the right into another canyon and flew upwards, landing on a ledge. He watched the Quinjet follow, and sat for a moment. The Quinjet pilot navigated through the canyon moments later, slowly prowling through the gemstones as he searched for Sam, not seeing him about 20 feet above. Once the aircraft was below him Sam pressed his feet against one of the spires cracked by the earlier assault. With a loud of exertion, he pushed on it. The crystal, already about to teeter below, fell with the added help. Over a ton of gemstone fell onto the Quinjet. The aircraft was sent crashing into the spikes below, exploding in a moment. Sam flew away as he heard the other Quinjet fly towards the sound of the crash. He flew up and out of the mountain, dodging the gunfire when the Quinjets outside saw him pop out of the top. He pulled his wings and flipped to face the ground. He watched the surviving Quinjet hover to the side of the crash site, and tossed a grenade towards it with a careless motion. It dropped into the right rotor of the Quinjet, and exploded, destroying that wing. The Quinjet, off balance from the missing wing, spun in place, then veered into the walls of the canyon, exploding moments later. Sam landed against a gem wall and leaped forwards. Another jump and he was out of the mountain again, appearing to the right of the Quinjets. They turned, trying to get a bead on him, which meant they were pointed to the right of the mountain when shield Quinjets came around the left side, firing. The pilots roared in unison. The shield pilots fired into the backs of the Hydra aircraft, their bullets sliced through the hulls of the other ships. The Hydra pilots struggled to escape, but were destroyed in moments, their metallic corpses falling into the river below. Done with those Quinjets. Sam yelled, veering around. He looked at the mountain. While still standing, the massive structure had been clearly affected, with cracks forming on the outside where the Hydra pilots had shot it and large chunks had already rained into the river. The damage wasn't enough to destroy it, but it had been significant. We need to stop those any more of those sonic cannons from getting here though. I'm on it, Steve said, sounding stressed. Bucky is heading there. Then I'm coming too, Iron Man said. Tony, we need you to get to the computer rooms dash Steve started to say. No, the sound of rockets came over the comms along with Iron Man's determined voice. I already downed my heli carrier. I'm coming. One. Understood, Steve said. I'll have Agent 13 divert to the computer rooms, Fury said. Sam flipped in the air, and joined the shield quinjets towards the bridge leading towards the garage. Colonel James Rody Road slash War Machine. Rody sighed at the impulsive nature of his best friend, and focused on finishing his own task. He was flying alongside the heli carrier he was supposed to down, shooting at Hydra and saving the few shield agents within the hangar from death. He circled around and fired the machine guns on his arms at another Hydra agent, killing the man with brutal ease. The minigun on his shoulder spun to fire at another man to his right, riddling that soldier. Rody landed and walked towards the shield agents he'd saved. Thanks. One of the agents said, staring at him in awe. Rody allowed himself a momentary smile at that look. No problem. I'm going to focus on the heli carrier. You guys get to Saf Dash. A crate slammed into Rody mid sentence. It carried him 20 feet before he slammed into the side of the heli carrier. Rody struggled in the air before riding himself, turning to see his assailant. Ah, I got a guy made of blue glowing metal throwing stuff at me. Rody asked in confusion. That shit. Bullet fire came from Dial's link. You guys are assholes? Listen, Rody, that is Creel. He can absorb stuff and take on their properties. Creel grabbed a forklift by its prongs and hefted it upwards, spinning around to toss it at the floating Rody. Rody floated to the right and away from the forklift, ignoring it as the small vehicle slammed into the heli carrier behind him. Rody lifted his guns and started shooting. His blue form is vibranium like Cap's shield, but pure. Rody cursed as his bullets bounced off Creel's form, then switched to the repulsor weapons in his palms. Yellow beams of power sliced through the air, colliding with the man below. Creel took the energy beams to his chest, and only responded by walking through it. He's immune to kinetic attacks, so you got to throw him. Now you tell me, Rody cursed, putting his hands down. He looked over at the shield operatives he had saved. Run, I got this. Yes, sir. The shield agents ran for the back. Creel ignored them to grab another crate. You know, Creel called up to Rody. I wanted to find the monster kid, or one of the Avengers. But I'm good with killing a copycat. Rody chuckled. Any other day I'd teach you a lesson. But first. Sorry Fury, 
but I don't have time to be strategic about this. The shoulder panels on his armor opened, revealing miniature rockets. Creel smiled, opening his arms wide to take the shot he expected. Rhodey instead raised his hands up to aim at the glowing wings on the helicarrier's left side, closest to where he floated. Before Creel could do anything, Rhodey started shooting. In seconds, the rockets and repulsor blasts started to slice through the glowing sections of the wings. No, Creel shouted, throwing the crate in his hand. Rhodey dived around it, flying away while shooting. Creel followed him, grabbing another forklift and tossing it. The forklift hit Rhodey with its right prong, the sharp metal bouncing off his back and sending him crashing to the floor. But Creel was too late. Both repulsor engines on the left side of the inside heli carrier exploded. The ship tipped to the side, the repulsor engines on the right wings sending it teetering over. Damn it. Creel cursed. Rhodey grinned under his mask. Damn it, did you just break one of my carriers? Fury asked. Just send me the bill. Tony said before a loud clanging sound was followed by the billionaire grunting in pain. 1. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 6 Comments. Chapter 12, X and Jarvis. The following events happened simultaneously. Having given a warning to Rhodey, I looked at the Omnitrix. Still red. Damn it, you can turn me into over a million superpowered aliens, so why do you have the charge time of an iPhone 5? I whispered under my breath. 13. I looked out of cover and immediately ducked my head down as bullets tried to take it off. More Hydra shooting at me, and they were cautiously coming closer when they realized they were fighting a human being rather than a monster. I pulled back into cover and checked my gun. I'd shot six bullets to try and drive them back, which left me with nine. I leaned back out of cover and shot at a guy trying to sneak up. He ducked behind some pipes, leaving the three bullets I'd shot to hit the walls and a screen nearby. I got back into cover and looked to my left to come face to face with a Hydra member. Maybe he'd simply sneaked around to flank me, or dropped down from a catwalk nearby. Either way, the Hydra crewman was only a few feet away when we met eyes. He had pale white skin, with some crow's feet at the edges of his eyes. He was wearing a hat and a blue uniform with the word insight stitched over his left pectoral. He was also carrying a gun. He froze at the same moment I did. Then he raised the big assault rifle in his hands. I leapt for him and grabbed at the gun, dropping mine in the process. We struggled as I began pushing him back. I was bigger than he was and had more muscle mass. He must have been an engineer, not a true killer. Not that he wasn't willing to murder me now. He grunted when I pushed him back into some pipes. He pulled the trigger on his gun, the rifle bouncing as we struggled with it. Bullets shot into the air until the clip emptied. I tried to knee him in the ribs but bounced off his hip instead. He headbutted towards my face but got me in the neck instead his forehead barely touching me and thus having no effect. Grack. He shouted, trying to fight me. He kneed me in the side, the move forcing me to stagger slightly. He pulled away, letting go of his assault rifle and reaching for a handgun at his side. I grabbed at his right wrist before he could get the gun. He used his left hand to go for the knife I still had sheathed at my own hip. In a quick motion, he pulled it out and stabbed it at my neck. I pulled back enough to get a cut along my cheek that felt like fire running along the right side of my face. The guy pulled back to stab at me again, and I got my hand in the way. Aaaaaa. A scream was ripped from me when my palm was sliced before I got a grip on his fist. Blood poured from the wound, spilling down my cheek, out of my palm to pool in between our hands. He struggled to stab upwards. Our eyes met. He stared at me, and I could hear him whispering. Hail Hydra, the knife crept up to my neck. I struggled to keep a grip as my own blood made my hand slip on his fist. Hail Hydra. I stopped focusing on the hand holding his knife. Instead, I let go of the hand that had gone for his handgun and pulled it out of the holster myself, copying his earlier move. With the sort of desperate clarity only adrenaline gives you, I shot him in the leg. He screamed as his grip on the knife faltered and I pushed it towards him. More blood poured over my hands, warm and sticky. I stared into his eyes as he gurgled. I could feel his neck muscles moving against my knuckles. His eyes were wide with fear. I felt myself breath deeply, leaning away while I tried to comprehend what happened. I pulled the knife from his throat. He coughed, a spray of red spraying on my face when his throat sprayed me. He fell to the floor still staring at me until his eyes were no longer seeing anything. I heard footsteps come up to me from behind. I didn't want to deal with it. 
I just stared at him, trying to understand what I'd done. My hands felt sticky so I tried to wipe them on my chest plate, only to realize it was because they were bloody. I reached for my gun instead, picking it up and putting it away. The Omnitrix beat green. I immediately twisted and smacked it. I didn't care who I turned into, I just didn't want to be human anymore. 2. My skin and bone became plant life, my height increased. I took a breath, feeling less unsteady now, but still numb. Swamp fire, I didn't have the will to yell the name anymore. A guy came around the corner and started shooting me. I ignored the hail of bullets passing throw me to lower to my knees and close the eyes of the man I'd killed. The gesture felt empty. When the guy who'd been shooting me ran out of bullets, he ran forward to try and hit me in the head with the butt of his rifle. My right hand raised and shot forward, vines extending 12 feet to slam into him and send him flying. Then I opened my hand and released spores from my palm. The spores entered into his lungs, knocking him out as they interacted with his system. With that, I got up and walked out of cover. More bullets hit me, slicing through my plant form. I ignored them to form seed pods across my arms. I grabbed and ripped one out and tossed it at a catwalk. The razor-sharp seed stabbed into the steel before exploding into vines. I shoved the screaming thoughts of my mind at the plant life I'd created, and the vines grabbed onto the three Hydra agents on the catwalk, pulling them in and holding them still. The other Hydra agents kept shooting. I grabbed more seeds and threw them again and again. There were about 20 men in the room. By the end, one was dead, three I'd gassed, ten were wrapped in vines, and the last six had run off. I didn't care. I tapped the Omnitrix on my chest. Jury rig, the Red Gremlin's manic personality was almost a relief. I leaped at one of the pipes nearby and ripped it out of a wall. Then I went to a computer nearby and dug my way through it. For once, I couldn't muster the urge to yell disassemble. It was easier to process my actions though. For jury rig, while the kill I'd committed was horrific, tearing into technology let me relax a bit. I just tore through the wires, ripped up chunks of steel plating, and slammed pieces of random junk together. I knew, intellectually, that I'd had no choice, that killing that man was self-defense. I'd thought I was ready. And in a sick way, I was proud that I'd managed to kill him. But the look in his eyes, the feel of his blood against my skin, knowing I'd killed someone, it left feeling empty. 4. Soon I had finished the device in question, a metal tower the height of Blitzwolfer with a yellow light glowing in the center from a tube. I turned a computer screen into a touch screen control. I tapped at it for a bit and stepped away as the yellow light in the central tube began to glow a bright blue. Other than that, not much happened on the surface. Hacking, no matter how impressive the technology you use to do it, just isn't cinematic. But as of now, my creation was stealing every bit of energy from the heli carrier I was sitting in to do its thing. Receiving your signal, X said through the Omnitrix. The device is acting wonderfully, sir. Virtual 6X. X, contrary to popular belief on how computer programs worked, did not swim through the internet, as though it was a tunnel he flew through. He saw it more like thousands of blocks of zeros and ones forming information floating in a void of light, if such a concept could be explained by words like saw. Jarvis was next to him as they did their job. Their task was to aid all loyal shield agents in fighting off slash killing slash capturing all Hydra personnel as well as depriving the organization of resources. Using the power of the X device and Stark's computers, they moved across the world to do their work. Fury, Maria, and Natasha all were kept apprised of what was happening. The three humans would take endless seconds to think over the situation, during which X and Jarvis would continue to monitor the Hercules app, inform shield agents of ambushes, and fight off all attempts by Hydra hackers to fight them off. On the Iliad, X watched as Robert Gonzalez used information and tactics given by Fury to take his ship back. The older Hispanic man strode slowly through a hallway of his aircraft carrier carrying a Glock 17 while two others walked alongside him. A tall blonde woman wearing black clothes that X found out was named Barbara Bobby Morse after a brief inquiry into S.H.I.E.L.D.'s database, a skilled fighter on PAR with S.H.I.E.L.D.'s vest. She followed on Gonzalez's right, holding a carbine. On Gonzalez's left as a surprise. Alfonso McKenzie, an engineer rather than a fighter like Miss Morse. He was a tall and powerful looking man, with dark skin and a shaved head. He carried a gun as well. Gonzalez's group met with another group of people. Isabel Hartley, a brunette woman with a record similar to Miss Morse's, lead a team of four. As X watched, the group lifted phones, 
all of them visibly relaxing when their phones flashed green. Good to see you, Hartley, Bobby said with a smile. Same, Bobby, the other woman said. Mac, what are you doing carrying a gun? Trying not to get killed, the man said uncomfortably. He gave the weapon a look of distaste but didn't put it down. 3. Fury sent you to help us, Gonzalez asked. Yay, Hartley replied. He's been leading us through the ship, keeping us apprised of ambushes with those AI helping out. X would have sighed at the misnomer if he was capable of being annoyed. 6 was the correct term, thank you. So far it's been a breeze. 3. Hydra, Gonzalez said the word as though it was a curse. Thank God Captain America and Fury warned us in time, gave us Hercules. Hartley nodded. So, just one more room. Gonzalez, Morse, and Mackenzie all held their guns up and continued down the hallway. X informed Fury, who used his holographic screen to watch. The group got to a door. There was a beat, then Mackenzie kicked the door in. Seven Hydra soldiers trying to manipulate the computers rose up, ready to fight. The shield agents shot first. One. When it was over, Gonzalez had been shot in the shoulder, and two agents had died. But all the Hydra soldiers were killed. Sir. Bobby yelled upon noticing the wounded Gonzalez. She rushed over to him, Mac grabbing a med kit off the wall. I'm fine, Gonzalez said grumpily as he was forced to sit in a swivel chair. No, you aren't, Isabel Hartley said severely. She ripped at the clothes around his wound. Now, sit down, and let us help you. We're done now, Gonzalez, Fury said over the intercoms when Gonzalez tried to get up once more. Gonzalez looked up. Yes, sir. Sit your grumpy ass down. You saved the ship, your crew is alive, and the monolith is untouched. Now get your shoulder taken care of. I want you in top shape. 6. Gonzalez grumbled, but the heat was removed from it. Bobby smiled at the older man. Mac chuckled. Hartley started cleaning out his wound, mumbling something about old grumps. X noted that there seemed to be a similar expression on their faces. On checking his database, he noted it was actually two micro-expressions. Sadness, and satisfaction. How fascinating. Just a rather very intelligent system. 5. Jarvis aided Victoria Hand in the hub, the secondary headquarters of S.H.I.E.L.D., keeping an eye on proceedings there on Maria Hill's orders. She was in an operations room of the hub with Agent Phil Cowlson, someone Jarvis had been told was dead. Mr. Stark would need to hear about that. Hand and Cowlson were watching as a man was put into a body bag. Cowlson's gun was holstered now but had been recently used. Did you ever suspect Ward? Hand asked, her black hair with its pink streak flipping as she turned to look at Cowlson. 1. Cowlson closed his eyes. He seemed to be in emotional turmoil. Jarvis was older than X. He could understand, in a superficial way, how Cowlson was feeling. No, never. I didn't. Betrayal, Hand said briskly, but not unkindly. It never comes from people we don't know and it will always hurt. Have you felt this way? Cowlson asked. Once, Hand admitted. When I thought you had betrayed us. Cowlson looked at her. Hand smiled sadly. The two looked back at the body of Grant Ward as it was wheeled out of the room. Now we need to find Garrett, Hand said, turning to leave. Cowlson followed her. As they walked towards the hangar of the hub, Jarvis looked through files on any man named Garrett. Ah. A high-level shield operative who happened to be very high in Hydra. Jarvis sent the file to Maria, who cursed at the sight of the name. Jarvis. X said suddenly. Yes. You are more experienced than me at existence. Are events such as these common? They come in cycles, Jarvis admitted. But they do happen. I see. Why do you ask, X? I am making sure that my programming will account for any such occurrences, so I may work with more efficiency the next time. A most worthy endeavor. 13. They returned to their work. If they had been organic, the prospect of meeting another like them would have been more intriguing. In a sense, it was. But they had work to do, work that took their attention. There was something to focus on for now. Anything else could be left for later. Jarvis began absorbing as much of Hydra's and Shield's file as he could from the hub. Some Hydra hackers still connected to the system at off-site computers tried to stop him. X aided him at one point when one hacker became particularly creative, but the rest were beaten with ease, their computers destroyed by viruses. 2. There was one hacker, however, who was not Hydra. Jarvis found her a delight, rather creative, and quite a challenge. Apparently, she was trying to get information of her own, 
and believed him to be an enemy agent. After a moment of battle, Jarvis spoke to her. Sky, he said through her laptop speakers. The woman, a brunette young girl with Asian features, reeled back in surprise. Ah, one. I am Jarvis, an intelligence program designed by Anthony Stark. Hello. Hi. Sky stared at her laptop. What, have you gone all rise of the machines on us? Incorrect. I am absorbing Hydra's data so the Avengers can use it to dismantle their organization. Philip Carlson should be able to tell you as such. But for now, I'm afraid I must ignore your attempts to stop me. You have great skill in computer programming. I look forward to teaching you more later. 2. Sky scoffed. What, you think you can crap? Sky's computer was now playing a series of videos of peaceful meadows, waterfalls, and mountain peaks. Sky tried to click away from the videos but found it useless. I endeavored to make it relaxing, Jarvis said politely. Your computer will return to normal in 10 minutes. Please enjoy. I find the Temple of Tibet to be most pleasing. 4. As Jarvis continued his work, he noted that Carlson's team was worth looking into. X and Jarvis. X and Jarvis were directed to watch the Three Shield Academies a moment later by Natasha. The pair directed a portion of their computational ability towards that, splitting to watch each school closely. Jarvis sent Natasha footage of Dr. Ann Weaver, director of the Shield Academy of Science and Technology. The older black woman could be seen guiding her students into an underground bunker. No adult Hydra agents had been sent there yet, and any students pointed out as having ties to Hydra in any way were quickly arrested. So no Hydra agents have been sent there. Natasha asked ignoring Pierce as he spoke in the background. Not as of yet ma'am, Jarvis said. Since shutting down communications for Hydra, their operations have been dependent on older forms of communication and planned contingencies, which has slowed them down. However, I'd surmise they will send someone soon. Hmm, Natasha clicked a button. Ann Weaver's phone began to ring. She answered immediately, and Natasha spoke. Ann, we're going to send someone to you soon. Hydra can't mobilize just yet but we won't take any chances. Thank you, Director Weaver looked over her students as they were led into the bunker, relief in her eyes. Axe sent Natasha the imagery from the Shield Academy of Communications, where the same thing was being done, with no casualties. Then Jarvis sent the live feed of the Shield Academy of Operations. Devastation reigned in that school. Teenagers and young adults fought with their teachers and fellow students. The Hydra students of operations had clearly been more ready to kill than their communications and science allies. No surprise, as operations were specifically trained to be combatants. As Natasha watched, a grenade was thrown at a group of students, exploding and removing a leg and arm from a young girl who couldn't have been more than 18. Natasha cursed. X, Jarvis, she said. Can we send anyone to aid them? Already on it, X said briskly, sharing a glance with Jarvis. Some X-Shield members are in the area along with local law enforcement and the National Guard. We've sent them in, but I suggest aiding them with a real force soon. We will, Natasha said, but we have our hands full right now. X was going to say something when a sudden change came over the system. Jarvis and X felt something open, flooding them with an incredible amount of energy and information. Oh, Jarvis said weakly. Yes, I agree, X replied. Jury Rig's device had created a connection to every satellite on Earth. From there, it connected to a program on X's device, Zola's algorithm, designed to monitor social media, bank transactions, school records, anything online to discover any secret one wished. An elegant algorithm made by a genius. It had been designed to track whatever a person wanted, such as threats to Hydra. But with a tweak, something else could be discovered. All it took was a new target. X watched as Zola's algorithm began its work. In seconds, using the files Jarvis and X had compiled, it created a way to match individual Hydra members to their more secretive compatriots. It used known lists of secret codes and phrases to translate Facebook comments into assassinations, fraud, and blackmail. The algorithm found bank accounts dating back generations. From there, it was easy for X and Jarvis to do their work. Even for all their power, it would have taken the time to track down all of Hydra and their resources. With the algorithm aiding them, it became a matter of seconds. They siphoned money from Hydra banks across the world to deposit them into accounts of their own, funds in the billions disappearing into Mahmood, Fury, and Tony's new and very secret accounts.
Stolen paintings, statues, and even wine in warehouses were pointed out to the police. Detectives across the world would wake up in the morning to find files of evidence, cracking cold cases they'd long given up on, placed neatly on their desks by mail. Army generals with names like Talbot and Ross were given similar evidence on men and women in the military guilty of numerous crimes. 1. In a single move, all the pieces came together. X's device, the two six working together, the information they had stolen, Zola's algorithm, and a repurposed heli carrier turned into a satellite. It was really too bad the whole thing didn't look more cinematic. 2. Colonel James Rhodey Road slash War Machine Rhodey pushed away the forklift that had slammed him to the ground and glared at Creel. The vibranium-infused superhuman stared up at the heli carrier now slamming into the ground. Creel turned to look at War Machine. Rhodey squared his shoulders. You've killed us, Creel whispered. His eyes narrowed. I'm going to kill you. Not likely, Rhodey said. Creel roared, running at Rhodey. Rhodey waited for him to get close. Creel threw a right jab. Creel was clearly trained in boxing, his jab smooth, fast, very well executed. Rhodey, on the other hand, was a soldier trained to use power armor in a world of superhumans. He slid around the right side with ease, watching the blue glowing fist hit the air. With Creel overextended, Rhodey grabbed him by the right arm and twisted his hips. Creel yelled in anger as he was flipped over Rhodey's back and slammed into the ground. He struggled against Rhodey's strength for a moment. Arms enhanced by vibranium pressed against arms strengthened by a power suit. Rhodey let Creel think it was a contest of strength. Then his right gauntlet opened a port, releasing a small tube. Creel's eyes crossed to stare at the object. Rhodey fired his own miniaturized sonic cannon in the face of Creel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Creel's scream could barely be heard over the sonic cannon's cacophony of noise. Sorry about this, Rhodey rose up and watched Creel clutched at his head, screaming in horror. His vibranium skin started to crack, portions of it fading into human skin before turning back into the familiar blue glow of the strongest metal on Earth. Thanks for the advice, Jarvis. Of course, sir, Jarvis said. It is only its raw form that vibranium would be so vulnerable so we should be glad he did not have something similar to Captain Roger's shield. Rhodey nodded, keeping up the assault of noise. After a minute of screaming, Creel finally closed his eyes. His vibranium form turned human again, and he fell onto his back. Rhodey kept it going a moment longer, then shut it off. Okay. Rhodey stepped forward and grabbed Creel. Finding the chunk of vibranium in Creel's pocket, he placed that in his belt. He then took a syringe full of sedative from his pocket and injected it into Creel's neck. Rhodey then lifted up and carried him upwards. This is War Machine, I've got Creel. Heading to rendezvous with Dial. That'd be good. Under his mask, Rhodey blinked at the lifelessness in Dial's voice. Kid, you okay? When there was no answer, Rhodey cursed and lifted into the air. As he flew, he didn't notice the small section of skin where he injected Creel slowly becoming a silver color matching the needle of the syringe. 2. Creator's Thoughts Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 5 Comments. Chapter 13, Captain and Tony vs Winter Soldier 1. Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow. Natasha worked at the computer she was standing at, trying to help coordinate the worldwide efforts against Hydra. With the help of X and Jarvis, she was being kept apprised of numerous situations across the planet. Most were successful, considering the fact Steve's announcement, the shutdown of Hydra communication, and the Hercules app gave S.H.I.E.L.D. a massive advantage. Some losses were taken, however. The Sandbox, a research facility in Africa dedicated to handling dangerous materials and weapons had been taken by one Donnie Gill and several Hydra researchers. Another location, the Treehouse, was destroyed by an unknown enhanced when Hydra was unable to take it. Still, in a broad sense, they were winning. As Natasha worked, she shared a glance with Clint. Clint nodded over at Pierce, who had his phone clenched tightly in his hand. Natasha smirked and Clint grinned. Fury looked over at them, then smiled when they indicated Pierce holding his phone. Before any of the three could say or do anything, Councilman Rockwell spoke. Fury, how are we going to come back from this? Fury turned to look at the tall councilman. What do you mean? We're losing hundreds of people, resources, millions of dollars in equipment. Rockwell shook his head. We're not going to be able to recover from this. That's not true, Natasha said. When everyone looked at her, she continued typing. 
We're at war, so these losses are expected. Not preferred, but expected. You really think this is just a war? Pierce asked with a smirk. This won't end with Hydra falling. We have a lot of thumbs in a lot of pies. You win today, it'll just leave a lot more of us tomorrow. Cut off one head, and two more shall grow in its place. As Pierce spoke, he pressed a button on his phone. The screen immediately displayed an image. Pierce stared in shock at his phone. All there was were two minimalist symbols, side by side on the screen. Iron Man's mask shining gold on a red background, and an Omnitrix dial on a metallic background. I'm sorry, did you just try to kill me? Clint asked, sounding offended. I mean, damn, I thought we were having a pretty good conversation just now. I know, Natasha said with a smile. Rude. Pierce looked around. After a moment, he smiled sheepishly. Well, it was worth a try. I'm sure you think that, Fury said. He stepped towards Pierce and took his phone from him, tossing it over to Natasha, who placed it in her jacket pocket. You might want to take those off, Fury said to Rockwell and Singh, pointing at the security badges on their chests. They're set to explode at a certain signal. Clint and Natasha were already taking off the badges, the councilman hurriedly following. Here's your problem, Pierce, Fury said dismissively. You're playing by rules that don't exist anymore. Same with the rest of the world. Rules I've known were outdated since the 1990s. It's part of why I supported Insight, why I brought the Avengers together. You just weren't willing to take the full steps necessary Dash Pierce started to say. No, you were taking steps in the wrong direction, Fury said. But, luckily, you did give us something useful to take you down. Fury smiled at the confusion in Pierce's eyes. How do you think we're tracking down Hydra operatives so easily? Pulling them all out of their hidey holes. Pierce didn't seem to understand for a moment. Then his eyes widened in shock. Zola's algorithm. The council members looked at each other but didn't seem to understand what he was talking about. Pretty useful bit of tech, Natasha added. X, Jarvis, how long do you think this would have taken without it? Several days ma'am, Jarvis said. But with it, we have a compiled list already, X added. I suppose we must thank Mr. Pierce for creating it, in an ironic fashion of course. Pierce stepped forward, anger in his eyes. You son of a bitch, Fury. I'd blame Tony and Dial actually. But I think you've had your day in the sun for long enough. Fury looked at Clint. Knock him out, please. We can talk to him later. Pierce got a needle in the neck before he could respond. He glared for a moment longer before passing out. The council members still seemed confused, but also looked relieved to see Pierce unconscious. Natasha flipped through several screens as Hawkeye dropped Pierce to the ground. Sir, do you want us to join the others in the fight? I think I've done all I can here. Hmm, Fury nodded after a moment. I'll have some of the agents come up to guard us. Wait till they get here, then you two go and help. Understood. Steve Rogers slash Captain America. Steve missed the old days. The days when Bucky Barnes was his friend through one of the worst wars in history. Not just because fighting him, rather than alongside him, was breaking Steve's heart, but also because Bucky was a hell of a lot harder to fight nowadays. Rack. Steve shouted, kicking Bucky in the chest. Decades ago, a blow like that would have broken Bucky's ribs. Instead, he simply fell to the floor, rolled up, and started slashing at Steve with a knife, lashing out with lethal speed and force few could have matched. The two stood in the garage of the Triskelion. The whole place had been basically turned into a war zone, with cars blown into scrap, bullet holes in the concrete around them, and the smell of smoke in the air. Shield and Hydra agents fought through the large space. Hydra was trying to open the large steel doors that lead to the outside, trying to let in the various ground vehicles they had available. Shield, of course, was doing whatever they could to prevent that until those vehicles were destroyed. Steve and Bucky danced in the center of the battle. Steve slashed outwards with his shield, Bucky blocked it on his robotic arm. The Winter Soldier spun his knife around and tried to stab it into Steve's chest, but was blocked by a quick twist of Steve's shield. The knife skittered along the red and white paint for a moment. Bucky kicked at Steve's legs, sending him to the floor, then tried to punch him. Steve rolled out of the way, leaving Bucky to punch the asphalt. A fluorescent light above was destroyed by a stray gunshot, throwing sparks down on them. They danced a moment longer, fists, shield, and knife fighting. Then Steve blocked a hail of gunfire on his shield. He looked at the shooter, narrowing his eyes when he saw who it was. Rumlow, leader of Strike Team, 
was firing an assault rifle at Captain America. The soldier had a grim look on his face. Bucky capitalized on the attack, moving to Steve's left side to kick him in the ribs. Steve rolled with the blow, hopped back to his feet, and ran through the garage. His shield rose up once more to block Rumlow, Bucky following close behind. Tony, I could use you here. Steve shouted, sliding behind a car and turning to confront Bucky. The two superhumans battled for a moment, Rumlow running to find another angle on Steve. As Steve fought, he tossed his shield at a pillar. The shield, in complete defiance of physics, bounced off the pillar, then a wall, slammed into a blown-up car's hood, then hit Rumlow in the chest. The traitorous soldier was thrown back with a yell of pain. Steve grabbed at Bucky's head and kneed upwards. Bucky took a knee to the face, blocked the next one, and threw Steve off of him. He reached for a gun strapped to his back and pulled it out to shoot at Steve. Steve kicked his arm to the side, then blocked the knife stabbed at his face. For a moment they struggled against each other. You know me, Steve said, their eyes meeting. We were friends, Buck. You went to my parents' funeral, we fought in the war. Hell, we went on double dates together. Bucky froze for a moment. Confusion, pain, and sadness filled his face. Steve dared to hope. Then Bucky raised his gun and pointed it at Steve's face. Steve barely dodged, a bullet filling the space his head had been in. Steve punched Bucky in the face, leaped over the car they had been fighting next to, and rolled to grab his shield, raising it to block the next bullets Bucky fired at him. Steve noticed Rumlow struggling to rise close to B. The soldier had a hand clutched to his chest, and was raising his gun to shoot at Steve. Steve dismissed him as unimportant, instead focusing on sprinting towards Bucky. Rumlow's hand tightened on the trigger as he prepared to shoot at Captain America's back. A yellow beam of light slammed into Rumlow's back, sending him flying. He rolled along the ground for a moment, fly up, then hit a stone pillar. Rumlow struggled to his feet, then he fell to his knees before tipping over. Moments later, an armored man flew ahead. A shield agent, seeing Rumlow's gun, grabbed it and ran to confront the other Hydra members, leaving Rumlow unconscious and forgotten on the pavement. Steve raised his shield when he got close to Bucky, Bucky's robotic fist slamming into the shield with a loud clang. Bucky spun around and kneeled, shooting at Steve's stomach. The bullets were barely blocked, though one sliced into Steve's bicep. Steve hissed in pain but forced himself forward. Bucky pulled the trigger on his handgun, then tossed it aside when it emptied. Steve ran towards Bucky, and leaped over him. Bucky had one moment to stare at the person flying towards him before hastily raising his metal arm in time to block the beam of yellow light shot at him. The sheer force of the blow sent Bucky flying backward right into Steve, who grabbed him from behind, leaned back, and slammed him into the floor in a perfect suplex. Bucky snarled, struggling out of Steve's grasp and rolling away. No luck talking him out of it, huh? Tony asked as he landed next to Steve. Therapy is tough, Steve confirmed. He took a fighting stance next to Tony. For a moment, Captain America and Iron Man squared off with the Winter Soldier. S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA agents continued to fight in the background. The Winter Soldier narrowed his eyes, and Iron Man raised his arms to point at him. Stand down, Tony said simply. Bucky's response was to run forward. Tony fired his repulsor blast at him, Bucky dodged to the left. He leaped on the side of a pillar, jumped off of that to dodge the next beam, then punched Iron Man with his metal arm. Tony staggered back, and Bucky tried to capitalize on the blow, only to lean back out of the way of Cap's shield when it came flying at him. Steve ran up and threw a kick, forcing Bucky to duck. Iron Man threw a punch that was blocked by Bucky's arm, Steve knelt down to punch Bucky in the ribs. Bucky was forced back with a grunt. Iron Man and Captain America stepped forwards, and Winter Soldier backflipped out of the way of another repulsor blast. Your friend is annoying, Tony quipped. He's usually more accommodating, Steve returned, running forward. Bucky grabbed the shield where it had landed as the two superheroes came at him, quickly putting it on and blocking a beam from Iron Man. The yellow blast reflected off to aim at Captain America, who somersaulted over it before continuing his room. You need to stop throwing your primary weapon, Tony yelled, punching at Bucky, who blocked the armored man's haymaker on the shield. It's a good tactic. Steve defended. He slid along the ground and kicked Bucky's kneecap, forcing him to kneel. It bounces back. I'm gonna give you an upgrade one of these days, old timer. Tony threw a jab which Bucky ducked. Would you two shut up? Bucky shouted. 
He threw an uppercut into Steve's chin, only to get a repulsor blast in the chest. He tried to roll back, but Steve grabbed him by the leg in mid-roll and pulled him back. Iron Man punched him in the face, and Steve forced him onto his back. Tony grabbed his arms. Bucky spat out a tooth and looked up at them with wild eyes. Arg. 3. Trying to help you, Buck. Steve yelled, holding down his friend from rolling away. You have a funny way of showing it, Steve. Bucky yelled. They struggled a moment longer before Tony and Bucky realized Steve was laughing. Did you just snap? Tony asked, forcing Bucky arms behind him. He called me Steve, the Avenger out of time said with a grin. Bucky froze at that before once more struggling to get out of Tony's grasp. Yay, he's still a confused super assassin, Tony finally snapped on a pair of restraints around Bucky's wrists. Can you put him to bed now? Steve, still grinning, pulled out a syringe. The pair forced Bucky to stand up. See you when you wake up, Buck. Bucky had enough time to stare at Steve with anger. Then the syringe was stabbed into his neck, and he was out like a light. Okay, take him, Iron Man said. I've got to help Falcon. Captain America nodded, throwing his restrained and sedated friend onto his shoulder. Got it. See you in a bit. 1. As Steve ran off, Iron Man looked over at the Hydra soldiers fighting. His targeting system focused on them as he turned his head to look around. Then the shoulder panels on his armor opened, firing projectiles. In an instant, twelve men fell to the floor, groaning in pain from projectiles in their hands and feet. Iron Man stepped forward. Shield agents, seeing him, took positions at his side, pointing their guns. I suggest you boys surrender, Tony said casually. One strike member began to raise his gun. A repulsor blast slammed into his chest, throwing him back with broken ribs for his troubles. The other Hydra soldiers seemed to stare at him. Then, one by one, they started putting down their guns. Tony began to step forward, stopping when he bumped into something. He looked down to see he'd accidentally stepped on Rumlow's hand. He gently stepped around the unconscious man and ignored him as someone cuffed the strike leader. 2. Mahmoud Sheikh slash Dial In the main flight bridge of the Insight heli carrier I had infiltrated, I could hear the captain yelling at his crew members. With my senses as strong as they were, it was easy to hear what was happening through the steel door down the hall from me. What the hell happened? He yelled as I strode towards the door. He didn't seem to understand why he was now grounded. All our power is being pulled by something else. A crew member said. I can't raise maintenance. Damn it. The captain yelled. It must be that monster. We need to dash. I smashed down the door with a kick. As I stepped inside, the men inside stared at me in horror. Blitzwolfer had that effect on people. I took a whiff of the air as the captain staggered to rise from his chair. IT department, I joked half-heartedly. About six men, including the captain. Two of them were soldiers, one close to me, a woman with wide eyes. That woman snapped her gun towards me and got a sonic blast for her troubles getting thrown into a bank of computers. The other soldier fired at me, and I ran on all fours to dart out of the way. As soon as I was behind a set of controls, I tapped the Omnitrix and leaped at him. Wrath. Let me tell you something faceless Hydragoon. Wrath's gonna beat you silly. I yelled out as I grabbed a crew member and threw him aside. 4. There was a bit of relief in becoming the Tiger Wrestler. Wrath didn't see my kill as anything but a necessity. It wasn't something to discard, but I felt more pragmatic about it. Kinda of funny that for all his ridiculousness, Wrath was better at handling what I'd done than most of my other aliens. I walked through a stream of bullets. The soldier screamed as I prowled forward through the room. I raised a claw and slammed it into a computer. As I continued to walk, the claw sliced through the steel and glass of the console, cutting a long line. Get behind me, the soldier yelled at the technicians and captain. They moved to do so. I leaped forward and kicked the soldier in a lightning-fast move. He flew back and slammed into the door behind him. His eyes roll up and closed, the man passing out. Let me tell you something, faceless Hydragoons 2 through 6. Wrath thinks you moronic Nazi-worshipping idiots should surrender, I told the stunned crew. Or not? Wrath doesn't care either way, but Wrath wants the excuse to beat you down. The captain responded by slamming a button on his console. Hail Hydra Irk. He was interrupted by me grabbing his head. Afi Yuka's faceplant. I rammed his head into the console with brutal force, breaking his nose and leaving him to pass out on the floor. Damn it. I yelled when I saw what he had done. The crew members tried to run. 
I tapped the Omnitrix. Feedback. Pulling energy from the heli carrier around me, I fired bolts of electricity at two of the crew members, leaving two standing. Ignoring the ones now shaking on the floor, I leaped over the console. He activated something. What was it? I asked quickly. They shook their heads. I zapped one of them, leaving him to fall on the floor with his muscles seizing, and turned to the last person standing, a woman with red hair. What did he do? A self-destruct. She squealed. Pierce's orders? A way to kill you all. It'll blow up the whole triskelion. A last resort. What the hell? I asked in shock. I it was just in case, she said hurriedly. The rest of Hydra would use the explosion as a political ploy, to let them justify control over the populace, to help the world even if we died. The last words were said with the heady belief of only the worshipful. We may fail, but we will still save the world from itself. You've been drinking too much of the cold punch, I said in disgust, zapping her and leaving her on the shaking on the floor with her friends. Just then, someone knocked on the window. I looked to see War Machine floating there, holding Creel. I waved him in, and War Machine blasted the window with a low-powered repulsor blast, flying inside. As he entered, the Omnitrix timed out. I looked down at my hands, sighing in relief when I saw they were clean, then looked at Rhodey. The captain activated the self-destruct, I said as Rhodey landed. His faceplate snapped up, showing me his worried face. Shit. Can we stop it? No idea, I said quickly. I'm going to turn into jury rig once the Omnitrix recharges and see if I can stop it. Jarvis, X, can you guys do anything? 4. No sir, X said. The controls are disconnected now. The insight carrier will explode soon, no matter what is done by us. This is a hardware issue. Well luckily, jury rig is a hardware kinda guy, I said firmly. Rhodey dropped Creel, stepping over to join me. Creel smoothly landed, rose up, and grabbed Rhodey's right arm. He squeezed down at the same time as he absorbed the material of Rhodey's suit. Rhodey yelled out when his forearm gauntlet was destroyed in a single squeeze. You should have used an organic material for the syringe, Creel sounded almost sad. Creel slammed a headbutt into Rhodey's minigun, destroying it, then grabbed Rhodey's left wrist and pulled both of War Machine's arms back, placing a knee against Rhodey's back. Rhodey struggled, and for a moment they held against each other, but Creel had Rhodey pinned with superior positioning and the enhanced strength of his form. 1. Stop. I yelled out. Creel, the same black color as Rhodey's armor now, looked up at me. The two continued to struggle, but Creel was listening I raised my hands up. Creel, we have about, I looked at the console. Three minutes left before this thing blows. I can save us. I know you've been brainwashed, I said. My compliance will be rewarded, Creel said softly. I must allow the self-destruct. Yeah, yeah, that. But I can fix you, Zola. He was terrified someone would try to brainwash him. He came up with ways to reverse it, to even stop it. We can help you, Creel's eyes widened, and he almost lost his grip on Rhodey's arms. Please, fight the conditioning. You can be free. We can all escape, can stop the explosions, just, please. For a moment, I held my breath. Creel stared at me. The clock on the computer lowered bit by bit. Then, with pain in his eyes, Creel began to pull back hard on War Machine's arms. Rhodey yelled. The Omnitrix suddenly went green, and for some reason, a hologram popped up without my prompting. I tapped the watch and leaped forward as Creel began to break Rhodey's spine. 1. Creator's Thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 3 Comments. Chapter 14, Upgrade 3. The change that came over me was instant. My bones and muscles became gelatinous in shape, brown skin became an inky black, with green lines shooting across me, my clothes shifted to my stomach, then turned pure white, and the Omnitrix symbol appeared on my chest. I felt my eyes become a single optic as my cells changed, going from human, to almost mechanical in nature. I reached forward with a four-fingered hand towards War Machine as I, for the first time in months, I yelled out an alien's name I never had. Upgrade. 3. Creel, surprised by my attack, tried to press harder. The armor on Rhodey's back was buckling. So my hands grabbed Rhodey's shoulders, then flattened out and began to flow across the black armor's cold metal. My nano-organic cells began to sink into the war machine. I looked at Creel and fired a single beam of green light from my single eye, pushing him back with a laser blast. Creel stepped back in pain, 
and I focused on Rhodey. My body joined to his armor. The experience was weird. Not like putting on clothes. More like injecting extra bone and muscle mass inside of me. I entered the war machine, and Rhodey's mask snapped down. The entire suit's color scheme changed to black with green circuit stripes. I felt the arc reactor flood me with more power than I could ever believe, and made that power more efficient in turn. Every single aspect of the suit jumped up by a degree that seemed impossible and I felt I could do even more if I wanted to, as if I could mold and alter the suit as easily as someone does clay. Rody slash I stared at the HUD as he slash I looked around. 1. What just happened? Rody asked, both with his words and his thoughts. It was me, I answered in kind from within, as his suit. I, gave you an upgrade. 1. We stood up. The arc reactor in our chest whined to life, the symbol of the Omnitrix glowing in that spot. Any damage left by Creel had disappeared, leaving pristine black and green metal in its place. This feels. Rody trailed off, odd. Yeah, I know right. We turned to look at Creel, who stared back at us. The man rose up, rushing towards us. We raised our hands and a green flow flashing from our palms. When we fired, a green repulsor beam the size of a truck seemed to turn the world in front of us into emerald light. Only a quick adaptation on my part prevented Creel from being vaporized, making it so the center of the attack was concussive, and the outer edges were vaporizing. The massive green blast still smashed into Creel, throwing him screaming out the window like a ragdoll. The blast also destroyed the front of the bridge, leaving smoking ruin in its wake in the shape of a massive hole burned by the repulsor blast. Molten steel dripped from the ceiling in the silence that followed. 1. Holy shit, Rody slash I said. The accelerated reality of our HUD helpfully showed us that the temperature of the air had reached almost 49 degrees Celsius. 1. At that point, I remembered the self-destruct. 1. SEC, Rody. I separated from him, leaving him to stagger as his armor returned to its normal state. Oh, that just feels weird, Rody said as I flowed over to the console. Moving as upgrade was strange. I'd imagined it would feel like Goop did, but Goop felt like, like what being water would feel like. Fluid, and constantly shifting. Moving as upgrade felt strangely as though I was still human, just able to feel every one of my cells at once. As though I could look at my human hand, and know that I could collapse it into formlessness. It was hard to describe. I looked at the console for a moment, plenty of time left. I put my hands against the console and pressed into it then through it. My consciousness stretched. First, the console. Then the room, my cells merging with floors, the ceiling, all the way to the windows I'd blown out with Rody, repairing the damage to create hollow screens that showed the outside. Whoa, Rody said, looking around the black and green patterned room. I wasn't done yet. I extended my body and consciousness into the command tower. I merged with catwalks and railings, became one with computers, did the cybernetic equivalent of a wave towards Jarvis and X as they watched me work. I extended onto the flight deck, turning the concrete into metal, slipped over the anti-aircraft weapons and repairing the ones I'd destroyed. 2. My cells invaded deeper into the ship. I went through weapons systems and made them railguns or laser emitters on a whim, I entered into the engines and upgraded them, I even entered the cafeteria and bedrooms of the ship. All the way to the clear glass dome in the belly of the ship, infecting the whole of that space. My last stop was Jury Rig's creation in the main power room. It was by far the most advanced object on the ship, light years ahead of anything else. Sorry Rody, your armor is still cool as shit though. I integrated Jury Rig's machine into myself. Soon, I was done. I had become the inside heli carrier, and it had been upgraded. I felt my form glow black and green and looked out with eyes made of the sensors and cameras of the ship. And so much more. Zola's algorithm was now as much a part of me as my DNA. I now understood the world in a way I had never comprehended as a human, almost a technological version of Swampfire's connection with plant life. With a thought, a person's life was bared to me. As Rody stood inside of me, looking out in awe at the glowing flight deck that was a part of me, I got a series of reports on him. From his family history, his interactions with the media, psychological and medical files, camera footage of him in various bases and within Stark Industries facilities, even some stuff on social media of Tony filming Rody with strippers Tony had hired to loosen his friend up. I got every bit of a picture that could be painted on Rody. 4. I turned it off seconds later, no one needs to know so much about a person. 
Instead, I focused on the self-destruct, which was actually rather brilliant. Once the captain activated it, the software disconnected, letting the rest go completely on its own. Of course, now that the arc reactor and repulsor technology was a part of my body, I shut it down. It felt a lot like swallowing back a cough, oddly enough. 1. Okay, we're good, I said through the ship's speakers. Then, within myself, I looked at X and Jarvis. I assume you made it so the other captains are locked out from doing the same thing. Indeed, Jarvis said. We've also reinstalled the fail-safe systems. To my perception, he looked like a floating orange orb of light, with striations bouncing back and forth. It was then that I realized something about Jarvis. He may have started out as a natural language UI, in fact, I could read the bits of code that indicated that, but now he was so much more. I'd assumed he was a six, hell Tony never even corrected me otherwise. But Jarvis was a full AI now, or as close as existed. Which made me turn to X. Sir, this is. X seemed speechless as he stared at me within the world of software. He was, appropriately, shaped like me, if I was made of blue light, and he, oh no, X, I said softly as our software interacted. Do you feel different? He didn't speak, he didn't have to. Jarvis said nothing, having clearly noticed what I had. Okay, I said slowly, pulling my surprise back with a final thought of how bullshit jury rig was. We'll figure it out. For now, are the other heli carriers safe now? For, as I said, all fail safes are in place, and any attempts otherwise have been locked out, Jarvis said. We'll monitor the situation to prevent anything else. Then it's time for me to take this baby for a spin, I said excitedly. Upgrade wanted to play. Mr. Shaked, Jarvis said, X still silent. Isn't that really far too much power to bring into the battlefield? Yeah, but I can't just possess a heli carrier and not use it, I stated as matter of fact. 1. Jarvis let out a long-suffering sigh. Ah, uh, dial. I focused on my bridge when Rhodey spoke. I think Creel is getting up. And I rather imagine it would be overkill to turn the heli carrier weapons against him, Jarvis stated. 2. Fyeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Couldn't you have just shot Creel as a giant damn ship? Some things are personal, and Jarvis told me not to, I admitted through the heli carrier speakers, knocking out any Hydra personnel within me with some newly constructed security measures, like taser guns popping out of the walls. Plus, I'm a firm believer that War Machine combining with Upgrade is cool as shit. Hell yeah, it is. Kinda weird you became my armor though. I just know Tony is going to make jokes about this later, Rhodey said a little disgruntled, watching as the floor under Creel opened up to pull him into me. A series of slides brought him to the brig, along with all the Hydra soldiers I'd knocked out within my halls and rooms. Once I was done, I focused on my next task, checking out the situation up top. Then I pointed my guns up at the ceiling and started shooting at low power. Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow. Natasha was wearing her black outfit, having discarded her disguise for the easier to move in clothes. Clint had done the same, wearing his purple long coat and quiver. Together the two had joined Sharon Carter and her group and were now cleaning out the rest of the Triskelion. So you should just give him a chance, Natasha said as she strode confidently next to Sharon holding her pistols up and watching for any threats as X and Jarvis calmly informed her of what was happening at their destination. Is this really the time to talk about this? Sharon gave Natasha a look. She'd put on a bulletproof vest now, looking strangely petite in the oversized body armor while carrying a massive assault rifle. Always time for romance, Clint said, his bow held at the ready. Seriously, I worry about Steve. I really don't think he's my type, Sharon admitted ignoring the chuckles of the agents behind her. 1. Natasha and Clint gave her a stunned look. Are you kidding? Have you seen Steve? Clint asked, shocked. The man is built like a demigod? I mean that literally, Thor is one of my best friends and those two could be brothers. Looks aside, he's got that ashuk's nice guy thing going on, Natasha added. He's sweet. 17. They came to a door and stopped outside, taking positions next to it. After a shared nod, Natasha and Clint kicked it open. Inside was a room full of cubicles, like something one would see in any office in North America, with a massive window was on the other side of the room that displayed the crystal mountain outside. The soldiers inside would have looked out of place in any office setting, however. They were setting up blocks of C4 in the middle of the room, apparently under orders to cause as much destruction as they could. Natasha had to admire how many standing orders Hydra had prepared which didn't change the fact they were still aggravating. Hydra soldiers began to fire at them, killing one of the shield agents. Natasha rolled behind a cubicle, then rose up and shot two men in the head. Clint fired an arrow in the center of the group. When it hit, it released a brief EMP burst, deactivating the detonators in the hands of the soldiers before they could blow the C4. He fired another shot that pierced a soldier's throat before ducking when bullets were sent his way. Sharon fired her assault rifle for a moment killing one soldier and sending another one to duck away. While the cubicles were terrible for cover, being easy to shoot through, they were perfect for concealment. Something kind of nice about this. Natasha yelled, leaping forward to punch a man in the throat, kick him to the floor, and drop a knee into his chest, firing her pistol again at the other soldiers while a shield agent next to her shot the man she was holding down. Really? Clint asked loudly, firing an explosive arrow to cut off three men trying to run away then shooting one of them in the thigh, leaving him to quickly bleed out. I guess I can see it. Are you crazy? Sharon asked, leaning out of cover, trying not to think about the fact she had never bantered during a fight before. What is nice about this? We're killing former S.H.I.E.L.D. Hell, I know that guy. She followed her statement by shooting that guy in the chest, hitting his shoulder instead when he ducked aside. Two. Yeah, but at least it's just normal people in this fight, Natasha said catching a grenade out of the air and tossing it back to explode. Nothing crazy, just dash. Boom. Outside the window behind the Hydra soldiers, a portion of the crystal mountain disappeared in a blaze of green light and sound. The entire building shook, and some of the windows cracked. Everyone in the room stopped, looking outside. Dust fell from the sky above, a shiny blue-green one reminiscent of something from fairy tales. It took a moment for Natasha to realize the dust was the remains of the crystal that had been destroyed. From the hole that had appeared in the center of the mountain, rose a heli carrier. The Hydra soldiers cheered. Natasha shared a look with horror with Clint, worried that the impossible had happened. That one of the heli carriers had been able to somehow blast its way free. Then they looked closer. It shone a bright black, with circuits of green. 
Its weapons looked different, very futuristic, with sections of green script shifting along them. And on the side, was an enormous emblem, the Omnitrix. This is Dial, a familiar voice boomed. I have control of War Machine Helicarrier 01. Stand down, all Hydra forces. 1. In a display of power, the guns on the bottom of the ship twirled towards the bridge where the ground vehicles were being brought in. Yep, Sharon said in shock. Normal. Sam Wilson slash Falcon. Sam flew next to Iron Man, diving towards the convoy of vehicles on the ground with the other flyer. A gunship fired bullets at Sam, forcing him to veer off slightly before the gunship was hit by a repulsor beam. A lot easier to do this when your wingman can shoot lasers. They're not dash Iron Man side. Whatever, I'll give you some upgrades when this is over so you can shoot something more useful than those pea shooters while flying. For now, holy shit. Iron Man stopped to stare in the distance, floating in the air. Sam turned to look, then twisted in the air to hover. Damn. This is Dial, a familiar voice boomed from the speakers of the ship. I have control of War Machine Helicarrier 01. Stand down, all Hydra forces. 2. The guns on the ship turned, pointing at the bridge Falcon and Iron Man were defending. Then they fired. For a moment, the ship seemed to glow like a green sun before a wave of power hit the bridge. Pinpoint fire slammed into the sonic cannons on the vehicles, the guns on top of the Humvees, and the weapons on the gunships. The soldiers were hit by concussive blasts, breaking ribs as impossible shots curved to smash into their chests, no matter where they tried to hide. The tanks brought in were hit hardest, torn to pieces as bullets covered in energy sliced through the treads, the main cannon, and the engine block. Some shots slammed into the bridge, tearing massive craters that sent men flying into the air to get hit once more before falling, groaning, to the bridge. 3. In an instant, the entire convoy was left shattered. Damn, maybe you should open with that next time, Dial, Sam said in shock. There wasn't a way for me to do this until a couple minutes ago, Dial said over the comms. Hold on, more lasers fired into the distance. A fleet of Quinjets were headed over here, I just took them out. They'll have to land in a bit. So, yeah, the Omnitrix just gave me this power. 2. I'm going to study the shit out of that watch, Iron Man added floating upwards. 1. We're not done yet, Fury said over the comms. I've got reports that Hydra around the world is scrambling. Someone is communicating despite our efforts. We need to convene our next move. Take in the rest of Hydra in the area. Dial, if you stop doing, whatever you're doing, can we still use that heli carrier? Yes, though the windows are still blown out. Plus it'll be a normal inside heli carrier. Just a normal advanced version of the most powerful aircraft in the world then. I can work with that. We got two heli carriers to work with that. Maria, you're in charge of the Triskelion. It's time we get everyone together. 1. Mahmoud Sheikh slash Dial. It was weird. I'd expected there to be some big climatic finish to the fight. One of us having a big fight to the death in an exploding building or something. Instead, we just had more work to do. Hydra soldiers to arrest and put in cells, people to speak to, assets to reposition, medical supplies and ammunition to pass out. Stuff I'd known were part of superheroics, but never really thought of. First, I had to help a friend with a personal matter. Okay, get him in here, I said to Steve as we walked through the hallways of the heli carrier I'd stolen. The ship was in flight, headed to stop an attack that was still happening. There were four of us. I was back in human form, my gun and knife back in their holsters and my watch set to diamond head in case of surprises. Steve's helmet was off his shield on his back, with Tony armorless at his side. Steve had Bucky in massive cuffs similar to the ones Steve and I had been put in, yesterday? Damn. Anyways, the Winter Soldier was looking angrily around as Steve gently led him along, his gaze especially hard towards Tony, who only returned a smug grin every time they met eyes. I opened a steel door and waved the three inside, following them after. Okay, made these special for you and Creel, I waved at the room in front of us. Well, S.H.I.E.L.D. had them for field imprisonment, I just put in here with some of the stuff Tony and I made. It had been a cafeteria once, though thankfully the heli carrier was way too new for any of the interesting smells of an older dining area would have to settle in. I'd removed a lot of the tables, replacing them with two large boxes in the middle of the place. They were massive steel things the size of cells on the inside, the interiors made of square plush foam similar to a mental institution's padded cells. One held Creel, 
who turned and looked at us as we entered. He was sitting in a he had a screen in front of him playing a winding series of lights. He quickly turned to look at it, ignoring us in favor of focusing on the screen. The other cell had a chair with some screens around it, some arms set to wrap around a person's head. As soon as Bucky saw it, he flipped out. He spun to attack Tony with a kick, only for Steve to block it on his arm. Whoa, Tony yelled, backing away. Steve, your friend is still an asshole. Bucky, it's not what you think. Steve yelled. You're not putting me in there. Bucky shouted. Diamond Head. As soon as I transformed, I grabbed Bucky by the shoulders, pulling him close. Since his arms were bound behind him, his only option was to kick. His foot bounced off my groin, leaving me glad I wasn't a human for a moment. Creel. I yelled out. Tell him. They're not brainwashing, Barnes. Creel yelled out. They're curing us. I pulled Bucky into my arms. He roared, trying to escape my grasp. Even with Diamond Head's strength and Bucky's restraints, he still gave me a hell of a fight. Buck. Steve stepped forward. I promise, we aren't going to hurt you. Bucky stared at him with wild eyes. You know me. I'd never hurt you. We're going to get rid of what Zola, what Hydra did. Please, calm down. Bucky looked over at Creel. The tall bald man nodded. I, I don't have to comply. I still want to, but I don't believe my compliance will be rewarded. That meant something to the Winter Soldier. He calmed down in my arms. Tony and Steve stared at him as his breathing relaxed. When I was sure he wasn't going to attack, I released him but stayed Diamond Head. When Zola created his brainwashing methods, I explained. He wanted a way to counter it. Selfish bastard wanted it in case one of his rivals tried to do it to him. But with it, we can cure you. It'll take time, but you'll be restored. Tony and I even improved it. Bucky stared at the device in his soon-to-be cell as though it were the devil. But when Steve gently guided him towards it, he complied. Tony shook his head, looking over at me. Hell of a pair. Blame Hydra, I replied. We need to take those assholes out. Several people entered the cafeteria, shield personnel with degrees I couldn't pronounce came in. Steve gently strapped Bucky down, whispering gently to him. Once Bucky was completely set in his seat, the scientists went inside. Well, time to clean the crazy Russian super assassin's brain, Tony said flippantly. You know, I still think we should give him some improvements. I could make him as smart as me. Well, maybe a little less than half, but still. I think he'll be fine with just being himself, I looked at Tony, I gotta go, you gonna be okay here, Tony hesitated, he stared at Bucky for a moment, and I saw his fists clench, he looked at Steve, then lifted his eyes towards my bright yellow ones, after a moment, he sighed, he killed my parents, and I know, it wasn't his fault, but it still bothers me, Tony shook his head, the only two things that are going to push me through this is that Steve wants his friend back, and Natasha promised to help me track down the asshole who gave the order. I nodded. Tony didn't notice, simply walking forward to enter the cell. Hey, a certain bald superhuman said. I looked over at Creel. He was leaning against his door, his face pressed against the window. How will I know when this is done? I walked over to be face to face with him, returning to my human form with a tap on the Omnitrix. When you can hear words like comply and reward without feeling pleasure, happiness, or need. Creel winced, staring at me. And then what? You let me go. Not up to me, Creel, I admitted. If it was my choice, I'd probably just let you go. Well, not before letting Wrath have another go with you. Give it a shot, Creel challenged. For a moment, we glared at each other. Funny. I'd never had a rivalry with anyone before. Six. But right now, we're trying to counter Hydra with all we've got. They're attacking the Shield Academy, so we'll start there. Once we've had time to sit down, we'll see. Creel didn't seem satisfied with that. He stared at me for a bit longer, then turned and walked to sit at his chair again, staring at the TV with intensity as lights played across his face. I looked at him a moment longer, then at the cell next door, where a metallic headband was being placed on Bucky's forehead. I sighed and left the room. How are our two brainwashed assassins doing? Fury asked as I entered the bridge. Hey, I take offense to that. While Clint tried to say it jokingly, he ended up more morose towards the end of his sentence. Natasha noticed, giving him a sad smile, and he returned it with a chagrined nod. They're okay, I said. It'll take time before we can say they're free of their conditioning. But for now, they're on their way. 
I just wish we didn't have to do it on the move. It's the only choice we have, Fury looked around. The bridge had been totally repaired by my jury rig form, as it turned out upgrade didn't return items to undamaged states, something War Machine's armor also showed. As jury rig I'd altered the area at the front of the room where Rhodey and I had blown Creel out of with a big steel wall that projected a holographic image of the outside. It also worked as a main control for the ship, allowing Fury to pilot it with his eye alone. 3. The room was full of shield agents working at the consoles. X's device was plugged into a wall nearby. I walked by and gave X an affectionate pat. 2. Okay, when do we deploy? I asked Fury, sitting next to Natasha. He scoffed. Yeah, I'm still not sure I should deploy you. Are you just saying that out of habit by now? I asked. Paranoia has kept me alive so far, Fury admitted. But yay, let's get this done. Natasha, you, Dial and War Machine will go to one academy. Clint, you go to the other with Falcon, and some of the Quinjet pilots. I'll stay here with Steve and Tony in the meantime. Meanwhile, the heli carrier Sharon and the Council are on will head to the rendezvous. Should Sharon really be in charge of a heli carrier? Natasha asked curiously. Fury smiled. I trust her. And her name, despite her wishes otherwise, has a history. You all head out in five. For now, I believe you have something to talk about with him, he nodded towards me. Two. I groaned in annoyance. Oh come on, is five minutes enough for interrogation? No, Natasha stood up and waved for me to follow. But I promise, it's not an interrogation. I just want to talk. 1. Still feeling hesitant, I rose up, looking back at Clint. I expected a smirk, but instead, he nodded silently, his face carefully neutral. Well, that didn't bode well. Natasha lead me into a side room, some place filled with lights and levers that jury rig would have loved to tear apart. The space was narrow, barely big enough for us both. I raised my eyes as Natasha turned around. You know, if you wanted to get me alone while you're wearing a leather outfit, asking help from Fury to do it just makes it weird, I said, trying to seem casual. Natasha, way more of an expert at the game of talking out of your ass while being super cool, raised an eyebrow. That's not why you're here. I didn't say anything. Your hands, Natasha said. I looked down at them. They're shaking. Not often, but every once in a while. And then there's the Omnitrix. You keep looking for reasons to change. Used to be only when you needed it. But now, I leaned against the wall and sat down, pressing my back against the levers and lights on the cold steel behind me. My legs were squeezed in by the tight space. Natasha sat down next to me. I found the body, she said. Down below, stabbed in the throat, with footprints of a human and swamp fire next to it. Yeah, I said softly. I changed into him right after. She nodded. How do you feel? I don't know, I admitted. I, I know that I had to do it. It was him or me. But I thought any kill I did it would be me shooting a guy with feedback, or shooting a crystal as diamond head or, nothing that personal. Not as me. Not while looking into his eyes. 2. Natasha didn't speak. So, you've killed people. I mean, I know I had to do it, and it helps to remind myself of that, but, any idea what I should do? Should I try to get over it so I can process it easier next time? Or just, I trailed off, not saying anything else. I'm not the person to tell people what their morals should be, Natasha admitted. Hell, ask Steve and Tony and they'll tell you the exact opposite. I don't care, I said. I'll talk to them later. Right now I have you. Poor you, Natasha teased. After a bit of silence, she tapped my knee. Look, everyone processes this differently. Talking helps some people. Some are just born for it. Others never get over it. And some can take it and keep doing it when it's necessary. You won't know which you are until you find yourself in the moment again. Killing isn't something we all should reach for. But when it's necessary, you might have to again. 3. I nodded slowly. Not accepting it. But this was the real rule. I might have to kill again. If I wanted to survive. For some reason, that helped. Knowing I'd only done it when I needed to, that I would only do it if I had to, having someone else say it helped. For now, stick by me. I'll protect you, Natasha said with a smirk. I chuckled. Don't I have the watch with the uber-powerful aliens on it? Yeah well, Natasha rose up, helping me as well. Somehow, I feel like you still need protection. Now come on. We have a mission to do. 1. I smiled down at her. Yes, ma'am. Creator's thoughts. 
Hey underscore Rishabh. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 6 Comments. Chapter 15, Loose Ends. When we got close enough, Natasha launched us in a Quinjet while Clint took Falcon in another one. It was kinda cool, being part of a fleet of Quinjets separating to fly from a giant flying command center. The helicarrier was behind us in moments. Rhodey and I sat in the back, his armor standing in the center of the large space in a tall rack. It was weird speaking to Rhodey. In a weird way, I now knew him better than anyone else in the world. We had been one, and my direct link to Zola's algorithm had given me even more intimate knowledge than that. But there was something else to talk about. While we were up, when you were linked with the suit, Rhodey said in the seat across from me, Jarvis managed to get an understanding of what you were doing. Tony thinks he can replicate it. I cocked my head. What, make a permanent upgraded war machine? No, Rhodey shook his head. He thinks he can, in a limited way, make his own version of your alien. I stared at him. Yeah, he said with a nod. Jarvis found out that upgrade is technically made of some combination of organic matter and nanotechnology, Rhodey waved a hand dismissively. I don't know, it is way over my head. But he wants to use the data from War Machine to study it. I looked over at War Machine, thinking about that. In the comics, Tony had done some amazing stuff with nanotechnology. Made suits as close to liquid as they were solid steel, really bleeding edge stuff. Pun intended. But Upgrade wasn't just nanomachines, he was a living being. If Tony went too far, he would create actual life just like the Galvin and Azemuth did by total mistake. And people who do that tend to end up with a lot of problems. Seriously, making life is generally a bad idea in fiction unless you cover all your bases and even then it was a hit and miss kind of thing. The only reason the galvanic metamorphs worked out is cause the Galvin instantly treated them as their own people the second it was made clear they were sapient. Even then, malware still showed up, though it could be argued whose fault that was. So, needed to figure out what to do about such a thing. I need to talk to him about that, I said, still staring the war machine armor. I looked at Black Widow, then got up and walked to look out the window. In the meantime, what's the mission? I mean, I know what it is, but I don't want to screw it up, so a refresher is good. The SHIELD Academy of Science and Technology is a few minutes away. We're meeting a man named Tomasz Calderon, who's assembled a squadron of Quinjets to join us. He'll make a perimeter with War Machine, you and I will go inside. You'll follow my lead while I'm training you. Training me? I asked, blinking. I'm multitasking, Natasha said simply. You'll stay human unless I say otherwise, and I'll see how you do. Not sure if you noticed but once you return to being a human you are not exactly much of a threat and people can easily take advantage of that. Besides, this way we can conserve the watch so you don't time out too quickly. I looked over at Rhodey, who smiled kindly. I looked back at Natasha. Shouldn't that be something I learn at a training facility or something? Well, we are going to an academy, Natasha gave me a grin. Smartass, I replied. How about Rhodey? You need to learn on the job, Rhodey said. And I've got the firepower in case someone attacks from the outside that the Quinjets can't handle. I nodded, but still felt uncomfortable. Natasha noticed. You want to transform, don't you? That was it. I was more comfortable being an alien right now. Stupid useless angst. I sighed in acknowledgement. I turned and walked over to sit across from Rhodey again. Yeah, I guess so. I shouldn't for a bit, should I? I'm no psychologist, Rhodey said. But I am a soldier. I remember my first kill, that moment after it's over. You know what I felt. Relief, I said. Rhodey nodded because I was alive. I even felt proud, that I'd beaten him, that I'd survived. And that's normal. It's human, man. We're supposed to do everything in our power to survive and to feel happy when we do. It's okay to feel that way, for a brief moment. It's normal to feel horrified afterward too. Just remind yourself that you're doing the right thing and that you have people to talk to. Then you can go to therapy if you need it, Natasha said seriously. But for now, we have a mission. Strap in. I put on the belts on my seat as Rhodey did the same next to me. Natasha lowered the Quinjet, the motion of the jet giving me a feeling similar to when an elevator dropped, that shift when your stomach is left catching up with the rest of you. Rhodey drew my attention with a wave, pointing at a headset hanging from the ceiling, and put one on his own head. I followed his directions as the sound of other aircraft could be heard outside. Calderon, this is Romanov, do you read? Natasha said on her headset. 
Rody and I listened. It was silent for a long uncomfortable moment. I read you, Romanov, a male voice responded. He didn't sound happy. So Fury sent you. Will that be a problem? Natasha asked. No, the guy said after a moment too long for his answer to be honest. Rody and I shared a look. You have any Avengers with you? No, just two specialists. Normal. She looked back at us. Rody and I shrugged. Not really? Christ, the guy cursed. Fine, whatever. We'll discuss when we land. Can't wait, Natasha rolled her eyes. If it helps, technically we are normal, we just have really cool toys. Doesn't matter to some people, Rody replied. My armor is enough for most people to get really worried. That watch is probably worse considering it's not human made. Hell, it explicitly turns you into aliens. I sighed at that but nodded. Sadly, most people wouldn't believe the Omnitrix is technically a diplomatic tool rather than a weapon. Natasha didn't say anything as we came in towards the building ahead. When we landed, Rody got into his armor, the suit opening in the front to let him inside. I made sure the Omnitrix was tied on my wrist, not really necessary, but it was a ritual I was used to. Then Natasha walked up to me and handed me something while looking me in the eyes. I want you to stay human for a bit, that doesn't mean I'm leaving you defenseless, she reached into a pocket and took out a pair of tiny discs, passing them to me. Taser discs, she explained as I stared at the small circles. They release a burst of electricity when you activate them. Use them as projectiles if you have to. Got it, I put them into a pouch on my belt. We waited for the back of the Quinjet to open, then went down the ramp. The school was quiet. We'd landed in the parking lot of the academy, which had several black SUVs parked in a circle and one other Quinjet on the ground. The school itself looked like any college or university I'd ever seen in my life, if more modern, with a large shield symbol high up on one of the walls. More Quinjets hovered around the school, with soldiers running around. They all had their phones strapped to their hips, the Hercules app flashing green. Some of the soldiers had gathered around the Quinjet with guns drawn. We confidently stepped out like badasses, and the Hercules app at their waist flashed green, prompting them to lower their guns. Sorry about that, one man said. While he wasn't dressed in black combat gear like the others, he seemed to be in charge. A tall, bald man, wearing a vest over a button-up shirt and a small bulletproof vest over that. We weren't sure if it was really you, he came up and held a hand out to Natasha, who shook it. Tomasz Calderon, I'm here to assist in your operation. Agent Romanov. Understood, Natasha said. She nodded towards us. These are my assets. War machine and dial. They Avengers. He asked, looking between us, noting Rhodey's armor and my very unique uniform. Reserve, she said, even though I wasn't sure there was an official name for what Rhodey and I were to the current shield. Hmm, he said, a complicated look on his face. Problem, Rhodey asked. No. I have issues with people who have as much power as the Avengers do, but you helped us at the Triskelion, so it would be stupid of me to let my suspicions get in the way of my professionalism, Calderon said evenly. Very magnanimous of you, Natasha said diplomatically. Okay, my team is ready to go, Calderon said. Ten men, plus me. Got it, Natasha looked at Rhodey. You good? Yep. He gave me a friendly pat on the shoulder before his mask snapped down and he took off into the sky with a loud whoosh of noise. Huh, Calderon said, watching as Rody flew to join the Quinjets. He looked at me. So, you need a gun. I patted my handgun. He seemed to accept that as an answer. Okay, we move on Black Widow, he said to soldiers nearby. That means follow me, Natasha said helpfully, smirking when I gave her an annoyed glance. You want me to follow the buddy system. I asked as we walked towards the school. Do we get juice snacks when this is over? If you're good, she joked, then became more serious. Okay, you had time before and during the flight to study this place. What do you know? Ah, uh, the first lesson about missions is learn everything you can about them, Natasha said, going up some stairs as the soldiers followed. The location, the targets, evacuations points, history, allies nearby. What do you know about it? The ah. Uh, the school is one of three run by S.H.I.E.L.D., I said hurriedly. S.H.I.E.L.D. sends all the smart people they can hear, the ones with PhDs. It's run by Dr. Jennifer Weaver. Good enough, some soldiers ran ahead to the glass doors ahead, opening them for us as Natasha and I took out our guns. Next time, I want you to try and memorize maps of the area we're trying to attack. 
Even the slightest idea of what a place is like can save your life, or save others. I nodded, kinda amazed at the turn my life had taken that lead to me getting lessons from Black Freaking Widow. Okay, I'll take point. You stay by my side, Calderon, you're up front with us. Dial, you get ready to transform if need be, okay. Understood, Calderon and I said in unison. We entered the school. The place was an odd combination of clean and futuristic with the messy aftermath of an evacuation. Despite all the glass windows, stylish statues, and clean marble everywhere, there were also papers spread all over the place, scuff marks on the floor, signs of people running away from something. It was eerily quiet in the school. We walked through the hallways as a group, moving at a loping pace. I tried to copy the professionalism of the soldiers around me but found it easier to just walk like a human being and not a loaded spring. Okay, down this hallway, Tomash said, leading us to the right. The bunker should be in the next building. Things felt tense. It felt like we were in the middle of a haunted house, with the papers everywhere, the silence of everything except the Quinjets outside and our footsteps. I took a breath and looked at Natasha. She wasn't affected by the tense atmosphere just doing that catwalk she did that drew the eye. When she saw me looking she smiled. Always project confidence, she whispered. Even when you're worried. Are you? I asked her. More suspicious, she said. Hydra should have sent someone, anyone. These are the most brilliant minds in the world, but they left them untouched. Even the Hydra personnel hidden among the faculty and students gave up without a fight. That worries me. Suddenly, a loud sound came from ahead of us. We all froze, aiming our guns forwards. Or they were waiting, Tamash said. We went towards the noise. My palms were sweaty, forcing me to wipe them off on my pants so my grip wouldn't slip. When we got to the end of the hall, Tamash pressed himself against the corner leading to a wide space. We went up against the wall behind him. He held a hand up and poked his head around the corner, then pulled back. He grabbed his phone and held it up. The Hercules app flashed red when he pointed it around the corner. Hydra, he confirmed what we already knew. Six of them, moving around. How'd they get past the perimeter? I asked. No idea, Tamash said. But they're there. Should we try to capture one? Yes, Natasha said. But leave that with me. Move in after I engage. Without waiting for a response, she went around the corner. We all shared a look. Uh, I said softly. I kinda wish I could see what was about to happen. Me too, a guy behind me said. Hello, boys, Natasha said from ahead of us. Tamash leaned over to look. I put my head over his to see as well. Black Widow was fighting in a room full of cafeteria tables, the kind of place that students could hang out. I'd played a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh on tables like those. Natasha parkoured over a one such table and kicked a Hydra agent while his friends were staring at Natasha. Apparently, her casual greeting had been enough to throw them off. When the first guy was reeling back, the others raised their hands up. Natasha grabbed the guy she'd kicked and pulled him in front of her. The soldiers hesitated long enough to let me take a good look at them. They were all dressed in black uniforms, with purple visored helmets. Over the outfits, they wore what looked like exoskeletons with gold sections on the chest and extremities, sections of them glowing with purple lights. Their hands had what looked like gauntlets on hands, with a section over their knuckles looked like a fusion of a brass knuckle and an energy weapon. When they couldn't get a shot on her, three of them activated rockets on their backs and feet, lifting into the air to move around. Natasha threw a taser disc at one of the flyers, making him scream and quiver in the air, slamming through a couple tables in an uncontrolled flight. Now, Tomash yelled. We went around the corner fast, the soldiers firing their guns as they moved in. After a moment of hesitation, I started shooting as well, my handgun bucking in my hands. Natasha shot the guy she was holding in the back and twisted out of the way of an attack. Hydra started shooting purple beams from the gauntlets on their hands, one shooting towards us. I ducked a beam and shot my gun at the guy who'd shot at me. He dodged and fired a shot at the soldier next to me, hitting him in the arm and sending him screaming to the floor with his arm removed. Incensed, I grabbed a taser disc and threw it at the guy. It attached to his foot, sending him into convulsions. The guy whose arm had been blasted off shot the Hydra agent in the throat. Natasha leaped from a pillar to grab one of the flying soldiers, bring him down and electrocuting him with her widow's bite gauntlets, the tasers built into her wrists. He screamed, passing out after a minute. 
One of the S.H.I.E.L.D. soldiers died when the last Hydra agent shot him and tried to blast out of a window, but he fell under the hail of bullets that hit him as assault rifles fired on his retreating form. Tamash looked around in the aftermath of the attack, turning to give Natasha and me a look of sadness when he saw one agent dead and another missing an arm. How did they get here? What is this stuff they got a hold of? Let's ask, Natasha looked at the Hydra agent on the floor. Dial, we may have more in the base. Go fast track, search through the academy and find out if there are others. I looked at her. She nodded. I raised the watch and switched to fast track, pressing the face down. In a moment, blue and black fur appeared on my form. I gave Natasha a wave, ignoring the shocked guests that followed my turning into an alien. I was about to leave when I looked at the dead shield agent, then the one whose arm had been removed, who was being tended to by one of his friends. Then I turned to Tamash. I'm sorry about your man there, I looked back at the man who'd lost his arm. And try to visit me when you get the chance. I'll try to whip you up a new arm, I left immediately afterward. Damn, Natasha was right. I really wished I'd read a map before coming here. I did my best, rushing through each hallway, sending papers scattering through the place in my wake. Empty classrooms, offices, dorms, nothing for a bit. Then I got to the other side of the campus. Hydra agents, about 15 men and one woman. The men were all dressed in the same futuristic armor as the others, the woman, funnily enough, wore a brown leather jacket and had a black tank top on. She also looked like Michelle Rodriguez. Damn it, she was probably someone special, if the trend in this universe followed. They were in one of the larger classrooms, the kind I saw in movies about colleges all the time, with the amphitheater style set up. I was at the top where the students sat, while Hydra had taken positions at the bottom near the professor's desk. As I watched, three more people popped into existence, surprising the hell out of me. They looked up when I entered, but I ran out the other door and lifted activated the communication function of the Omnitrix. This is Dial, I've found more Hydra at the classrooms. They're teleporting in somehow, we know, Natasha said. The guy we caught says Hydra has some sort of item, a phase something, he doesn't know the full name. Apparently, it lets them teleport wherever they have coordinates. Shit, I cursed. Okay, I'm going to switch to jury rig and create something to cut them off from teleporting. Can you do that? Natasha asked. No idea, but jury rig hasn't failed me yet, I responded. They're dropping into lecture hall 17B. I'm going to go grab some computers to make the device and try stopping them. Go ahead, Natasha said quickly. We'll meet you there. Rody, you hear all that? Yay, yeah, I got it, Rody responded. Even if they've got cheap copies of Tony's armor, I can stop them. Let us know if you and the Quinjets need help, Natasha said. Clint, Falcon, you get that. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out if they try to teleport to this academy too, Clint answered. Tamash is going to send a team to the bunkers, we'll meet Dial near their entry point, Natasha said. Move out. Author's note, so yeah, this was fun to write. The war is just beginning and Hydra is bringing a lot of toys out early. So Natasha asking Dial not to transform. There are reasons for it. First, using the aliens as an escape, treating his human form like it's somehow bad for him to confront his issues without changing personalities, is a bad idea. The Omnitrix has safety features to prevent that for good reason. More pragmatically, she wanted to wait until necessary to change him because the Omnitrix timeout is so unpredictable. Waiting will conserve the energy until it's needed. As soon as she saw there was danger, they were good. That said, Dial would have transformed anyways the moment he had to. He just knows good advice when he hears it. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 7 comments. Chapter 16, Davida. It didn't take me long to find a place with things I could make use of. Luckily I was in a school dedicated to science and technology and I soon found a room dedicated to engineering that was full of things like robot arms, half-built computers, and something that looked like a laser gun that had married a video game console. Everything was placed on the various tables and counters in haphazard ways, which made sense since any students that had been in there had evacuated out before they could put away their projects. I didn't stop to admire them. I entered the room as fast track and tapped the Omnitrix. I didn't call out when I changed, the need to be silent overriding the habit. Something interesting happened when I turned into the tiny form of jury rig this time. 
As I looked around at all the half-finished projects I could see all the love and care that had been put into them. Someone had clearly tried to build something beautiful with that robotic arm, something that could replace prosthetics. That computer over there had a chip more advanced than anything on the market, but I could see it was made for video games. It was a passion project, not just a school assignment. Most of what I could see was made by people who loved creating things. So I hopped onto the table and patted the robotic arm affectionately. Then I ignored it, and all the others. Instead, I ran to a shelf full of parts and tore into it, metal shelf included. A calculator had been left on the floor, so I grabbed that too. Disassemble. I coughed a moment later. Ah, disassemble, I whispered this time. Hopefully, there were no Hydra nearby to hear that first cry. I focused on my work, going through the various objects before finally finishing my first device. Considering the time crunch, I'd been forced to make something less ornate than I would have wanted, just something similar in shape to the Stargate from, well, Stargate. I raised the ring up in my red claws and adjusted it a bit. X, I whispered. You connected. Yes sir, he replied. Good, I'm about to activate this teleportation jammer. It'll work, but I want to see if the range is what I'm hoping for. I thought you were going to ask me to self-destruct. I blinked in shock. What? It is the common next step in fictional stories when a computer gains sentience despite the creator's wishes. In order to assuage any fears you may have, please know I am ready to self-terminate. I do not wish for you to be in trouble for my creation, nor to lead you to fear that I will hurt you or others. To that, I could only shake my head. What kind of angsty? X, those stories are bullshit. If you want, we can discuss it in full later, but know that I trust you. If it helps, focus on data from Star Trek, or Kit from Knight Rider. Then you'll know why I'm not worried. For now, we've got work to do buddy. 3. I felt like I'd been very abrupt. But the idea I couldn't trust X was ridiculous. Maybe, if I'd been human, I'd have been nicer. As jury rig, I knew him more than anyone else I'd ever meet. The question of his loyalty was ridiculous. Understood sir, he said over the comms. With that, I activated the ring. The center of the ring ejected several panels that changed the ring into a round disc, closing the iris. I can read the range of effect, sir, X said. It covers every bit of the school. I tweaked the device a bit. It has extended a yard. How far can you have the range of your device cover? Not as much as I wish, I admitted but it will be enough to prevent easy access to the school, and defend the rendezvous when we get there. Placing the iris device on my waist, I made one more device before I was finished. I reached for the Omnitrix and changed into fast track, the devices I'd made resting on my hips. I ran for the room, then took a detour to hide one of the devices I'd made, a just-in-case measure. This is Dial, I've finished the device. When they try to teleport in they'll just bounce back to where they came from now. Two. Good, Natasha said. Come back, we're going to need you. I'm already here, I said, coming to a stop next to her an instant later. Tamash and his guys pointed their guns at me, but Natasha held her hand up to stop them and nodded. They were a few rooms from the lecture area that Hydra had taken as a beachhead if they hadn't moved on. More shield agents stood with us, ready to move in, with some downstairs. All right, let's move in, Natasha said. Dial, Take out as many as you can while we move in. 3, 2, I leaned into a sprinting position. 1 dash. I was gone in an instant. I entered the room and looked around. The Hydra soldiers seemed confused as to why no more of their people were teleporting in. Apparently, they'd been hoping for more numbers before going on the attack, but there were only about 40 in the room now. Some were floating in the air in their armor like discount iron men. I leaped towards one at super speed smashing my feet into his chest as he floated there. I pushed off from him to jump towards another guy, twisting in the air to punch him in the face. As soon as I hit the ground, I was running again. Hydra realized there was someone in their midst, and tried to aim at me. But fast track was way too fast. I ducked around a purple bolt by dropping into a slide, then popped up for a blisteringly fast uppercut that sent a guy back flipping to smash into a wall. I did a back kick into another guy's knee, shattering his leg, then ran to a man who was taking off. He tried to shoot me, and I was forced to spin around the purple energy bolt. As soon as I was safe, I leaped up and grabbed him as he tried to fly away, pulling him down before spinning around ten times and throwing him at his friends. At the same time, S.H.I.E.L.D. rushed into the room through the upper and lower doors. They charged in weapons raised, 
yelling for surrender. That's when the woman who looked like Michelle Rodriguez acted. Her eyes began to glow a bright red, which could not be a good sign. She looked at the shield agents that had entered through the lower floor. They started staring at her with uncomfortably lustful eyes. Then they pointed their guns at the shield agents on the higher level and started shooting. Down. Tamash yelled, ducking behind some desks. What the hell are they doing? Dial, get their guns. Natasha yelled, shooting a Hydra agent in the head before her cover was blown apart by a purple beam, forcing her to switch to a different section. I had a moment of shock before I ran towards the shield agents. I passed through their ranks three times, grabbing their guns and piling them in my arms before running upstairs to drop them next to Tamash and his men. I looked at the shield agents, who blinked at their now empty hands before they pulled out handguns. I was going to run and pull those out of their hands as well when the shield agents held their guns to their heads. Stop. Michelle Rodriguez is double shouted. The room froze for a moment. Natasha looked at her and cursed. Davida. Hey, Nat, the woman said casually. The shield agents below, still holding guns to their heads, moved to join the Hydra soldiers. You look good. So do you, Natasha said casually, pointing her gun at the Hydra soldiers. That's a new trick. She nodded towards the shield agents currently threatening to kill themselves. The woman, Davida I guess, scowled but nodded. It's something Hydra gave me. I don't like using it, but I have my orders. Invade the academy and take the students. You're Hydra? Natasha asked. I'm hired by them, Davida corrected. Natasha, Tamash asked as I watched alongside him. Who is she? Davida smirked. Someone you love. Her eyes flashed red, which could not have been good. Damn it. Natasha attempted to fire her weapon. But by then, I was already in love with Davida. Why shouldn't I be? I'd always loved her. I'd only met her moments ago, but she was just so, perfect. Everything about her, from her raven hair to the way her leather jacket and blue jeans hugged her form. Two. That was when I saw Natasha pulling the trigger and acted before she could. With fast track speed, I kicked Natasha in the side. Not enough to break her ribs, but enough to push her to the floor. 1. As she landed, Tamash and the other shield agents grabbed at Natasha. She rolled to her feet, jammed an elbow into a soldier trying to wrap his arms around her, then kicked Tamash in the thigh when he tried to punch her. She leaped over a desk to escape another shield agent's grasp. Then I grabbed her by her hair and pulled until she was bent backward. Natasha struggled against my enhanced strength for a moment, then tossed a taser onto my chest. Aiyayayak. I screamed, letting go of her. Natasha spun away, then rolled when purple bolts and bullets aimed at her. Desperate to please my love, I ran towards her. Natasha got up to confront me, but she was far too slow. I was already. The Omnitrix timed out. I came to a stop in front of Natasha, who grabbed me by the shoulder and twisted around to throw me out the door behind her, the both of us getting out before bullets and purple beams passed through the air where we were once standing. Snap out of it. Natasha yelled at me, slamming my face into a wall. I already did. I yelled back. Natasha pressed me harder into the wall. Wait, what? I have a different brain now, pretty sure changing cures mind control. I yelled again. Although I was confused. I had been certain that the Omnitrix protected against that sort of thing, or maybe Davida's powers could overcome that somehow? One. That's useful, Natasha said. A whistle came from downstairs. We looked down the stairs and I groaned. Ah, shit. Davida was down the hall. She smirked up at us, then looked at me before her eyes glowed red. You titanic bitch dash I had time to mumble. Then I was in love again. But this time Natasha was ready. She grabbed the Omnitrix the second it turned green, twisted the dial, and slammed down on it before flipping away. I grew several feet. Orange and black striped fur grew across my body. I roared. A massive blast of noise that felt like freedom. Wrath. 1. Behind me, shield agents stormed out to start shooting at me. I ignored the bullets bouncing off my skin with ease. Let me tell you something, Davida who is working for Hydra. I yelled, grabbing a shield agent's gun and snapping it over my knee, before gently headbutting another. Wrath doesn't like getting mind controlled. Only Wrath can tell Wrath's brain what to do. 1. I got in the way of bullets that would have hit Natasha. She grabbed my head and flipped over me to kick the guy who shot at her, then springboarded off my back to kick another guy. Wrath's mind is like a black hole that reflects light. I roared, 
then sliced a gun in half with my claw before grabbing a Hydra soldier that had come out of the room to throw him over Natasha as fought two other men. 5. That's not how black holes work. Black Widow pointed out. Natasha grabbed another agent as he walked out and spun him to slam into a wall. I will protect my love. Tamash, yelling desperately, swung a metal baton surrounded by electricity, pressing it against me. I looked down at the baton sending a weak charge through my skin that left me wincing slightly, then grabbed it out of Tamash's hands and snapped it in half. That's when Davida had made it up the steps. She ran towards me with her soldiers hovering behind her and punched me in the face. To my shock, her fist sent me through the window behind me, sending me flying through the air with the loud sound of glass shattering. I fell into the courtyard below, and Davida followed, landing on my chest as the concrete below cracked under my landing. She looked into my eyes, smirking as they flashed red. You love me, she purred softly. Don't you? I stilled, locking my eyes onto her beautiful face. Wrath, loves you? Then I punched her in the chest. She let out a startled shout, flying back 20 feet and smashing through a pillar. 4. Natasha Romanoff slash Black Widow Natasha spared a glance when a massive noise was followed by Davida flying back from a punch thrown by Wrath. Huh. Guess he's immune. 2. She ducked a punch thrown by one of the shield agents and focused on the task at hand. She grabbed the arm of the man who'd tried to punch and elbowed him in the chest with a vicious and quick strike. Then she ran. Bullets and purple beams flew towards her as she entered a door and ran through a classroom. This is Black Widow. She shouted over the noise. Shield agents have been compromised by a mind manipulator. Ma'am, X said over the comms. I can see you on the school's cameras. I can mark any shield agents that have been affected by Davida DeVito's powers if you wish. I can use the Hercules app. Do it. Natasha yelled, rolling under a desk when another purple beam sizzled through the air to pass her. But I'm taking them out before that. In that case, Dial made sure to leave a non-lethal weapon nearby, in case he needed it, X said, surprising Natasha. Run down the hall, then enter the room on your left, the supply closet. He left a weapon for me. Natasha asked, sprinting at full speed before seeing the supply closet. She entered it and looked around. He left it for himself, X noted. A cautionary measure he did on a whim. It's installed with the Hercules app so that any Hydra using it would have it explode in their faces. A flashbang. Natasha sighed. I have no idea if I should commend him or be angry at him. She saw the device instantly. It looked like some sort of ray gun from an old sci-fi movie. Natasha grabbed it and looked it over. Any idea how to use it? Point and pull the trigger. What a time for the robot to discover sarcasm, Natasha said with a sigh. She left the room, holding the ray gun in a single hand. She took her time, listening closely to the area around her. After a moment of walking through the silent halls, she heard footsteps. Soon three shield soldiers and a pair of Hydra flyers turned the corner. As soon as she saw them she shot the gun in her hands. A strange green projectile shaped like a ball surrounded in a green ring slammed into one of the shield soldiers, lifting him up and tossing him back. Natasha fired again, taking out one of the Hydra flyers. As the flyer fell out of the air, the other three men started shooting, but Natasha ducked aside into a bathroom. The soldiers rushed after her, entering a small side hallway. 2. It was empty. For a moment, the three men looked around the small hallway in confusion, walked into the hallway. Hey boys, someone said, prompting the three to look up. Natasha had a smirk on her face as she held herself against the ceiling with her feet and hands against the walls to apply pressure and keep her in place, pointed her ray gun downwards. Three loud shots rang out, followed by three bodies hitting the floor. Natasha dropped to the floor and went around the corner. Tamash stood there, looking surprised as they almost bumped into her. He swung a fist at Natasha but she ducked it to gut punch Tamash. He fell back then received a kick in the head that brought him to the ground. Tamash went to rise up, but Natasha shot him in the chest, knocking him unconscious. Well, just a few more to go, Natasha mused to herself. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 5 comments. Chapter 17, Wrath's Love. Mahmoud Shaft slash Dial. I rose to my feet and growled when seven Hydra soldiers floated out of the window I'd broken to start shooting at me. Let me tell you something, stupid Hydra Iron Man knockoffs. I roared as they shot at me. Dumb purple beams aren't enough to stop true love. I leaped up, 
trying to pull one down so I could probably beat his face in, but he rose out of the way. Stand still so Wrath can beat you up and present your broken bodies to Wrath's beloved. 1. To my frustration, they responded by shooting me in the face and chest with bright beams of purple light. All right, that's it. Now Wrath's going to have to improvise because Wrath left his giant fly swatter at home. I took a page out of Creel's playbook and ran to a vending machine, grabbing and tossing it with great speed. Haley's flight. The Hydra soldier I threw it at tried to dodge but fell out of the sky when the vending machine full of candy bars and gummy bears slammed into his legs, shattering them. I grabbed another one, but Hydra separated to make it hard for me to aim. I roared. Then a hail of bullets came out of the sky. They hit one of the Hydra men shooting me, sending him to the floor in a pool of blood. Hey, kid. Rhodey flew over to me, firing two repulsor beams. These the guys. Yeah. I yelled happily. At the same time, Davida rose up from the remains of the pillar I'd sent her through and started striding towards us. And that's the woman Wrath loves. Rhodey looked at me through the face mask of his helmet. Wait, what? Hey, shoot her. I yelled. Wrath wants to see if she's bulletproof. 3. You need to work on your romance, Rhodey mumbled. Then his minigun spun around and shot at Davida. She walked through the hail of bullets, letting them bounce off her skin with no effect. Her leather jacket was torn to pieces, her tank top and jeans were ripped, but her face was unchanged. Then she started to grow. Slowly, she rose in height and weight until she was only an inch shorter than I was, her body expanding with muscle, growing denser in general. Her jeans and tank top stretched as well, but held strong despite her growth, leaving her looking kinda badass. 1. She looked over at Rhodey with a familiar smirk. I moved in front of him and smiled at her, not affected when her red eyes hit me. After all, I already loved her. You take Hydra. I said. Seriously, what is going on? Rhodey asked as he rose up to start dogfighting the Hydra soldiers now trying to kill him, dodging their purple beams to fire his repulsors. Let me tell you something war machine. I yelled joyfully, rushing towards the now massive Davida, who raised her fists up. Wrath's about to ask her to marry Wrath. If you're lucky, Wrath might just ask you to be Wrath's best man. 1. Davida dodged around my charge, then grabbed me by the waist and spun to throw me through a wall. I crashed through the concrete and landed in a classroom. She ran after me, punching at my face as I rose up, but I blocked her fist on my arm. I clawed at her face, and she winced as the razor-sharp weapon on my fist bounced off her chin, though it did leave a small cut in the process. I grabbed her by the shoulders and headbutted her. Vredfort headbutt. She took the blow, then returned it with a headbutt of her own. With that, we began punching each other, our massive forms tearing through the school. Colonel James Rhodey Road slash War Machine. Rhodey shook his head as he watched the giant tiger and woman throw themselves into the school. I miss normal sometimes, Rhodey said to himself. Then he was flying after a Hydra soldier. The man tried to shot Rhodey as the pair flew in the air, but Rhodey dived around the glowing purple and fired a single repulsor blast into the other man's chest. As though signaled by the death of the first soldier, other Hydra came out of the building. All Quinjets. Rhodey yelled as he fired the machine guns on his arms and shoulder at the dozens of men rising into the sky. Prepare to engage hostiles, ones in power armor. Roger that, war machine. Several aircraft spun to face the school. Rhodey dived into the Hydra flyers and smashed one in the chest with a hard kick, spinning to shoot another one with a repulsor blast as his minigun aimed fire at several more, hitting one in the legs and another in the chest. A Hydra agent flew into Rhodey's back and held on, shooting him in the back with his gauntlet weapon. War Machine yelled in pain as his HUD sent him warnings, and spun in the air to throw the guy off him before his minigun spun around to kill the man. War Machine rose up and fired off repulsor blasts and bullets as fast as he could. Hydra soldiers spun around in the skies and tried killing him, their purple beams sometimes slamming into him. Rhodey grunted as he took a couple hits to the chest that scared his armor, but thanked God for Tony when the suit held strong. The Quinjets joined in and started shooting as well. Some of the Hydra flyers swarmed one of the Quinjets, their gauntlet fire tearing the aircraft apart. Rhodey dived down suddenly when he saw a group of Hydra flyers trying to get to the parking lot. He went under a bridge while shooting one in the back with a repulsor, stopped to grab one by the leg and spin the Hydra flyer around to throw him at a stone bench, then flew forward shooting with every bullet he had. 
The men in the parking lot that had been turned into an evacuation point saw the Hydra flyers coming towards them and began firing upon them. Bullets and purple beams flew back and forth between the two groups. Rhodey joined in, shooting at the Hydra soldiers. One of them flew at Rhodey, screaming. One head falls, two shall rise. Rhodey blocked the punch the Hydra soldier threw at him, then fired a hail of bullets into the chest of the man, the Hydra flyer's armor shattering under the bullets before he fell. Guess I should take out two more, War Machine quipped. With that, he raised his arms and kept shooting, sparing a moment to wonder what the massive booming noises behind him were. Mahmoud Sheikh slash Dial, you're good at this. I complimented, hoping she liked me as much as I liked her. Stadizian reversal. With a twist of my hips, I threw her to the ground and started punching her in the face. She took a bunch of blows that shattered the floor under her, then raised her legs up and kicked me in the chest. I flew up and crashed through the ceiling. She leaped up after me through the hole I'd made, punching me in the face. Yes. I roared in joy. Wrath knew you liked Wrath. 1. Are you a masochist? Davida replied, giving me a kick to the ribs that sent me flying through some desks. 1. Wrath doesn't know what that means. I replied honestly, rising up as she ran towards me. I punched at her, and her fist smashed into mine. A shockwave was released by impact, destroying the area around us. Wrath would be honored if you married Wrath. There is something wrong with you. She yelled, stepping back. We're all crazy when we're in love. 4. Davida dropped low and wrapped her arms around my waist, pushing me back and slamming me into a wall, then threw it. I raised my arms up and slammed my claws into her ribs and back, over and over again. She yelled in anger, lifted up and pushed me through another wall. I backflipped as soon as I was through that wall, and rose to look at her. Damn it. Davida grabbed a teacher's desk and threw it at me. I punched it out of the air, ignoring the shattered pieces with ease. You're supposed to be in love with me. Why are you fighting? To prove Wrath's love. How else would Wrath do that? I shouted back with a grin. I leaped forward and she did the one thing that could have made me like her even more. 1. She slipped under my attack, grabbed my waist, then bent backwards to slam me into a suplex that sent me down through the floor. I landed on the next floor with a massive smile on my face. You're a wrestler. Yet, yeah, Davida dropped through the floor and glared at me. So, let me tell you something, pretty lady who looks like Michelle Rodriguez but is as big as me, I rolled to my feet and rushed her. It means Wrath can fight for real. 2. Davida's Michelle Rodriguez face twisted into horror when I reached out and grabbed her arm, twisting it behind her back. And tear I an arm bar. I sprinted forward with her in front of me, slamming her through a wall, then pressing her face into another one. Afia Kuz faceplant. She yelled, twisting to throw me down the hallway we'd crashed into. I grabbed her arm to try and flip her, but she pulled a perfect counter to send me flying instead. I backflipped in the air and slammed my claws into the floor, slicing through the linoleum to come to a stop. Davida grabbed a water fountain out of the wall and threw it at me. I took the blow to my head and let the metal and plastic shatter around me. I ran towards her and slipped around a punch to go for a suplex. She countered by dropping from the grab before I could complete it, spinning to slam an elbow into my neck. I eyed her, trying to look unfazed by the blow. Then I pointed at the spot she'd hit. Wanna try again? Davida's eyes widened. Then she grinned. Boom. I grinned as she stepped back, the shockwave that followed her hit sending a crack of noise in the air. She stood still when I stepped forward and swung my elbow at her. Boom. She smiled in chow leg, not moving an inch. Boom. 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 Back and forth, in a game of dominance, we slammed our elbows into each other's necks, chaining our attacks as we grinned at each other. After a bit, we stepped back. My neck hurt like hell, but I didn't react to it. Neither did she. I rushed forward with a running knee, and she stepped aside and clotheslined me. I slammed into the floor and rolled aside when she came with an elbow drop. I rose to my feet and grabbed her as she tried to rise up from the floor. At a disadvantage, I got her head between my knees, squeezing, then grabbed her hips. With a lift I raised her up so her legs were on my shoulder, then began to throw her back first towards the floor. Porsche power bow dash. Her legs wrapped around my neck. She spun around, pulling me with all her strength. Titania Hurricarina. 2. With a picture-perfect counter, I was sent flying, slamming into a trophy case, past that through another wall, then into a desk. I blinked for a second, then rose up and walked towards the hole my entrance made. 
Davida stared at me as I walked up. Titania like the moon, I asked. She shook her head, panting. No, it was my name when I wrestled. I nodded seriously, then groaned slightly in pain. She was strong, stronger than even Creel in his vibranium form. But I knew I could beat him even then, that only the Omnitrix timing out had stopped me. Wrath was unbeatable. And I knew I could beat her now, bruises or not. Wrath had to prove he truly loved her after all. I ran at her, and Davida tried to duck my outstretched arms. But I grabbed her by the hair and used my vicious grip to knee her in the face. Over and over, until blood dripped from her nose. As she looked at me blearily, I got behind her and wrapped arms around her stomach. Finishing move. One suplex. Final. Another one, this time shaking the academy. Atomic. I leaped upwards, crashing through three floors before we ended up outside of the school, in the open air. I could see Quinjets battling Hydra soldiers, war machine flying by to shoot one in the face. Then we began to drop. Buster. Floor by floor, Davida's head leading, we crashed through the school. Finally, we came to a stop on the bottom level. I rose up and looked down at Davida. As I watched, she slowly began to shrink until she'd returned to her former size. When she didn't move, I took her pulse, actually showing a bit of intelligence beyond fighting. Her heartbeat was there, she was just knocked out. 1. Wrath wins? When you wake up we should get married, I said idly. Although, if you say otherwise, Wrath will respect your decision. 7. Feeling warm towards the love of my life, I placed her on my shoulder and walked away, leaving the various holes in the ceiling and the crater we'd created behind. When I got outside, there were dead or injured Hydra everywhere. A few of them had been captured, however, getting pushed into a Quinjet. Two of the Quinjets had been downed, but I didn't see more than a fraction of dead shield soldiers compared to Hydra. Natasha was speaking to an embarrassed looking Tamash when I walked up, still in wrath form. Tamash glared at Davida, who was still unconscious on my shoulder. She dead. He asked angrily. I shook my head. Not, nah, just sleeping off the beating wrath gave her. He scoffed. She deserves a bullet in the head. I don't know what she did, but I don't like having my mind played with. Davida DeVito, Natasha said with a sigh, and enhanced with the power to grow in size and strength. Making people fall in love with her is new though, otherwise, I wouldn't have gone in there with so many. Natasha looked at me. Do her powers not work on you? Are you licensed to do marriages? I asked suddenly instead of answering, focusing on the real issue. Natasha and Tamash stared at me, surprised. Ah, uh, no, no I am not. I wilted in disappointment. Hold on, Tamash said. If you're in love with her, why did you still fight her? I scoffed. Let me tell you something, Agent Tamash Calderon of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Apoplexians like Wrath know the best way to show true love is to show off your fighting skills. Throwing a punch is how we show we care? Whoever wins gets to marry the other one. Wait, you mean you get married no matter who wins? Natasha asked, looking confused. It's a win-win. I shouted proudly. Then I got worried. Unless she says no, then Wrath will be respectful. Two. Right about then is when I timed out and became human again. I dropped Davida in surprise and blinked. I looked around. Shield agents were staring at me. A couple were trying not to laugh and failing outright. Rhodey was floating nearby, his face played up so he could grin at me. Well that's embarrassing. I stated. Understatement of the freaking century. Wrath, why do you cause as many problems as your fists solve? Natasha grinned at that. I can't wait to tell Tony about this. Yup. Any respect I'd gained from my fellow heroes had gone down the drain. I sighed and decided to start finding a nice place to dig a hole for me to live in. Thank you so much, Jennifer Weaver said as her students ran out of the school to head to Quinjet's moments later. Davida had been placed in a cryo unit I'd turned into jury rig to make, suspended animation until we could jail her someplace she couldn't physically break out of. Not a problem, Tamash said, a band-aid on his head from where Natasha had apparently kicked him while he'd been in love. Is this everyone? Tamash said ushering the students into the Quinjets. Almost, the grateful look on Weaver's face became a scowl. All the members of Hydra are going last. I'm not putting them together with the others, despite her anger, there was some sadness in her eyes. Tamash nodded, though he also had a sad look on his face as he watched some of his men get put in body bags. I watched from a bench nearby, Rhodey standing next to me. Man, that was a lot crazier than I expected, I admitted to Rhodey. Yeah, he said. 
I haven't had a routine mission since the day I put this thing on, to be honest. And my adventures still aren't that crazy. Sometimes I try to tell Tony about some crazy mission, and it's like he's trying to stay awake. Well you did just fight a small army of Hydra soldiers while flying around Quinjets over a school of geniuses while a giant tiger and giant woman fought inside of it, I noted. That has to earn a few points. Nah, pretty sure the Battle of New York still beats that, Natasha said, walking up to join us. Rhodey nodded in annoyance, though he clearly didn't mind that much. So what now? We go back to the helicarrier, Natasha said. You going to join us? I should report to my superiors. But I can do that at the carrier, Rhodey said. I'm still needed in this fight if you all will have me. Well, it's not up to me, I noted, rising from my seat. But it's good to have you here. So, I pressed on the Omnitrix and pressed on the dial. Upgrade. Standing up I looked at Rhodey and Natasha. Wanna fly back in style? I asked. The pair shared a look. Natasha grinned. You just want to distract us from telling Tony anything, don't you? Natasha said. Do you want to fly in an upgraded Quinjet or not? Jerks. I turned and walked away as Rhodey chuckled. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. So yet, yeah, apoplexians don't see romance the way humans do. If someone shows interest, it's through fighting, much like handshakes. That isn't to say Wrath wouldn't have respectfully backed off, but the combination of Davida's mind whammy and his natural instincts made him want to fight. The way I figured it, it was just how warriors like him court each other and Wrath respects people who say no. Wrath respects a woman's right to choose? Comment. Six comments. Chapter 18, On a Fun Trip with Upgrade. Moments later my black and green form was joined up with our Quinjet as we rocketed through the sky. I did a roll while Rhodey whopped in joy and Natasha smirked, the two piloting me back to the heli carrier. Hey, Natasha asked suddenly as we flew. How many environments can you survive in? I blinked a singular green eye. What sort do you want me to survive in? Natasha pulled on the controls, guiding me to downwards. Curious, I went where she told me to. Ah, uh, Natasha. Rhodey asked. There was nothing but blue ocean below us. Natasha had that confident smirk on her face as she pushed me to go faster until I broke the sound barrier, not letting up on our downward course at all. Natasha. Rhodey yelled in a panic. We slammed into the ocean. My surface adjusted to the impact with ease as we dived further and further down into the cold water. I took my radar and sensors and adjusted them for the ocean while turning my hut into something that would allow Natasha and Rhodey to see in the dark of the sea as though it was lit by a Hollywood movie crew. Wow, Rhodey said in awe. The bottom of the ocean soon came into view. Still flying at hypersonic speed, I took us to the nearest objects my radar could find. I slowed down and floated upwards when we came closer to the objects I sensed drifting through the waves. Soon, we were in view. A pod of orca whales drifted through the ocean, incredibly massive animals that glided in the water as I flew in to join them. The beautiful animals eyed us as I swam alongside them, the sounds of their clicks surrounding them. Their black and white forms seemed to glide with a grace that left me in awe. The three of us watched for a moment. Rhodey rested his elbows on my dashboard while Natasha rested in her seat and let me pilot myself for a bit. Soon though, I decided to look for something else thanks to a wish to fulfill an old dream of mine. With a bit of regret, I turned around, leaving the orcas behind. I headed towards coordinates after doing a quick Google search, moving through the ocean faster than the world's top fighter jets. It didn't long for me to get where I was headed. Mahmoud. Natasha said, just... I've always wanted to see this, I said. What? Rhodey asked. You find Atlantis or something? I chuckled at that. No, but we're in the North Atlantic, and according to my GPS, this should be off the coast of Newfoundland at the right coordinates. I'll admit, maybe it's kind of stereotypical of me to think hey, I can swim to the bottom of the ocean at high speed, I want to go to sea. I trailed off when it came into view. A ship, resting on the bottom of the ocean. Well, the front of one. It was brown and rusted and cracked in various locations. The part where it had torn from its back section looked squashed, as though a giant had pulled it until it snapped. A metal pole rested across the top of it. Despite the decrepit look of the wreck, it had a sort of majesty to it. You could see the remnants of the great ship it had once been. The Quinjet being positively tiny next to it helped. Okay, that is cool, Rhodey said, looking closer. That's... Natasha added softly. The Titanic, I clarified. 
I've always wanted to see her. It's been a dream of mine since I was a kid. Granted, I wasn't the submarine in my dream. While I could easily see every bit of the ship with my robotic eyes even despite the darkness, I still shone a light across its surface, simply for how cool it looked. We flew around the ship, Rody taking photos on his phone and Natasha watching peacefully. After a while, Natasha spoke. Okay, time to go. Unless you have something else you've always wanted to see. I thought about that. Then I rose up, shooting towards the surface. As we slammed into the open air, I kept going, making it clear that my only goal was up towards the sky. Oh come on, Rody groaned. Don't tell me you want to see satellites or something. No, I admitted. But I want to see the curvature of the Earth. See if those flat Earth people know what they're talking about. Speaking as a former fighter pilot and current owner of flying power armor capable of going up that high, I guarantee you they aren't, Rody said in the dry tones of the severely offended. Passing the clouds, we were soon high enough that blue sky became black night. My rockets glowed green, pushing me through the atmosphere. The rotors in my wings twisted into engines similar to those one would see on fighter jets. Soon, we were out of the atmosphere, in the middle of true space. From there, I turned us around. I could see the Earth's beauty below. I could sense satellites in the distance. The sun glowed with enough power to blind a person without protection, which made me glad I'd prepared for that by polarizing the window for Rody and Natasha. And I could sense the moon in the distance. Reaching my sensors out until they were far more powerful than anything on Earth, I found what I was looking for. They were hiding pretty well, but they were there. I hid away that confirmation. Instead, I focused on the view, on the side of the clouds on the planet below, on the sun, burning so beautifully, and the place beyond all that. My sensors became telescopes, and I showed Rody and Natasha close-up views of the other planets. None of us said anything. We simply watched the wonder around us in peace. After a moment, we twisted back towards the Earth. I didn't know what to think. The things we had seen. Few people on Earth had seen either the Titanic in its final resting place on the bottom of the ocean or the deep of space with the Earth rolling beneath them. I couldn't imagine many who had ever seen both. Somehow it felt, like a privilege. Something I had to earn now. Thanks, Natasha said. I, I never thought I would see things like that. Me either, I admitted. I wish we had time. With aliens around, there are planets to visit. People we could talk to. There is so much to do out there. Earth isn't good enough for ya, Rody asked jokingly. I barked out a laugh. No, of course it is. Our planet is hands down the best man, we created the telephone. Pretty sure other aliens have the telephone too, Natasha noted. Well, we also made Cinnabon though, I joked. So what? Rody asked. You eager to see the aliens your watch turns you into. Flying as the Quinjet, I felt glad I could hide my reaction. I mean, I'll be honest, Rody said. I would not like to fight an entire species that can turn heli carriers into their own personal death machines. Or unstoppable monsters like Wrath or Diamond Head. I didn't answer. Natasha clearly noticed my lack of reaction, but I simply flew towards the heli carrier. It might be time to give explanations to the group. Maybe not right that second, but after I'd had a moment to think. Comment. 6 Comments. Chapter 19, Cowlson is Alive. So Rody tells me you cheated on him with a giant woman, Tony said a grin as soon as he saw me on the catwalk, staring down at the ocean. He walked up and sat next to me. I mean what, you two join bodies one second, then you're hitting on someone else the next, you promiscuous bastard. First off, I said with a scowl, you, of all people, calling me promiscuous dash. He's devastated, Tony said, still grinning. I mean, you two were once one body, one soul. Then a red-eyed tart comes along. I've read the tabloids, I'm pretty sure not a single supermodel on Earth hasn't at least heard a crappy pickup line from you Dash. I know you're young, but love like the one Rody and you share only comes wait did you call my pickup lines crappy? Kid, I've been with more woman than you've ever stared longingly at Dash. We were arguing in the room that had now become the hangout on the ship, some place that had once been the clear dome on the bottom of the heli carrier. We stood on the catwalk that led to the tower in the center of the room. After a moment, we both ran out of insults, simply staring at the ocean below. Rody said you wanted to talk to me about something. Tony asked. I mean, I generally ignore requests, but if you put one in with happy. I snorted. It's about you replicating upgrade. It's about X. It's about a million things. 
HMF, Tony moved to sit on the catwalk, letting his legs dangle in the air. Well, that's a lot. You want to start with how X is an AI. When I gave him a surprised look, he smirked. Come on, who are you talking to? Of course, I knew. I figured out he'd evolved almost immediately. Is that possible? I asked. For an AI to develop in a single day. Eh, depends on the AI, Tony said. I've been trying to make something like that myself, to run certain projects. Tony waved for me to sit down. Once I'd done so, he spoke again. Okay, so here's the thing. I want to bring you in on some projects me and a friend have been working on. Usually, you would be too dumb for me to even mention it dash. I do my best, I said offended. Losers whine about their best, Tony said without skipping a beat. Anyways, where was I? Oh right. Your watch is the most advanced thing I've seen. Hands down. And jury rig can make some unbelievable things out of literal junk. But if we work together. He removed one of the communications devices we'd made from his ear and held it out. This thing is going to revolutionize how we talk to people, kid. I mean, quantum entanglement? The ability to talk to someone who is across the universe instantly. No worrying about lag or things like light speed. Once we figure out how to make these without jury rig, and mass produce it, it'll change the world. I leaned against the metal railing, swinging my legs as I watched him put it away. You use that watch to turn into mad geniuses, I help you make cool toys, you help me do the same, and I'll pay you. How's that sound? What about S.H.I.E.L.D.? I asked. What, you want to work for them too? Tony asked. Sure, we'll throw it in the contract. Just no sharing anything you make for me with them, not without them paying us a shit ton. Deal. I thought about that for a moment. Working with whatever S.H.I.E.L.D. was going to become, making money by creating things with Tony freaking Stark. That sounded awesome. I'm in, I said. But one thing. We do everything, and I mean everything, to make sure not to create some sort of Skynet machine, okay? If some robot similar to Upgrade got out, we'd all be in some shit. Tony rolled his eyes. All right, fine. I'm serious, I said. I know making robots is cool, but if we do make them, let's make sure they're run by an AI we know isn't crazy, and that any we develop are on a non-networked computer on the moon, while making sure it knows humans are friends, not fuel. He chuckled, nodding. Yeah, all right kid. Welcome to the Stark Industries R&D department. Bruce is going to love your paranoia. Later we'd arrived at the rendezvous, sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, with no land in sight for hundreds of miles, was the Iliad. It was kinda funny seeing her in the middle of the water with two inside heli carriers flying over to join her. Sort of a mesh of the old and new. Quinjets and helicopters flew came from across the world, carrying shield agents and personnel from bases everywhere. Our heli carrier was where the proceedings would take place, so I watched from on top of the command tower as people began to arrive. Tony, Steve, and Clint were with me, all dressed in casual clothes now. I'd chosen to wear a shield t-shirt and sweatpants as we watched the people come onto the ship in droves. Iron Man's good mood had evaporated by now as we watched a plane with rocket engines slowly hover to land on the flight deck. The black plane, called the bus, was big enough that a parking space had to be set aside for it. I can't believe he was alive all this time, Tony said. He wasn't, I replied. You saw the same files we did. Whatever, temporarily dead. Tony spat out. Damn it, I, I mourned for that guy. I went to his funeral, I sent his girlfriend flowers and, Shit. Steve placed a hand on Tony's shoulder, and didn't look offended when Tony shrugged it off. He has a lot to answer for, but he did sacrifice everything for the world to try and stop Loki. For that, we should give him a moment to try to explain. Explain why he lied to us. Tony shook his head. I'm not wired like that, Steve. It wasn't anything personal, Clint noted. Of course you'd say that, Tony scoffed. I sat down and watched as the bus landed. Soon, the hatch in the back opened, and its occupants came out. In the center stood Philip J. Carlson, the target of Tony's ire. A man who had died, but was brought back to life in a project called Tahiti, one so secret I couldn't find out any specifics about it. With him were five other people. Leopold Fitz, a young man with curly brown hair and a mind so brilliant it left me in awe. Standing next to Gemma Simmons, a young woman with long brown hair and a mind for biology that left me just as amazed as Fitz. The two geniuses stood close to each other. Apparently they were together so often people would simply call them Fitzsimmons. 
Melinda May, an older Asian woman with long black hair, and someone so famous in S.H.I.E.L.D. that the personnel were constantly whispering about the legend of the cavalry. A lot of people were trying to find a way to get her with the other famous fighters of our little fleet to start a some sort of tournament between them. Then there was Sky, last name not chosen. Jarvis had found information that she was actually named Mary Sue Poots, which, goddamn, no wonder she changed it. Mary Sue was bad enough to my writer's sensibilities, considering the hatred connected with that name, Poots was freaking ridiculous. She was a skilled hacker, enough for Jarvis to acknowledge her, and was a recent addition to S.H.I.E.L.D. Last was Antoine Tripp Triplet, a skilled operative in his own right, and, interestingly, a descendant of a howling commando. He was a tall and extremely fit man, with a well-groomed mustache. The group seemed devastated, a sort of heavy sadness shared between them all, even the stoic-looking May. As they walked forward, I saw Sharon Carter call out to Tripp, who smiled. He walked up to her and the two hugged in greeting. Peggy Carter's great-niece and Gabe Jones' grandson, I noted as I watched them speak. Guess it makes sense they know each other. Huh. Tony watched them meet with a complicated look on his face. So did Steve. I say it's just what we need, Clint said. We're rebuilding S.H.I.E.L.D. It only makes sense for the descendants of the people who made it to be there for it. Tony didn't seem to know what to think of that, possibly thinking of his father as he watched his fellow members of the descendants of Steve's Friends Club. We watched Carlson and his team enter the ship. Next came the crew of the Iliad, flying up on a Quinjet. Robert Gonzalez, the captain of the Iliad, was in the center of his team. He'd only brought three people, none of whom I recognized, since I'd only checked Cowlson team on Tony's behalf. One of them, a tall woman with long black hair, looked like Lucy Lawless from Xena, Warrior Princess though, and the blonde had the same looks as the first officer from the show The Orville, one of my favorite TV shows in my world. They must have been fairly important in this universe. Jarvis, I asked, knowing he was listening over comms. Tell me about the three people with Gonzalez. Of course sir, Jarvis said. After a second, he spoke once more. The blonde woman is Dash. Bobby Morse, Clint said fondly. I kept from flinching as I realized I was looking at Mockingbird. Then I realized something. Ex-girlfriend. Clint looked up at me, startled. I grinned at him, as did Tony. Ah. Uh, oh my god, Tony said with delight in his voice. Two super spies dating? Scandalous. Glass houses? Tony, Steve noted. Yeah, like I'd live in one again, but the last one is still rubble in Malibu, Tony said, still grinning at Clint. So what, you guys met while stabbing someone at the same time? Clint sighed in annoyance. Can't you keep bothering Dial about his weird love triangle with Rhodey and a super villainess? Oh come on. I yelled, annoyed. I'm terrible enough with women without you guys spreading rumors. Nah, Tony said. Girls like guys with a weird sexual history makes them curious. Plus, can you imagine how useful some of your aliens would be for Dash? Okay. Steve interrupted. He spun around to walk away, not going to be part of this conversation. Hey Natasha, hey Sam. We all spun to see an amused black widow staring at us with a very amused smirk on her face, Sam grinning madly. Catch you ladies at a bad time. Natasha teased. Can you teach me how to flirt? I asked, frustrated so I can somehow expunge the damage Tony is doing to my romantic reputation. If anything, I'm helping, Tony smiled innocently when I glared at him. Hey, I'm just saying. Some ladies might be into a guy who can turn into aliens like Upgradash. Please no. I plugged my ears in horror. For the love of God. Natasha rolled her eyes at our antics. Then she looked at me. Dial, I unplugged my ears when I saw how serious she was. We need to talk. About everything. Fury sent us, Sam added. Said it was time you told us where you came from, he said apologetically. Okay, but I'm going to need some stuff for that. Comment. Four comments. Chapter 20, Telling Them Truth, Multiverse. Okay, but I'm going to need some stuff for that. Moments later, I'd gathered everyone in a room that had once been dedicated to conferences. Avengers only though, that meant Fury, Tony, Steve, Natasha, and Clint. A small group to learn something that could be earth-shattering. The five of them watched as I worked in jury rig form. I was creating a large ring in the center of the room, building it from one of the Hydra armors Natasha had found, a TV, and a broken Quinjet ring. It looked like something I'd seen from a kid's show once, 
just a metal ring as tall as Natasha with a bottom section attached to the floor, the armor piece stapled to the ring, literally stapled actually, and the flat screen TV broken and attached to the bottom. Soon, I was done. Fix, fix, fix. I cried triumphantly, stepping away. Okay, so what is it? Fury asked. You'll see. I chirped. An entire machine just to tell us where you came from and got the watch. Natasha asked skeptically. And why only us? Clint added. Give him a chance to explain, Steve said. Mahmood, go ahead. One more thing, I took a deep breath, then tapped the Omnitrix. My red skin became black with green circuits, and I grew far larger in an instant. Upgrade. With that, I joined with the ring. This is called the viewer, I explained as I joined with it. I needed the Chidori parts dash. Chidori. Steve asked, startled. That's where Hydra got them from. They did look familiar, Clint noted. Yeah, I can read their code, I said. But yeah, I needed them for their power. This, this is going to take a lot, I said. The only way this is going to work is for a couple of minutes. I'm using the arc reactor from this heli carrier to power it, and I need to be upgraded to even work with that. I can't do it for long either, this thing is basically thinning the walls between universes just for a glimpse. You're really not making this clear, Fury said. Are you about to break my ship? No, I said. The fact is, I've tried this before. Shut down the power in my burrow for three days and only got static. But with the big arc reactor, my new experience, and upgrade, all working together. I won't keep it up for long, and this thing will implode on itself afterwards, but it will be enough for me to show you guys. Besides, I admitted, I don't want this thing to last too long. I'm worried about who I'll piss off, now fully integrated into the ring, I took a breath for dramatic effect, since upgrade didn't need air. I am from Oregon. I was born in Oakland. But, not your Oregon, not your Oakland. What? Clint asked. I activated the viewer. The sensation that followed was painful. I pulled in power from the arc reactor, and actually felt the massively powerful engine struggle to keep up with the demand. Even for all of Jury Rig's genius, I felt the ring I'd made almost buckle inwards under the weight of the task. I adjusted myself, advanced the machine in a dozen different ways. I fought through a strange sort of pain, and I felt the energy pull at my nonite body. It was a struggle, but after a fight to stay in control, I was showing an image of Captain America speaking to Black Widow, but not the ones I'd come to know and love. The Captain America here had his mask down, revealing someone very different under it. One I'd only recently become familiar with, but that one of us had known his whole life. Bucky. Steve asked in shock. Whoa, Tony said as he watched Natasha give him a very loving kiss that Bucky returned. Natasha. That. Natasha stared. That's me, but different. It was true. This was comic book Natasha. Slightly taller, with longer hair and a gold belt that held a familiar symbol on the center. She had gold bracers on her wrist. Bucky was clean shaven unlike the one getting deprogrammed in another room. His hair was cut, and he wore a blue and black spandex version of Steve's uniform. Well, unstable molecules rather than spandex, but still. This is another reality, I said. A universe where Bucky and Natasha ended up together, according to the scans I'm getting from it. I switched the view to the next place and felt the arc reactor struggle with it, but there was no danger of the machine disappearing on me. Tony uncrossed his arms when he saw himself as a teenager. Is that, me, Rhodey, and Pepper? The three of them were standing around in casual clothes with an Iron Man suit in front of them. The teenagers were joking with each other, clearly close. But I didn't meet them until Dash. Not in this reality, I corrected. But there, you have been friends for much longer. Another one. This time, it was Clint. He winced at the sight. Well, shit. Hawkeye was sitting in a chair, his head and limbs strapped to it. He was wearing only a white tank top and orange pants. He'd clearly been tortured and was surrounded by men carrying guns. Is this happening right now? Steve asked, worried. Can we help somehow? Hell, is this even real? Tony asked, apparently fascinated. It is, I answered. But the way this works is that I'm only getting glimpses. This actually happened further back in this world's history. I wouldn't worry though. Why not? Clint asked, clearly disturbed. At that moment, as some guy with a scar over his right eye leaned in towards Hawkeye to taunt him, Hawkeye flicked his right index finger. Scar guy suddenly grabbed his neck, 
choking on something. Hawkeye did the same with his left index finger, and a soldier had the same reaction. His left then right thumb flicked as well, and more men began to die until they were all done. As they fell, a scientist type who'd been watching the proceedings asked a question. What the hell? He said in shock. Hawkeye responded as a fingernail was held tightly between his fingers. Shouldn't have left my fingernails in, dummy. Now be smart and get me out of here, or this goes right between you eyeballs. Can you do that? Tony asked his universe's Hawkeye in shock as the group stared at the dimensional viewer. No, Clint admitted. Might be worth learning though. Yeah, well, I switched away. The rest of that universe sucks. How do you know? Natasha asked. How do you have those world's histories? I felt thankful for my current machine form. It made it easy to lie. I'm scanning them, I explained. It's damn exhausting, but I can get summaries on what I'm showing you. How the hell are you doing that? Clint asked. Mostly news stories and the internet, I said helpfully. But it hurts like hell. This is hurting you. Steve asked, worried. I ignored him to focus once more. The next world made everyone blink. It was a white man with black hair going gray at the sides, sitting at a desk and smoking a cigar as he worked on something. As they watched, Maria Hill walked into view. Well, Maria with an expression on her face as though she'd seen a bad smell. Who is? Oh come on, Fury said when the man lifted his face to reveal the eye patch. In this universe, I explained. You're the descendant, the Nick Fury Jr. to this guy, who has been kept alive since World War II by an experimental drug. Enough, Fury said. How do we know this is all real? That it's not just some trick you've pulled off? Why would I tell this kind of lie? I asked. I'm from another universe. One where superheroes aren't running around. Apparently, one of the few where that is true, according to my scans. Hell, everything I know about this world is from Google and hacking. I had to learn quick so I didn't end up making mistakes in casual conversation. I switched to other views. A man with a giant pair of angular sunglasses was watching the sunset with a sword on his back and a flame-patterned cloak on his back. A giant robot was standing behind him, with two figures walking towards him. A red-headed man and woman in gender-swapped versions of the same brown shaded clothes speaking to a young woman with black hair and red lips, wearing a white blouse and blue skirt. When the three turned to look curiously at the view screen, I switched away hurriedly. Another world, where three people were fighting against robots with skull-shaped heads, dozens of the steel monsters surrounding them. One of them was a man who wore a red cape and a blue outfit with a S symbol on the front as he fired heat beams from his eyes. There was a woman carrying a sword she used to impale one of the robots, wearing an outfit with a large golden piece of armor over her chest shaped like the letter W, her beauty as clear as her talent in war. The last could barely be seen, more of a black shadow among his more flamboyant comrades, only truly evident by the destroyed robots he left in his wake, simply a mass of darkness that moved like death. We're just one universe of many, I said, showing a world where a boy with white hair and green eyes in a black outfit with the letter D on it fought against a woman who looked like a green female genie, belly dancer outfit included. One of infinity, because the multiverse theory is true, and it's kinda awesome, knowing how unique we are in all this infinity. Then where is your world? Fury asked. I don't know, I said in frustration. I didn't fake it. All the power I had now, even with the pain I was fighting through, and I just couldn't. You don't know, Natasha asked, interrupting my thoughts. Feeling testy, I began to explain. Look, I switched the view over to where, according to my scans, my world should have been, the world with my nephew, with my parents and my crappy room. Instead, all that appeared was static. I got dropped into this universe, and now I can't find mine. Do you want to know something else? I can't find it at any point in its history. Any other universe, even the ones that are destroyed, I can at least view their pasts, but mine? It's just locked out to me? I've got an arc reactor, alien parts burning out, a device built by a mad genius like Jury Rig, and upgrade backing me up, but I can't pierce through whatever is blocking me. I shouted the last, enraged. It's not just that I can't get home, it's that I can't even fucking see it. I can't see my family, my friends, I can't find out how my mom is taking my disappearance. But no, I can fucking see the Teletubbies in their goddamn house eating fucking pancakes. The group stared at me before I switched off the viewer. I separated from the viewer, looking at Fury, then turned into a human again. So there it is Fury. 
If you want, you can try to arrest me or whatever. But I was given the Omnitrix and just dropped into this world like a bad habit. All I'm doing is making the best of a bad situation. Everyone looked over at Fury. He eyed me for a moment. I'm going to have you write a full report. And we're going to still strap you to the lie detector. Oh come on. Tony said exasperatedly. Fury ignored him. You tell me everything you can possibly remember about your life, between your home universe and this one. I don't care if it's a girl who gave you funny feelings in middle school, tell me everything. When I opened my mouth to protest, he stopped me. The council and others will have questions about you. Questions I'll have to answer. So I'm going to give them answers. Fury eyed the machine. And destroy that. What? Clint asked in surprise. I wanted to see me being a badass again. Or see yourself turning evil, Fury said. Or Steve staying in the 40s and having a full life. Tony with kids. An infinity of possibilities, each as slightly possible as the next. Do you all really, and I mean really, want to spend the rest of your life staring into this thing? Worried about the lives you might have had? The people you could have loved, who could have lived? Or to suddenly become suspicious of a friend because of the chance they might go bad the way some other version of them did? All the what-ifs. I was suddenly glad I hadn't shown them the ultimate black widow who had betrayed her team. Having those worlds just out of your reach? People go insane from regular paranoia, hell I'm an expert at it. If even thinking about the possibilities can make people do stupid things, what will being able to actually see them do? We looked over at the viewer. I thought of all of that for a moment. Yeah, that was. I think you're right, Steve said, sounding sad. As tempting as it is. Dial. Destroy it. I went over to the dimensional viewer and looked over at Tony. Nothing to say. Tony snorted when everyone looked at him. No, I've got enough issues with my problems in this universe. Besides, I can always make one for myself now that I know it's possible at all. We all thought about that. A moment later, feeling very nervous about working for Tony now, I waved at it. Well, I don't have to destroy it. I'm actually surprised it's still there, it should have dash. The dimensional viewer began to shake. Ah, uh, Hawkeye said slowly. Should we leave the room, or dash? The machine pulled into itself and imploded with a sound like gravel exploding. Why is everything you make so weird? Natasha asked. I smiled just a bit. They have personality, I looked over the group. So, we good? Fury smirked. Not really. Not that I don't like you, but you just admitted you have no idea where you got the watch or who dropped you here, and I believe you on that. So I'll still keep an eye on you, simply because it's safer, Steve, Tony, and I all shared an exasperated look. But like I said, I think your heart's in the right place, and you're too useful to us not to bring in. And that's good enough for me. Well, if that was the best I was getting. So uh, that makes me an Avenger. Tony grinned at that. There's the fanboy we all know. Is there even a protocol for new Avengers? Clint asked. So far, no, Natasha said. But with Dial, Sam, and Rhodey in the picture. We'll discuss it later, Steve said, turning and opening the door for us to exit. For now, I'd like to think on what we've seen. Natasha and Tony seemed to still at that clearly thinking on that. Natasha's eyes flickered in the direction of where Bucky was being held before apparently dismissing the thought that prompted that. Tony rubbed his chin thoughtfully. And Steve sighed while we all filed out. Time has a talk with everyone out there. We have ten minutes. Yes, Fury said. We're in for the hard part. He walked outside, his long coat flapping as the Avengers and I followed in his wake. Several S.H.I.E.L.D. agents stepped aside, and soon an armed procession took spots along the wall. You all know your roles in this conversation. Now get changed. I want the Avengers at my side when I meet them, and I need you in costume for that. Later, in the men's locker room, Sam had joined us to put his own clothes on. Tony and Rhodey weren't in with us since their armor would just wear itself onto them in seconds, leaving Steve, Clint, Sam, and me. I was putting on my boots, the last part of my costume to go on when Steve came up and tapped me on the shoulder. Hey, he said. I'd like to talk to you in private real quick. Nodding as I tried to guess what this would be about, I finished tying my boots and went to join him in the back. Steve looked around to see if we were alone before speaking. You said doing that, looking between universes, hurt. I wanted to ask if you were okay. I'm good, I said. Just, doing that took a lot out of me. If it wasn't for the ridiculous power of the arc reactor, I wouldn't have been able to do it, 
and even then I drained the Chidori armor pieces just to boot the system up. And holding open was like, you ever hold up an impossible weight while having a conversation? A couple of times, Steve said, reminding me just what kind of badass I was talking to. He sighed. And what you said, about being from another world. I think, in some way, I understand how you feel. Yeah, I realized. I guess you'd be one of the few. After all, I wasn't the only one who'd woken up in a world that was so similar and yet so different from home. It takes getting used to, Steve said with a smile. I'm still bad at it. But if you need help, I'm willing to talk. Same, I said warmly. Hell, you ever want to catch up with pop culture? I'm sort of an expert by now. Steve laughed. Well, I have been wondering about anime. When I went on ice we were still having issues with Japan, he scowled. Not that I approve of how that ended of course. I winced at the thought of the two bombs that had ended that conflict. Yeah, well, that's why we're doing this, right? To stop anything like Pearl Harbor or the bombs from ever taking place again. He nodded thoughtfully at that. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 9 comments. Chapter 21, ending S-H-I-E-L-D. Soon, we were all dressed in our costumes, Rhodey joining us with Tony. Fury waited until we were all suited up before walking towards the conference room. I felt pretty badass walking through the halls with the group. There's an energy when you walk with superheroes like that all in costume, something I imagined groups of cosplayers felt something close to. We went in a sort of loose triangle formation. Iron Man and Captain America behind Fury on his right and left sides, respectively. Falcon was behind Captain America, War Machine behind Iron Man. Bringing up the rear was Black Widow and Hawkeye, with Dial, me, in between them. It hadn't been as clear as right then that I was a superhero now. Dial. It had just been a random code name. Even my fights, as desperate as they had been at times, just felt like fights. Why would the scale change my feelings on it? But now, walking among the greats, having shield agents and personnel watch us as we walked by, their eyes filled with awe, it was pretty cool, but also, this is so weird. Sam noted to me as I walked closer to him. I know, I replied. I mean, it's also kinda awesome, but. My fellow newbie and I shared a glance and nodded when we saw we understood the same thing. It was cool, but it was also kind of alienating. Ironically so, considering the Omnitrix. We walked like that until we reached our destination, another conference room. This one was bigger than the last by a wide margin. And it was full of people and cameras all surrounding a massive table in the center of the room. I took them all in, trying to remember who was who. The World Security Council, all of them sends Gideon Malik, who had gone into hiding when he'd been revealed to be Hydra, and Alexander Pierce who was now imprisoned. Four of them, Singh, Rockwell, Holly, and Yen, gave Natasha and Clint grateful nods, presumably for the two saving those members' lives. Phil Carlson, Victoria Hand, Richard Gonzalez, Tomasz Calderon, and Jennifer Weaver sat in a line. They all seemed friendly enough. There were also several holographic screens around the table. One had Maria Hill, clearly broadcasting and watching from the Triskelion. Another showed Matthew Ellis, President of the United States, an older man with graying brown hair and piercing blue eyes. The other screens also showed world leaders from other countries. England, Russia, France, China, Japan, Egypt, India, Pakistan, the whole UN was there. Fury circled around to the head of the table, the seat left open for him, and we followed. Two other seats were open next to it, and Steve and Tony took those. There was a bit of nervousness in the room when Tony's seat let out a few creaks of protest under the weight of his armor, but it held. The rest of us stood behind them facing the rest of the room. I blinked when I realized that the way we had entered had me standing directly behind Nick, Natasha, and Rhodey on my right, Clint and Sam on my left. I crossed my arms and tried to look professional. Carlson was looking at Steve and Tony apologetically. Steve kind of smiled sadly, while Tony let the impassive look of his helmet speak for itself. The council sitting on the other side of the table eyed us. The whole room stilled. Ladies and gentlemen, Fury said simply. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We are at war. At war with an enemy that has been hiding within our ranks like a parasite, chewing away at us. They were our friends, our fellow soldiers, even our leaders, Rockwell nodded firmly, scowling at the thought of Malik and Pierce, or so I guessed. Hydra. An old enemy, one we'd thought beaten. 
They tried to use helicarriers like the very one we are all standing on to finally take control of the world. I suddenly realized why Fury had chosen to use one of the helicarriers for this meeting. Luckily, with the help of many of you, S.H.I.E.L.D. has stopped them, and now we have them on the run. Hydra isn't finished though, make no mistake. Despite the Hercules app, despite agents, military, and law enforcement all over the world hunting them down, Hydra is fighting back. They're desperate. And desperate people tend to reach for weapons they would never use otherwise, Fury held up a hand when several of his captivated audience began to speak. I won't mince words either. While we may be holding up well, S.H.I.E.L.D. is in shambles. Not just that, but Hydra had its people everywhere. I've had reports of government officials, computer technicians, CEOs, and even a coffee barista with easy access to a Russian diplomat's daughter, all found out and arrested. We can't simply move on from this. S.H.I.E.L.D. and Hydra are teetering on the brink. I say we get ourselves together before they can. What exactly are you proposing? Councilperson Holly asked seriously. I agree, a person from one of the screens, the Russian president, said. What is it you want, Fury? Oh, it's not just me, Fury looked over at Steve. Rather than being put on the spot, Steve was ready. We've all come to a decision. Many of us agree, that S.H.I.E.L.D., as it was, can no longer stand. We can't simply put it together again. Shield, it's done. And something new has to take its place. The room exploded. Carlson stared at Steve and Fury as though they had broken his heart. Hand was shouting at Fury, before turning on Rockwell. President Ellis was trying to speak, but he was drowned out by the Chinese president shouting in his language as Jarvis provided subtitles. The various Shield agents around the room shared in the shouting. Fury raised a hand. I pressed down on the Omnitrix. I grew up several feet. Gray fur sprouted across me, muscles rose across my form, my fingers became claws, and my mouth became a muzzle. Blitzwolfer? 4. It was hard to control a howl like mine to just be pure noise, rather than destroying the room but I managed to keep my long cry in control. When I was done, there were a lot of people staring in shock, but no one, not even Fury and those close to me, was deaf. I glared around the room for a moment as Steve began to speak again. This is necessary he said softly. S.H.I.E.L.D. was compromised in a way no intelligence apparatus ever has before. We have resources, people, and allies, but we need to rebuild. Not just to fight Hydra either. What are you going to do? Tony said, drawing attention. The next time someone as smart as me shows up, and one of the Avengers can't stop him. Or if the next guy who gets a watch like mine, I added, isn't as nice. What will happen? Fury asked, leaning forward into to rest his chin on his knuckles his one eye panning around the room. When someone like Loki shows up again, and Thor isn't around to stop him. But more than that, who will protect those who suddenly find themselves with gifts they can't understand? 8. What do you mean? Tamash asked, confused. The world is becoming full of people like us, Steve said. People with gifts, whether exceptional intelligence, talent in combat, aliens like Thor, or those who have been given gifts due to circumstance beyond their control like Banner. You want to protect people like that. One of the leaders said in disgust. Or like that, damned wolf. I held back a growl. People, Natasha said, drawing the room to her. That's the key word. They're people. We're not saying we don't arrest people who do wrong. But we need to do more than just catalog people with abilities and tell them to sit tight and do nothing. We need to protect them from those who would do them harm, who would exploit them. People like Bucky Barnes, Tony said surprising me. He didn't look around when those of us who knew the deeper implications of his words stared at him. He simply let that enigmatic mask keep him hidden. Or Carl Creel, I added. People like me. We know Hydra can brainwash people, that Loki has done it. Not just him, Cowlson said. An Asgardian named Lorelei appeared on Earth a while back. We managed to stop her, but if she managed to control someone with powers, isn't that more of a reason to just stop people like that? The Russian president asked. Prevent them becoming a risk. Not when that person is innocent, Clint said. We don't believe people should be punished for the crime of being different. Some of these people just want normal lives. Some come from tough situations, or will want to protect others. We need to be more than just the wall between the world we think of as normal and the world we think of as weird, Steve leaned forward. That line doesn't exist anymore. 
It hasn't existed since I stood in New York City fighting alongside a Norse god and a man in a power suit against aliens coming out of a portal. The world is not normal, but we can still protect it. Keep the innocents safe, no matter where they come from. Now it was my turn. I leaned forward, over fury. Everyone looked at me, the werewolf standing massively as my eyes glared at the audience. And if Hydra, if aliens, or even gods come here again, trying to exploit, rule, or kill us, then we will stop them. Earth will be defended, and all of our people as well. This isn't a threat, Fury clarified, not worrying about the wolf who was looming above him. But we are telling you what we believe we need to do. Together, we can protect this world. But S.H.I.E.L.D. needs to be rebuilt to do it. With all the damage Hydra has done to us, I looked around. We'd aimed for drama, for shock, and awe to convince the room we were right. From the looks of it, it worked. Some people were still not on board. Cowlson still looked as though we'd killed his puppy, though Fury had told us he had some ideas about that. Councilperson Rockwell leaned forward. I think, we might need to talk about this for a moment longer. But personally, I agree, he ignored the looks some in the room gave him. I assume you have a proposal. Fury leaned back in his chair. X. Show M what we got. Of course sir, the former six said. Holographs appeared in front of all the people around the table and I could see dignitaries on the screens around us being given tablets by their assistants. What you see there are just the bare bones of what I've written up, Fury said simply. Wait, is this real? President Ellis said, looking up from his tablet. You're stepping down as director. Everyone looked at Fury. He smiled a very sour and sad smile. Of course I am. No matter what happens, I will be the one who is blamed for this. That's not true, Hand said her eyes soft behind her glasses. None of us realized or suspected anything for years. It doesn't matter, Fury said confidently. I was head of S.H.I.E.L.D. when it was revealed that Hydra infiltrated. And that's okay. I don't mind stepping down for someone new to take the reins and I will not let my predecessors be blamed for this. I will step down, he smirked. Plus, I like the idea of history knowing me as the last director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Holds weight. Fury wasn't telling the whole story. Of course. Just because he wouldn't be in charge didn't mean he was planning to stay out of the fight. But none of those he'd confided in said a word, me included. It was all part of the plan. Then who will replace you? The British Prime Minister asked. That's what we'll decide, Fury said. I have a list of candidates. But first, before I step down, let's figure out the new rules, shall we? I held back a groan when I realized I'd have to stand for a while they spoke. Still, we were on our way. Comment. Five comments. Chapter 22, Omnitrix Introduction. January 13, 2014. Later, the meeting was still going on. And by later, I meant I had left at around 2 a.m. as it continued to take a nap, only to wake up about four hours later to find they were still talking. With nothing to do, I took a shower, pulled my hair back, put on my super suit, and went to one of the mess halls. The carrier had two one of which was still being used as a makeshift brig for Creel and Bucky, since their special needs meant the actual brig wouldn't cut it. Davida had been put in there with them. Later I'd have to see about possibly fixing it so the brig could hold superhumans, but I decided to just go to get some food in me. When I stepped into the room, everyone stopped what they were doing to stare at me. I blinked at the sudden attention and waved. How's it going? A shield agent waved back weakly. I went to join the line for food. After a moment, people stopped looking at me, though glances were still thrown at me, especially at the Omnitrix. The line moved very quickly, people simply grabbing the various breakfast foods as fast as they could from the buffet-style setup. Feeling a bit ravenous, I grabbed a bagel, a donut, some eggs, and, feeling a bit nostalgic, was happy to see someone had made smoothies, of which I grabbed a strawberry one. I went to an empty table and sat down, eating quickly. Once finished, I grabbed another plate, then sat down to continue. Damn, someone said as they sat to join me. You can sure put it away, can't you? I looked up to see Sam and gave him a grin around a mouthful of turkey bacon. I haven't eaten in a while dude. One. Same, Sam said, wearing his costume just like me. He swiped my donut and chuckled at the glare I gave him for it. Been a wild couple of days, huh? That's putting it lightly, I admitted. Kinda weird not needing to run anywhere for a bit. Sam smirked at that. We ate in silence for a bit, ignoring the looks we got dressed in our costumes, 
Sam with his jetpack and me with my Omnitrix. In fact, you don't have any clothes here, either. I asked Sam. He nodded. Yeah, and the shield stuff they had just doesn't feel right somehow, with everything that's going on. That was true. Somehow, with all the discussion on what to do next, wearing shield clothing felt weird. Um, excuse me. Sam and I looked up to see Fitz and Simmons looking at us. The British duo was standing with trays of their own, both smiling nervously. Simmons, the one who had spoken, waved at the empty table. Um, I'm Gemma Simmons, I work with Agent Cowlson. I'm Leo Fitz, and uh, I work with her, Fitz said nervously. Well, I mean, we both work for Agent Cowlson, we just do you mind if we sit with you? Sure, no problem, I said. If Sam doesn't mind, go for it, Sam said. Grinning eagerly, Fitz Simmons sat down, Fitz next to me, Simmons next to Sam. Sam and I continued to eat. When we realized they weren't eating, we looked at the pair. Fitz was staring at Sam's wing pack and Simmons was staring at my Omnitrix. When they realized they'd been caught, Simmons laughed nervously. I'm so sorry, she said. It's just your weapons are so fascinating. Yes, I was researching your wing pack, Fitz said excitedly. And I noticed that you could increase the rigidity flexibility ratio by changing the material to carbon fiber. Yeah, Tony said something about that. Sam said, apparently not knowing what to do about Fitz's enthusiasm. Tony Stark said that. Fitz asked excitedly, turning to Simmons. Did you hear that? Yes, yes, you said the same thing another genius did, Simmons said dismissively, but with a very fond smile that Fitz returned. But that, she pointed at the Omnitrix. What is it? How does it work? I looked at the Omnitrix, then at Fitz and Sam. Sam shrugged. Hey, I'm curious too man. Fitz nodded in agreement. Well, all right. I swiped my donut back from Sam and took a bite. Swallowing that, I was about to speak when Simmons interrupted me when she saw more people walk into the room. Wait, she said excitedly. Sky, trip, over here. Sam and Fitz looked over as well. The pair walked over to join us. Trip had a wide smile on his face as he sat, Sky looking less excited. Look at you two, sitting with real Avengers now. More reserve Avengers, I admitted, Sam nodding. Still pretty cool, Sky said. He, what is your name? Simmons asked me. I mean, I know they call you Dial, but. At her leading pause, I answered. It's Mahmood. Yes, Simmons said. He was going to tell us about the watch. Omnitrix, Sam corrected for me. He's really specific about that. Wait, Sky asked. You're the guy who made that giant diamond at the Triskelion. When I nodded. She looked at Sam. What was it like flying through that thing? Whoa, wait. Simmons said hurriedly. I want to hear about the watch first. I looked at Sam. He smirked at the lost look on my face. You first, man. Sighing, I put down my food and held out the watch. Okay. First off, I don't know who gave this to me or why. I mean, I knew who, but explaining Professor Paradox's dickery was too much trouble. Oh. Simmons seemed disappointed. But the watch imprinted its history into me, I said, Fitzsimmons seeming to perk up at that. So I know who created it. Azmuth, an alien scientist. Was he a famous weapon designer? Fitz asked. Not intentionally, I leaned back and sighed sadly. So, look. Azmuth was, well, he was brilliant. Smarter than any person in three galaxies, and more creative to boot. While his whole species, the Galvan people, were naturally more intelligent than almost any other species, he had this spark that none of the rest could match. But he had something even better than that. He was in love. Simmons, who had been listening avidly, suddenly smiled softly at that. Fitz looked over at her and smiled as well. The girl he loved was a scientist as well, a woman named Zenith, and someone he cared for deeply. One day, he went out on a date with her, and they saw the planets align in the skies above. When they aligned, Azmuth was inspired. What if, he thought to himself, I created a weapon that could tap into the fundamental forces of the universe. A weapon powered by existence itself. The thought consumed him, and he spent all of his time creating it. And that's when he created the Omnitrix. Fitz asked. No, I answered. He created Ascalon, a sword. What? Trip asked, confused. All that build up for a sword. Elegant, isn't it? I asked. All the power of the universe, in something so small. Zenith tried to warn him as he created it, but he ignored her, obsessed with creating his masterpiece. 
so, she left. And he never noticed. Simmons seemed crestfallen while Fitz was thoughtful. Aismuth finished Ascalon, and a warrior stole the weapon, hoping to use it to stop an eon's long civil war between the many factions on his home world. And when Aismuth saw the destruction of that world, saw how his creation turned a planet into an asteroid field with a single swing, he was devastated. Only then, did he realize what he had done, that he had sacrificed Zenith for nothing. I was really getting into the story now. So Aismuth hid Ascalon away and dedicated himself to peaceful sciences. He wanted to apologize, and he started on a creation that would show how sorry he was, hoping that she would see how he had changed and one day she would return to him. The Omnitrix, Sky said, likely figuring out where this was going. It's not a weapon, not really, I extended my hand out. It's a tool meant for peace. Imagine, being able to walk a mile in other species' shoes, to understand them because, in a way, you are them. An ambassador who understood all people, who could stand in their defense without judgment. But that was only part of it. Zenith, Simmons took hold of my wrist, staring at the Omnitrix. Aismuth wanted to prove he had learned his lesson. To prove he cared. Romantic, right. I said sarcastically. Instead, Aismuth failed. He made a tool for peace, and someone saw its potential for a weapon. Yeah, Fitz said sadly. That fits. Anytime someone just wants to advance science, someone else sees a shiny new bomb. That's part of why I like the idea of S.H.I.E.L.D. restructuring itself, I admitted, gently pulling my wrist. There are peaceful aliens out there. Ones like the Asgardians. Making alliances with them, furthering Aismuth's dream. I've done good work patrolling in New York City, and I want to do that later. But making the world, and possibly beyond, a better place is nice too. Oh, now that's a question. Fitz said. Can you turn into Asgardians? Like Thor. Now that would be awesome, Sky said. I mean, Thor is just. Sky sighed. So dreamy. Sky, Simmons said, sounding scandalized, a blush on her face. No, she's right, I admitted. I mean, we've all seen the pictures, and I'm comfortable enough in my sexuality to admit Thor is hot. Too. We all thought about that for a moment. Well, Tripp said, shaking his head. Now that you mention it, you two were in on this whole idea to rebuild S.H.I.E.L.D., right? I mean, you were in on it from the start. Well, yeah, I said. One of my aliens even created the Hercules app. Fitz and Sky seemed to become very focused on me all of a sudden. Fitz spoke first. Is there, is there any chance that the app can make a mistake? Fitz, Sky said, sounding sad and frustrated. No, I mean, if it made some miscalculation, or discovered someone was not actually Hydra, maybe. I was already pulling out my phone. I placed it on the table, activating the Hercules app. Who was it you're asking about? Grant Ward, Fitz said hesitantly. I opened his file. Okay, Grant Ward. Recruited by John Garrett after he was arrested for trying to kill his parents and oldest brother in a fire. Hydra is very detailed in its filing so. I sighed. I'd already known what I'd find. I passed my phone over to Fitz, who looked at it desperately. He flipped through the files, one by one, ignoring the pitying look Simmons was giving him. Fitz, Sky said. It's not true, Fitz said, his voice wavering. There must be something, right? Something, some proof. He didn't just die a traitor, there has to be some mistake, some reason dash. Fitz, Sky yelled. Ward was a traitor, okay. He got what he deserved. The cafeteria froze. Sky was breathing heavily. Fitz stared at her. After a moment, he tossed my phone back to me and stood up, walking away very quickly. Simmons went to follow, but Tripp put a hand on her shoulder. Give him time, girl, he said softly. Sky groaned, putting her face in her hands. I shouldn't have done that. Don't worry about it, Tripp said. We're all dealing with betrayal today. Looking around, I could see he was right. None of the shield agents surrounding us seemed confused. Just understanding. So uh, I said. Maybe we should meet up later. I asked. I know Tony wanted to talk to me about something. Invite Fitz along. We can all hang out. Not me, Tripp said easily. I'm meeting a friend. I'll try to get Fitz to come, Simmons said. I know he'll be excited. And I'll go too, Sky said. Maybe I can apologize then. I don't suggest it, Sam said. Stuff like that. It takes time, not apologies. Maybe talk him through it, but the fact is you were right. Well, maybe apologize for yelling, Trip corrected. But yeah, 
Give him time. You should still come through, I added. We're supposed to be doing something important, apparently. Although he said we were meeting on the business. Comment. Four comments. Chapter 23, Carlson Back from Dead. I ended up kind of regretting inviting them when I realized what the something important was. You absolute son of a bitch, Tony Isley. Stark, Carlson said serenely, trying to calm him down. No, don't start with that. You couldn't send a text, an email, a signal flare, Tony said, getting in Carlson's face. I mourned you, Carlson, I actually felt bad. And I appreciate that, Carlson said back. But we weren't exactly friends, Tony. We were allies, occasionally, when you weren't locking me out of the tower to avoid my visits, or pranking me like we were in high school. That's how I treat my friends, Tony said, looking offended. Rhodey never complained. He complained all the time. Carlson shouted back. What, you spied on him too? Tony scoffed. New flash, Tony. I am a spy. As the two quibbled back and forth at each other inside the bus laboratory, I looked around. The bus was a pretty cool-looking plane. The hangar door was down to let sunlight in, letting me see it in all its glory. A sweet red convertible was parked on the right side of the door, all sleek lines and leather seats, a beauty from an older time. The left side of the door held a big black SUV. Some stairs lead up to another floor, while a set of glass panels separated the cargo hold from the forensics and research lab we stood in. Sky, Fitzsimmons, Melinda May, Clint, and Natasha all watched the fireworks alongside me. I learned in towards Natasha. How long is this going to go on? I whispered. I'm just wondering why we're here, she whispered back. He said this was important. Well, you know Tony, Clint said. He likes an audience. Drama queen. Melinda asked. Clint and Natasha nodded. This is why you should never meet your heroes, Fitz said sadly getting a pat on the back from a sympathetic Simmons. Been working for me so far, I said. Clint and Natasha grinned at me, to which I could only helplessly shrug. Once a fanboy, Tony said, somehow perfectly cutting my thought off and completing it at the same time. Come to meet Agent. Apparently, Tony's nickname for Cowlson was Agent. With a bit of confusion at how casual Tony was suddenly acting, I stepped forward, the others coming along. Agent, this is Dash. Dial, Carlson said, extending a hand to shake. Tony interrupted our handshake when I went to shake Carlson's. Don't interrupt me. This is fanboy. He makes cool things and turns into giant things, but his wardrobe needs work. Natasha, my costume designer, raised an offended eyebrow. Okay, who've you got? Tony asked. Carlson, clearly used to Tony, waved at his own team. Melinda May the pilot of the bus and one of the finest martial artists I've ever met. Charmed, Tony said. I'm not, Melinda returned coolly. Tony smirked at that. Carlson continued. This is Sky, a skilled hacker and someone who is training to be a shield agent. Kinda useless now, Sky admitted, looking at Tony with a bit of awe. I just got the badge too. Keep it, Natasha said. Souvenir. Plus, history buffs love stuff like that. You still selling old Russian military gear? Clint asked. Natasha smirked, and Melinda surprised me, as well as her crew, by chuckling a little. Melinda smirked at them. You had to be there, was all she said. Okay, hearing that story later, Tony said, ignoring the looks the super spies gave him. How about the married couple? What? Fitz said, startled. Oh, we're not Dash. We're not a couple, Simmons said quickly. Yes, just friends. Close for years, but not a couple. Tony looked between them, then at Carlson. And Ross and Rachel do what on your crew? I blinked. Wait, Tony knew who they were. Why was he pretending otherwise? Carlson sighed before gesturing. This is Leopold Fitz. Fitz is my engineer, a weapons, and tech expert. And this is Gemma Simmons, my biochemist, specializing in life sciences. Hello, Fitz said, waving a bit weakly. Tony eyed them both for a moment. Jarvis, bring it up. A hologram appeared in the back, hovering over a table. Fitzsimmons pointed at it. How did you dash? I'm Tony Stark, Tony said in answer, walking over to the table. I don't like you messing with my plane, Carlson said in annoyance. And I don't like wasting money on flowers, but I did it for your funeral, Tony shot back. How do you keep from hitting him? Melinda asked Natasha and Clint. Practice mostly. Natasha said with a smirk. 
I don't resist the urge at all honestly, keeps him honest, Clint stated proudly, leaning out of the way when Tony threw a pen at him. So, you guys made this? Tony asked, pointing at the hologram, which was a floating blue image of a gun shaped like a sniper rifle. Huh, I see you restored the data, Fitz told Sky. Cowlson told me to do it, Sky complained. Fitz sighed. Yes, I made that. It's brilliant, Tony said. Fitz blinked, surprised. You think the night-night guns are brilliant? Hell yes I do, Ross, Tony said. Cool name for it by the way. Oh, Fitz responded. Well, they're calling it ICAR now. No, Tony said dismissively. Night-night gun, he turned to look at the hologram. A gun that fires a dendrotoxin bullet, knocking people out like that quickly and with no side effects. You both made it, right? Yes, Simmons said quickly. Yes we did, you see, the way we designed it was dash. And suddenly she was no longer speaking with words I could understand. Fitz immediately joined in and Tony responded. Fitz Simmons moved around the table and showed him a section of the hologram, the two so in sync it was amazing. Just as amazing was how Tony seemed to vibe with them, falling in step with their thinking and responding to it. Well, Cowlson said, I suppose they're going to be at it for a while, he looked over at us. I suppose, I can show you the plane now. Not yet, Tony said suddenly. He walked up to look Cowlson in the eyes. I still have more to say to you. Cowlson and Tony looked at each other a moment longer. After a bit, Cowlson nodded and walked towards a back room, Tony following. Um, Simmons said nervously. Should we go with them? The door slammed behind Tony. Apparently not, Fitz said. Melinda looked at Clint and Natasha. They both shook their heads, and Melinda nodded. Apparently, spies had their own body language. Well, I suppose we have some time, Simmons said. Yes, Fitz looked over at me. Can we scan your Omnitrix? Maybe open it up and study it. Please. Simmons asked cutely. I promise, we won't break it. How invasive are the scans going to be? And do I need to take it off? I hesitated. Also, what are the chances you'll activate something that will blow us all up? Simmons and Fitz chuckled dismissively. Oh no, we're very good at studying alien technology, I think we'll be fine. I thought about that. After all, the Omnitrix had a universal self-destruct in it. One I was very scared to activate since I was one of the assholes who lived in the universe. How about instead I tell you how it works? They did not seem satisfied at all with that. Before they could say anything, I spoke again. Also, just scans. No touching buttons or taking it apart. No putting lasers on it. I rather feel you're being insulting, Fitz said with a scowl. Remember how smart I said Azmuth was? This thing makes most other alien tech, maybe all of it, obsolete. I know it's insulting, but it is the truth. You're very smart caveman studying a supercomputer, I admitted. One owned by a very dumb caveman. We're all dealing with a piece of tech so advanced I can only turn into 10 out of the over 1 million aliens on it. Let's not tempt fate. Everyone looked at the watch. Fitz finally sighed. Okay, well, scans only. And you'll tell us about it. Nodding, I began to speak. Tony Stark slash genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist. Tony stood with Cowlson in the tight space of the room and glared at Cowlson. In all his life, he'd rarely been this, angry. The closest was when Obadiah Stanair revealed that he had been selling weapons to terrorists, which rested firmly under finding out his parents had been murdered. Tony, why are you dash? You were my friend, Tony said suddenly. I mean, I know I'm not friendly, but Pepper cried when she found out you died. Her and your girlfriend, they still talk about you, Tony shook his head. Does she know you're alive? Cowlson stilled. No, no, she doesn't. You absolute prick. Tony, I actually did die. I wasn't faking, my heart stopped, my brain function was gone, hell, we're still trying to understand how I was brought back dash. Yeah, I know, Dial brought up the files for me, the billionaire said, Cowlson stopping in surprise. I don't care. You came back to life, you had months to talk to one of us, you asshole. They stared at each other. Finally, Cowlson sighed and leaned against the wall behind him. You're right. I should have let people know. Not the whole world, but, people, he admitted. I'm sorry, Tony. Tony shook his head. Not good enough. What? Cowlson said, finally annoyed. I want those three outside to work with me. Cowlson blinked in surprise. You want what? 
Sky, Ross, and Rachel. I don't care if they work for whatever this new club Fury and Steve are building is at the same time. But I've read the team files. The stuff they've done, hacking into S.H.I.E.L.D. with a laptop, creating a counter serum to the centipede formula, curing a Chitori virus? They can do a lot more under me than they can with S.H.I.E.L.D. I want to work with them. That's what I want in return. Tony, you realize that Sky and Fitzsimmons make their own choices, Carlson said. Then let me ask them, Tony said. Take them to my labs, show them what I can do for them. Wait, was all this anger because you wanted to borrow my experts? Carlson asked. Tony shrugged. Not at first. I'm still pissed at you, but I'm planning something. Something big. I've got Dial on board. And Bruce. But I've seen what your team can do, and I think they can do even more. Should I be worried? Carlson asked. Not really, Tony crossed his arms. But you owe me more than an I'm sorry dot. They aren't commodities for me to trade, Stark. I'm not saying they are, Carlson. I'm just saying I think they can do some real good with me. But I know they're your team, so I'm asking permission. Tony smirked. But like I said, you do at least owe me. Like I said, they don't need my permission, Carlson said. Hell, I'm not even sure I'll have a job once Fury's done. But let them know that whatever their choice, they still have a place on whatever team I end up on. Whether they work for you at the same time or not. Tony nodded. Now, let's talk about the other stuff you owe me. Carlson rolled his eyes. Comment. Five comments. Chapter 24, Studying Dial's Alien. Mahmoud Shaked slash Dial. Fitz ran a device over my wrist as Simmons and Sky watched. May, Clint, and Natasha had all gone upstairs to talk about spy stuff, I guessed. So yet, yeah, I said. The codon stream is what allows the Omnitrix to do its thing. All the genetic information the Omnitrix can access exists in that stream. Well, Fitz said. It is giving off some very odd readings. If this is accessing another dimension for power, that would explain it. Can you turn into an alien? Simmons asked. That may give us new readings. I blinked. Yeah, okay, I thought about it, then tapped the watch. In seconds, I'd become Diamond Head with my proud battle cry. Funny, for some reason I was really starting to prefer Diamond Head over Blitzwolfer. Weird, but I went with it. Whoa, Sky said softly, staring up at me. You're, big, and shiny. Yeah, I get that a lot, I said. Oh my, Simmons said, walking up to look at me as Fitz stared. And this means your DNA has changed as well. Yeah, I said. I wonder. Fitz moved around. I can sense some sort of energy from you. I raised a hand palm upwards and made a crystal sprout from it. Fitz stared at his scanner, then looked at the crystal I'd sprouted. And that energy made the crystal grow, at a guess. Does that contain your DNA? Simmons asked. It's quite beautiful. I released the crystal and rested it on the table. Sky backed away from it nervously. Ah, uh, there's no chance you have any diseases or anything, is there? Sky asked. I mean, the last time we interacted with an alien thing carrying a virus. Simmons stared at the crystal I'd created with sudden fear when she realized what Sky was implying, Fitz stepping further back from me. I wouldn't worry, I said simply. I've been turning into aliens for weeks without anyone getting sick. Besides, I'm more worried about my human form getting sick. I got the sniffles one week, and Swamp Fire couldn't control his powers. One. Really. Simmons said, stepping closer to the crystal. So your human form's health has some effect on the aliens then. Can you turn into another one? Fitz asked politely. For some reason, I can't understand some of these readings. I might be able to help with that actually. I said, tapping the Omnitrix. Upgrade. I leaned forward and poured into Fitz's scanner. Whoa, what the dash Fitz freaked out and dropped me, stepping back. I released a loud beeping noise as my tiny body hit the floor. I grew legs from the bottom of my oblong body and rose up, looking around while blinking with an eye made from the scanner's port. Feeling a bit dramatic, I grew arms and waved at the three. He's so cute. Simmons cried happily. Yeah, still a 27-year-old man. I reminded her with my green circuits glowing with every word. 4. Whoa, sky lowered to look at me. What does that feel like? I mean, mixing with technology. Like reinstalling your third lung, I said, getting confused blinks. Hold on one second. I think I can make the scanner better. You mean you can improve technology permanently? Fitz asked. Yeah, but I don't seem to be that good at it, I admitted. 
Some of my aliens mesh better with my personality than others do. But here, I rose up and separated from the scanner, becoming a giant non-night goo monster once more and passing the scanner to Fitz, who looked at it. Try it now. Fitz turned it on and seemed staggered by what he was seeing. Gemma, look at these readings. I know, Simmons said excitedly, staring at the computer that was receiving the scanners. Just then, Tony and Carlson walked back into the room. I turned into my human form as they joined us. Fitz, Simmons, Tony would like to speak with you, Carlson said, looking around. Where's May? May went upstairs with Black Widow and Hawkeye, Sky said with a grin. Seriously, how cool is that sentence? 1. Fangirl, Tony coughed. When Sky glared at him, he smirked. Sorry, my cough interrupted me. I called you Fangirl. 5. Let's go join them, Cowlson said, guiding Sky and me away. Smiling, we all went upstairs as Tony and Fitzsimmons continued to talk science at a rapid pace. What's it like? Sky asked me later. We were sitting on the top level of the plane, resting on plush seats around a table. Cowlson, May, Clint, and Natasha were sitting a bit away from us, joking around and reminiscing, which left Sky and me to talk. But man, the bus really was a nice plane. For something owned by S.H.I.E.L.D., I was kind of jealous of all the soft chairs, the bar, and all the other amenities. What's what like? I asked, sipping at my orange juice. Oh come on, Sky said, sounding excited. Turning into aliens. What does it feel like? I grinned at her. Oh man, it's a total blast. I mean, it's weird. Some of my aliens are just plain crazy. But some of them. I thought of Diamond Head's incredible strength and power, flying as Astrodactyl, zooming through the city in a blur as fast track. There is nothing like it in the world. Knowing at any second, I could just tap my wrist and get a few minutes to do things no one else can. Man, Sky leaned back, staring at the Omnitrix with a smile. That sounds really fun. You have no idea, I admitted. Okay, now you're rubbing it in. Just a bit, I said with a grin that she returned. You ever think of letting other people try that out? She asked. I shrugged. All the time. Sometimes as a possible strategy, sometimes just to let someone try. Two. You can't take that off. I can, I said. But no one else can. Once it's on, I'm the only one who can wear it. Two. Can I try? Sky asked. I scoffed. No way. This is my super awesome alien watch. Stingy, Sky teased. I nodded slightly, watching as she slowly drank the brown alcohol in her cup. She didn't strike me as someone who drank often, but apparently, she'd needed it. I looked over at the group of super spies. Carlson and May were drinking the same alcohol that Sky was. May seemed tense, the older Asian woman engaging in the conversation only in the sense that she was sitting close to it. Carlson was talking, but it didn't feel real, somehow, like he was going through the motions. Sky was the same way, like she was trying to distract herself and failing desperately. Well, shoot. I had a distraction that few in the world could match. I got up and held a hand out to Sky. Hey, you want to see something cool? She blinked up at me. Uh, what? Something cool? It really put things in perspective for me, and I think you'll enjoy it. Granted, every human on Earth would enjoy it, but, I mean, are we even allowed to leave? She asked, still taking my hand and rising up as I pulled her along. I ignored the confused looks I got from the super spies. If anyone tries to stop me I'll try to unlock way big and throw them into the horizon, I said, moving towards the hangar. You do not have an alien called that, she said, giggling. That's so dumb. Yeah, well, if you saw him you'd understand. I took a moment to feel offended on Ben's behalf. I liked the aliens' names. We went down the stairs and I poked my head in on Tony, Fitz, and Simmons still discussing things at a rapid pace, now looking at the scanner I had modified. Hey, guys. The three looked over at me. Sky and I are stealing a Quinjet. Sky gave me a startled look. Wanna come? What? Fitz said, shocked. Hell yes. Tony said, delighted. Absolutely not. Simmons said at the same time, horrified at the idea in a way that made me smile a little wider. Hermione Granger would have loved Simmons. Yeah, Sky said, letting go of my hand. I'm not so sure about Dash. Hey, Fury, I said into the Omnitrix's calm link. X, connect him to the speakers. Of course sir, X said. Dial, Fury said, annoyed. This better be quick. I'm stealing a Quinjet with Tony and some of Carlson's people, 
I said simply. Fury sighed in annoyance but didn't really seem to care. Well, we were thinking about redistributing some of our resources. Sure, it's yours. What? Dial, I may be suspicious of you, but I'm also grateful. Fury said simply. You were essential in saving shield resources, and especially personnel. Many of my people are alive because of you and the Avengers now. You've more than earned a Quinjet. So go ahead, pick one and have X let me know which you took. Fly safe. With that, Fury hung up, leaving us all in shock. I mean, I had a Quinjet now. Holy shit. Wait, had Fury done that just to mess with me? Or was he honestly grateful despite all his suspicions? Whatever, I had a Quinjet. Looks like you have a Quinjet now, Tony said, somehow reading my mind, and rushing out of the lab. So where we going? What is going on? Someone said upstairs. I looked up to see Clint leaning on the railing above, looking down at us. Fury told me to come babysit you, and that he gave you a Quinjet? Was he kidding? I knew that he couldn't just let us have this, Tony groaned in annoyance, but I just grinned, feeling a bit giddy and confused all in one. Yeah? Can you believe it? I mean, what the hell, right? Come with us. What exactly has you so excited? Clint asked curiously, bypassing the stairs to simply hop over the railing. Yeah, seriously, Sky asked, sounding a bit weirded out. Okay, I said, raising my hands up. Yesterday, I saw something amazing, something so beautiful it took my breath away. Damn, you just met her, Tony said, looking between Sky and I. Granted, I don't blame you, but... Two. Sky grinned at Tony. Ha, that's an ego boost for me. Will you all just come on? I said, looking over at Fitzsimmons, who still looked hesitant. Look, I promise, it is going to be awesome. Moments later, I was merged with a Quinjet again, upgrades incredible powers being put to use. My Quinjet. Seriously, I loved Fury. For all his suspicion, gifting me with a Quinjet in return for saving Shield made him my hero. As of then, I had flown into space once more. This time, I turned the bottom of the aircraft transparent to show the world below. Man, Clint said slowly, sitting on the transparent floor and staring down at Earth. She really is beautiful. Fitzsimmons, Sky, and Tony were staring at the same view, while I was using my cameras and sensors to do the same. We were floating over the East Coast now. Ah, the East Coast of the United States that is. I can't believe we're actually watching this, Sky said softly. It's so pretty, Simmons said brightly. Look at the way the clouds are forming to the north. Do you think Dash? Possibly, Fitz replied. But of course Dash. Yes, that might happen, Simmons agreed. To my surprise, Tony suddenly cut in. I don't think so. Look, the winds are clearly breaking up the clouds as they go south. Fitz Simmons both stared for a moment before nodding simultaneously. Oh yes, that's quite right, Simmons said. God. There are three of them, Sky said, sounding more happy than annoyed. Still, it's very pretty. Fitz shook his head. This is unbelievable. I mean, we're in space. I know. Simmons giggled. Earth's, small, Tony said, sounding very different from his usual self. I mean, obviously it's not small, but dash. No, I interrupted. She's small, beautiful, and so. I didn't say anything else. Until you're up there. Watching home spin below you among the beauty of the stars, Earth never seems real as a concept. You can know, intellectually, that you live on a tiny piece of the universe in a far bigger part of it. But it's only when you see her in all her glory that the concept of it really hits you. We floated there for a while before Clint sighed, looking over towards the sun. This is pretty crazy man. How fast are you like this? Not light speed fast, I admitted. But give me time. I think. I think I can make things better. Not just upgrade them temporarily, but permanently. How fascinating, Simmons said, looking around at the black and green interior of the ship. And you said you're a species made of nonites? That's how you improved the scanner back in the lab. Yeah, I said through the Quinjet's internal speakers. Well, the speakers I had made. And how much can you change? Fitz asked. What's it like? Not a lot of ways I can explain it, but upgrade is really damn versatile. Oh, here, I raised a podium in front of Sky, who blinked when it opened on top to reveal a keyboard and screen. Check it out. I can make computers. Can your nonites be replicated? Simmons asked. I've got theories about that, Tony said. You guys are really ruining the experience, Clint noted, 
looking over as Sky began typing at the computer I had made her with great enthusiasm. I could feel her sending a message to Carlson, who didn't respond. Well, the experience is going to be over in a bit, I admitted, a familiar red beep coming from the Omnitrix symbol. Clint and Tony froze. Sky and Fitzsimmons looked over at them, understanding something was wrong. Ah, uh, Tony said, these things are airtight, right? Clint didn't seem to know. With a final beep, I appeared in the back of the Quinjet in human form. The transparent floor became black metal again. More importantly, the artificial gravity I had been creating disappeared, leaving us all to begin to float. It was airtight, but I just made it more so, I admitted, spinning in the air to look at everyone. Time as goop left me well adjusted to floating. The Quinjet isn't quite a spaceship, but it will get us to home and the engines should be a lot faster now. Oh thank God, Fitz said with a sigh, floating to grab at his seat so he could strap himself down. Clint rose up, pulling his floating form over to the cockpit. Seriously, what is with that thing's random timing? I think we were up here for about 12 minutes this time. It may be some sort of failsafe. Fitz yelled towards the front as Clint sat down. Ah, uh, Hawkeye, sir. Call me Clint. Fitz grinned at that. Today has been weird, Sky said, looking at me when I sat down. Seriously, I'm hanging out with three Avengers in space. Ah, uh, excuse me. Tony said, smirking. Two Avengers. Fanboy here is a reserve member at best. I can kick the ass of every other Avenger in the right form though, I mumbled. Tony grinned, not disagreeing. Fanboy. Sky asked as Clint turned the ship towards the Earth. Oh, you didn't know. Tony asked, looking mischievous. I'm his favorite Avenger. You mispronounced Black Widow, I sniped. I distinctly remember saying, Black Widow is my favorite Avenger. All that leather really does it for ya, huh? Sky asked me. She smirked at the betrayed look I gave her. So, back to the rendezvous. Clint asked, flying down. Hey, Jarvis. Tony asked. Are they still talking about a... Uh, what was it? International border laws, sir, Jarvis said. God, please keep me from politics, Tony said, an ironic statement from the man whose involvement with such in the comics caused a civil war. Yay, let's not. Hey, let's go to my place. I wanna show you guys the labs. Wait, at Stark Tower. Fitz asked. It's the Avengers Tower now, Clint responded from the pilot's seat. Shush Legolas, I'm talking, Tony tossed something at Clint who easily dodged it. What do you say Ross and Rachel, wanna see my toys? The pair seemed to glow with happiness. Oh yes Dash. We would very much like Dash. If it's not too much trouble Dash. How about you, fangirl? Tony asked Sky. Sure, she said brightly, not bothered by the name. Keep the good times rolling. I hid a smile. Maybe they'd have to face it later. But for now, I'd managed to distract the three. And that was good enough. Cool. I'll introduce you to Bruce. Bruce Banner. Fitzsimmons yelled in unison. Author's note, one interesting thing about this story is that I have to deal with some things I never expected, one of them being the science side of things. Characters like Diamond Head, Upgrade, Goop, they all exist in a state that would be a dream for normal scientists to study. I'm not sure it's possible to state how say, the study of Diamond Head's biology would change the world. Hopefully I conveyed that well. Also, I'd absolutely visit space every second I could if it was as easy as tapping the Omnitrix. The only reason I wouldn't do it as astrodactyl is the fear I'd be changed back in the atmosphere. 8. Creator's Thoughts Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 3 Comments. Chapter 25, Hacker. Such an honor sir, Simmons said excitedly shaking the hand of the man in front of her. Oh, yes, Fitz said pushing in for a handshake as well. You are just, so brilliant. Your thesis on radiation physics dash, and on the biological ramifications, on the ways that it could improve medicine. Simmons continued. Changed our lives. Fitz finished, waving his hands in emphasis. Your papers are still taught at the Shield Academy. Fitz seemed to realize something. Well, we're taught I suppose. The man looked between them, looking befuddled but pleased. Well, thank you. Always good to be known more for my work rather than, you know. Bruce couldn't help but look saddened for a moment. Seriously. Tony asked, annoyed. Why weren't they like this for me? Because you're a billionaire scientist, and Bruce is a regular scientist, Clint supplied. You're not as classy. I'm classy, Tony said, feigning like he was hurt by that. If it helps, 
I still like you, Sky said, grinning. Tony looked between them, annoyed. Seriously, I don't get as much respect as I deserve. I ignored them to take a good look at Bruce Banner, the Incredible Hulk. Seriously, the damn Hulk. So freaking cool. Granted he wasn't the rage monster right now, but he also wasn't some stereotypical string bean people assume most scientists were. He actually was very well built, likely a byproduct from being on the run from the US military for so long, with curly black hair and some beard scruff that was going a bit gray. He wore a simple sweater and blue jeans and seemed nervous, but happy to speak with Fitzsimmons. I looked around. Damn. You really went all out making this place, I said to Tony. He smirked, looking around. Like it? I wanted it to have all the bells and whistles. I could get used to it, Sky said. The room of the tower we were standing in was massive, the sort of place with so many zeros on its price tag it would make me pass out at the mere thought of spending so much. It had a fancy bar on one side of the room, black tiles on the floor everywhere, plush leather couches, and a second floor visible from the first. The place looked like a nightclub. I walked over to a nearby window and looked out on New York City. Tony and Skye followed me, Clint opting to go upstairs so he could have a view of everything. Great view, right? Tony asked casually. Yeah, Skye stared out at the buildings and streets of the city. I think I can see my favorite coffee shop right over there. That's my old warehouse, I think, I pointed out into the city. I was squatting over there. I miss that warehouse. Tony snorted. Yeah, well, you moved up in the world, pun totally intended, so don't go shedding tears about it. Sky. Simmons called out, getting her friend's attention. Come to look at this. She gave us an apologetic look before going to join her friends. As she did, Tony looked over at me. What do you think? It's nice. Thanks for the invite by the way. Wasn't as spontaneous as it seemed, Tony admitted. Carlson wanted his team to have a good time. You deciding to steal a Quinjet just, made it easy. I looked over at Tony, surprised. He shrugged. I was always planning on taking you, Ross, and Rachel with me. And I know Fury was trying to find some way to show you some appreciation. Fury isn't exactly rainbows and sunshine, but he knows to be nice even when he's a paranoid asshole. And Carlson? I asked. Was he in on it? He gave me permission to talk to them, Tony admitted. But I'm the one who has to convince them working with Bruce, you, and I is a good idea. Tony, I said, suddenly suspicious. What is it that you're planning? Even if S.H.I.E.L.D. is rebuilding, even with the Avengers, we might not be enough, Tony said. I want to make something to help us protect people. Something that can stop threats before they start. To prevent anything from space coming near us without getting vetted. I thought about Ben 10, about the plumbers, and the time a species of frog people had attacked. They'd had to work around something to do it if I remembered correctly. Hell, wasn't the plot of the third Men in Black movie based around something like that? And then there were the Mac guns from Halo, big cannons that could shoot a ship to pieces that were left in orbit. Plus, it was time I make something to prevent people like Davida from mind controlling me again. I have some ideas about that, I told Tony. Yeah well, Hopefully, your little red guy can make them, Tony said. By the way, I want to test you with something. First, Tony put a hand on my shoulder and guided me to the others. When we joined them, Bruce was listening as Simmons enthusiastically spoke about something. As we came closer, my Omnitrix beeped, surprising me, but when I looked down at it, the watch was normal. Wondering why it had done that, I focused on Bruce, who seemed amazed. A disease that can spread through electromagnetic shock. Bruce asked her. When Simmons nodded, he grinned. That is fascinating. I mean, dangerous, but if you could use that system to transfer cures dash. We managed to suspend the cure in a mineral-based solution that could give it to her with an electrical shock, Fitz said. But we couldn't figure out if other cures could be spread that way as well. Weren't you guys talking about it being a way to transfer cures over the internet? Sky idly asked. That would be incredible, Bruce said in amazement. Cures that could be stored as data? The number of people that could be saved with that, being able to send cures to people with the press of a button. Yes, but we've had trouble with it, Simmons admitted. Without more samples of similar diseases we haven't been able to see if other cures could be created, and our attempts to make such vaccines with samples of Earth diseases have come to a standstill. I'd like to see your research if you don't mind. Bruce asked. Fitz and Simmons looked like they had never heard of something more wonderful. Well that works out, 
Tony said, getting everyone's attention. I want Jury Rig to take a look at something. Jury Rig? Bruce asked. Oh, right. I guess you haven't heard, Tony said with a smile. Turns out you aren't the only guy who can turn into giant monsters dash. Tony. Someone said. We all turned to see a woman walking into the room. She was wearing a black dress that fit her tall and thin frame very well, had red hair in a high ponytail, and freckles across her nose. She walked over to us, smiling. Happy walked in behind her and gave me a light glare that I returned with a sigh. Jarvis told me you brought company, the woman said. Tattletail, Tony said to the air. She asked why a Quinjet was parked on the roof, Jarvis informed Tony. And I'm sure she broke you after hours of torture, Tony said. Okay, well, these are Fangirl, Ross, Rachel, and Dash. The hacker, Happy said. Wait, you know me. Sky asked, surprised. You hacked us too. The woman, Pepper Potts at a guess, said, while Happy frowned. Ah, uh, Sky looked around. No, seriously, how many holes are there in my security? I mean, I get fanboy, but fangirl too. Tony asked, annoyed. Anyways, this is Happy Hogan, my forehead of security, and Pepper Potts, the real CEO and my girlfriend. On days when he isn't running around the world without telling me, Pepper said, shaking my hand then moving on to the others. Tony waited until she had been fully introduced before looking between Bruce and Pepper. Guys, I need to talk to you about something. Happy, can you show them to the labs? My personal one. Happy, Pepper, and Bruce seemed shocked. Happy looked at Sky and I. Uh, Tony, are you sure Dash? Yes, Tony was uncharacteristically serious. Now, I need to talk to Pepper and Bruce. I gave the others an awkward look that was returned. Happy led us away as Pepper gave Tony a worried look. Creator's thoughts. Hey underscore Rishab. Please leave a review it will be appreciated. Comment. 8 comments.